kindly mute your audio during the presentations. Any questions can be posted through the chat box via WebEx and YouTube Live. And finally, a group photo will take place right after the montage. Please be ready to turn on your camera. Thank you.
Symposium on Strategy and Transformation Management 2023. Some housekeeping notes before we begin the session. Kindly mute your audio during the presentations. Any questions can be posted through the chat box via WebEx and YouTube Live. And finally, a group photo will take place right after the montage. Please be ready to turn on your camera. Thank you.
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hello and very good morning. Selamat pagi. Sawadi Toncho. Ohayo. Magandang umaga. Let us sing Negara Kusong and Wawasan Setia UITM.
Thank you all. It is our pleasure to meet all of you through this webinar, Symposium on Strategy and Transformation Management 2023. Today, we are glad to have this symposium, which is co-organized between the University Transformation Division, BTU, University of Technology Mara, in collaboration with Institute of Leadership and Development, ILD, University of Tanagimara, Malaysia. We are delighted to have speakers from Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines, Japan, and of course, from the host, University of There will be nine international and seven UITM eminent speakers that will share their best practices in strategy and transformation management for higher learning institutions. Thank you very much for all our speakers for joining us despite the different time zone that we have together in this symposium. Ladies and gentlemen, let us pay attention to the opening remarks from Professor Dr. Hajar Rozia Mamat Janur, Vice Chancellor of University of Technology Mara. Please welcome Professor Dr. Hajar Rozia Mamat Janur. Yang berbahagia, Professor Dr. Nor Hayati Saad, Assistant Vice Chancellor of U Strategy of UITM, our distinguished invited speakers, esteemed UITM senior management, and colleagues, honourable guests, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera. Greetings to everyone. Alhamdulillah, all praise is due to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala for His blessings which enable us to gather for this very significant scholarly event. It is with great honour and pleasure that I welcome you to the 2023 Symposium on Strategy and Transformation Management for Tertiary Education, SSTM TED 2023, hosted by the University Transformation Division, University of Technology Mara, UITM, in collaboration with the Institute of Leadership and Development of UITM. My heartfelt congratulations to the conference committee and organizers, especially to the Assistant Vice Chancellor of Strategy UITM, Professor Dr. Nor Hayati Saad, for organizing this exclusive intellectual gathering that focuses on higher learning institution management. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the SSTM TED 2023 gathers speakers from universities and various institutions around the world to share their best practices in strategic thinking and transformational management. The symposium aims to provide the platform for the exchange of insights, challenges and successes in navigating the dynamic landscape of strategic management at the university level. It offers higher education leaders, managers and practitioners the opportunity to explore the multifaceted dimensions of strategy and transformation, considering the interplay between organizational goals, technological advancements, societal changes and competitive environments. The symposium theme this year, Accelerating Performance Creating value highlights the importance of instilling values in every individual in an organization. This denotes that accelerating performance can lead to the enhancement of efficiency, productivity, and effectiveness in achieving goals. Creating value, on the other hand, involves generating improvements that are valuable to an organization. And this symposium has a stimulating lineup of keynote speeches that will dwell into a myriad of topics that covers all six pillars of Globally Marketable University 2023. With that in mind, as an outcome of this symposium, I hope to see more practical applications of strategic thinking and transformational practices by bringing together international and UITM management leaders we aim to foster collaborations that yield impactful outcomes, enabling organizations to thrive in an ever-evolving global landscape with our goal of achieving UITM as a globally renowned university by 2025 underway. UITM is undeniably committed to achieving its strategic goals as outlined in the UITM 2025 framework, which considers national and global trends, as well as policies and planning at the university level. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you will make this symposium a worthwhile platform for networking, forging new partnerships or even renewing collaborations. I encourage you to learn from one another, respond and react by gathering from the collective wisdom and diverse perspectives shared in this virtual symposium to unlock innovative solutions and generate actionable insights that will shape the future of strategy and transformation management. Once again, I would like to express my gratitude to the organizers of this conference and everyone involved for their hard work and dedication in ensuring the success of the event. To all distinguished speakers, guests and participants, thank you for attending and making this event meaningful and successful. May you have a fruitful and enjoyable time at the symposium and I look forward to hearing your insights and ideas. Without further ado, with Bismillah Rahman Rahim, I officiate and declare the 2023 Symposium on Strategy and Transformation Management for Tushari Education open. Thank you. Wabilahi Taufiq wal Hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Professor Datuk Dr. Hajjah Rozia Muhammad Janu. Next, let us continue with the welcoming remarks from Professor Dr. Hajjah Nur Hayati Sa'ad, Assistant Vice Chancellor of the University Transformation Division. Please welcome Professor Dr. Hajjah Nur Hayati Sa'ad. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Yang berbahagia Prof. Datuk Dr. Hajjah Roziah Muhammad Jano, Vice Chancellor of University Technology Mara, UITM, our distinguished oh invited God. speakers, esteemed UITM Hello. senior management and colleagues, Hello. honorable Hello. guests, Hello. ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera and very good morning to everyone. Alhamdulillah, 
all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his blessing which enable us to meet for this very significant UITM event. Esteemed participants, it is my great pleasure to extend a warm welcome to everyone who is joining us from different countries around the world as well as to all Warga UITM to the 2023 virtual symposium on strategy and transformation management for tertiary education hosted by the University Transformation Division, University Technology Mara, UITM Malaysia. Yeah. We are here today as a global community of yeah. educators, <laughs> administrators and thought leaders united by our shared commitment towards strategically revolutionizing the transformation of higher education. Thank you to the Vice Chancellor of UITM, Prof. Datuk Dr. Hajah Roziah Muhammad Jano for officiating the symposium. Congratulations to the University Transformation Division of UITM as the organizer and the Institute of Leadership and Development ILD as the co-organizer. Alhamdulillah. Ladies and gentlemen, in an era marked by rapid technological advancement, shifting societal needs, and an ever-changing economic landscape, the importance of strategic planning and effective management in tertiary education cannot be overstated. SSTM TET yeah, 2023, the abbreviations yeah, for the, uh, our symposium, serve as a vital platform for us to exchange ideas, share best practices, as well as collaborate on effective strategies that will shape specifically UITM towards the 2025 globally renowned university and other institutions of higher learning in Malaysia and internationally. Today, we have the distinct honour of being joined by a distinguished panel of experts and thought leaders, each of whom contribute a wealth of experience and knowledge to our discussion, inshallah. Their invaluable insight and perspective will inspire us and stimulate innovation within our own institutions. Let us seize this opportunity to learn from one another, to question our preconceived notions and to explore new horizons in the domain of higher education. The team accelerating performance, creating value, shows that the ability to accelerate is a fundamental requirement for success. One must continuously strive to enhance the efficiency, productivity and effectiveness. Value creation requires a holistic perspective where organizations balance success with ethical consideration, sustainability and social responsibility. Through this symposium, we aim to explore the interconnectedness of value creation and performance acceleration, finding ways to achieve both simultaneously. During this, uh, this symposium, we will hear from distinguished speakers, educators, administrators and thought leaders about their best practices in strategy and management, which will be able to align with the UITM six pillars of globally marketable university 2023 and as a whole of the uh, institutions of higher learning. Their experiences, knowledge and innovative strategies will motivate and equip UITM to, together with other public and private university to new heights. Through the collective knowledge shared in this interaction, we can discover new ideas, unearth, unrealized our potential, and initiate transformative change, inshallah. I encourage everyone to attend all presentation throughout this symposium and to appreciate this the diversity of perspective shared by the speakers. Let us seize the opportunity to learn from one another, cultivate meaningful connections and co-create a future that accelerates performance and generate value for all. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Before I end my speech, I would like to thank everyone who has contributed to the organization and success of this gathering. Your commitment and dedication are instrumental in fostering an environment where innovative solutions can be practiced and ideas can flourish. I encourage everyone to seize this remarkable opportunity, participate wholeheartedly and remain open to the possibility that lay ahead. Let us embark together on this journey of accelerating performance and creating value and encourage one another to achieve new heights of excellence for our organizations. Once more, I would like to extend a cordial welcome and thank all distinguished speakers and participants for attending and contributing to the success of this event. This virtual symposium on strategy and management transformation for higher education will influence and shape the global future of higher education. I wish you all a fruitful and inspiring symposium. Thank you very much. Wabillahi taufiq. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Hajjah Nur Hayati Sa'ad. Ladies and gentlemen, the organizer has uh, prepared a montage to commemorate the symposium. Sit back, enjoy the video. Uh, hope you enjoyed the video just now. Uh, we will have online photography session, so please turn on your camera. Okay, I would like to ask all the participants, speakers, to on your camera for the photography session. And Secretariat, please be ready.
All right, so thank you very much all. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now our first session of Symposium on Strategy and Transformation Management 2023. Here with us today, our first keynote speaker, Dr. Mohamed Maki, Director of Partnership and Innovation of Universitas Andalas, Indonesia. Dr. Mohamed, are you ready? That's okay for five minutes. Dr. Mohamed? Dr. Muhammad Maki, are you ready? Yes, thank you. I'm ready. Hi. Okay, so Dr. Muhammad Maki will be sharing his thoughts on World Class University 2023 initiative at Andalas University. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Muhammad Maki. Yes, thank you very much, Chair. And good morning, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as well as all participants for this uh, morning session. Uh, it will be my pleasure to share the information related to the World Class University Initiative Program from the Universitas Andalas. Uh, we understand that this initiative is not. Uh, it's not unique to only one university because uh, university globally have tried to emphasize their uh, university visibility as well as reputation to improve the recognition from other parties and stakeholders in the world. However, each strategy from university is unique and therefore I would like to share what Universitas Andalas uh, prepare for its uh, world-class university program. Okay, uh, I would like to uh, share my presentation, please. Okay. Uh, so, the World Class University Initiative in Universitas Andalas started from 2022. And the main idea behind this initiative is to accelerate growth and increase power. Since the Universitas Andalas would like to become a world class university and recognized by global academic community. Several considered banking system as well as international accreditation system are among the key factor of the Universitas Andalas World Class University program. For example, Wakley Simon as well as Time Higher Education is the two are the two main source for our parameters to measure what we already achieved so far and for entering the international academic ecosystem our study program already accredited by several international bodies such as abat 
as w i n s j n f i b a the current position of universal sanala rs model we have achieved the excellent accreditation system in for national level since 2014 and we are right now at the eighth position in the wavometric ranking for higher education in Indonesia. For the world university ranking aspects, we are currently at the 13th position and 11th position for non vocational higher education. However, for research performance, we are among the top five. In fact, we are number four currently in national research performance system and as well as innovation. And furthermore, the Ministry of Research, Technology, and Higher Education since 2020 included Universitas Analas in the first cluster because we are already uh, within the 13th ranking in national level. And starting from 2021, Universitas Analas obtained an autonomy status to manage its own uh, financial aspects. And therefore, in our milestone, we establish long-term targets such as what will be the position of Universitas Andalas within five to 10 years, what will be the play, play role for our research and innovation guidance to support the independence of the nation, as well as how we can provide inclusive academic by improving the recognition of our study programs and we understand that by having internationally recognized study program will be the main foundation for the universitas andalas to be participants in the global academic however currently in 2023 the universitas andalas is still beyond what it's intended for our current world class ranking lies beyond 1200 position globally. And then our research and innovation is still on process level where the output and the atmosphere of research is not yet established within the institution. In addition, only 10% of our study program receive international accreditation and 17% come from the undergraduate program. This means that our master and doctoral program will need to further improve to receive the international accreditation. <laughs> the strategic plans of Universitas Analas lies on the six points. The first is the smart the day-to-day -day academic activities in our university. Secondly, is the improvement of our uh, international programs where the study program should be 15% of all study program offered in universities in the last will be internationally recognized. The third pillar is the excellent research and atmospheres to produce good innovation and excellent outcomes to our university. Number four is the community service because as the higher education institute institution in Indonesia, we also have a social responsibility to support community around our university as well as within our province. The fifth is the percentage of foreign students as well as our foreign faculties. We aim to at least have 1% of student population come from abroad, as well as the faculty members should be not less than 1% from out of Indonesia. And in the shortest possible time, we aim to receive a top 700 position in global recognition for higher education. 
So from the six strategy, uh, from the six pillar, we emphasize three main strategies for Universitas Andalas. First, by strengthening our education system, by providing policy in education and curricula, as well as resources for education. Secondly, is the improvement of our curriculum. And, out and we support and encourage our students to have higher order thinking skill. The third strategic plan is the improvement or intervening the competitiveness of our graduates. We encourage our students to have off-campus experience at least for one full semester or six months to gain industrial as well as uh, soft skill from, from the location of their internship. Then we have the career development for our alumni. And this career development is not only finished after the alumni uh, get their job or uh, establish their uh, company or enterprise. But the de career development will be a long life uh, system that will support through all the stage of our alumni, whether they are on the entry level, middle career, or the top career position. And the last one, to provide professional certification for our graduates so they can compete with others, not only in Indonesia, but in Asian and global market. To support our infrastructure, uh, Universitas Andalas has created the master plan from 2020 until 20, uh, 2030. The main emphasis is to provide more than half of our open area as a green space to maintain the green level and sustainability of our campus. Secondly, we strengthen our zoning and align the carrying capacity, the environment toward the energy requirement and energy production of our university. And the last one, we switch our energy dependency from fully fossil energy toward renewable energy. At the moment, we have two uh, renewable energy uh, power plants. Micro be starting to produce the energy within this or the next year, and a solar cell that will be installed within this year to produce the required energy for our university in the next coming years. So the universitas analysts understand that excellent higher education research will become the most important determinants of the threat of our university. And excellence, like all things of abiding value, is a marathon, not a sprint. And therefore, we set our goal proportionally, but visionary. We understand that become a global recognized university cannot be materialized within one or two years, but it will be long and endured effort that will require all support from our stakeholders as well as us internally. Therefore, the Universitas Andalas shift their strategies from academic-centric toward research-centric. And for this strategy, Universitas Andalas has set up keys for world-class research to increase our global competitiveness. This is the current situation from the Ministry of Education that uh, explain the situation of higher education institution in Indonesia. At the moment, Universitas Andalas lies at the four cluster, which means that we are universities that lies beyond top 1,000 university recognized globally. And to break the barrier and achieve our milestone to become top 500 universities, we understand that all effort should be placed into well-planned activities, as well as 
to rationalize our resources, most notably academic resources, student resources, and financial resources. So together with our government, uh, 12 activities was, were set up to materialize the, uh, the strategy to become world-class university, such as joint research and publication program for sabbatical leave, joint research facilities shared between universities and research institutions in Indonesia. We create university consortium, such as the National University Network of Indonesia. We also actively engage in other consortium activities, such as the UNINET for Asian level, Asian University Consortia, Asian European Universities uh, Collaboration, Japan ASEAN University Collaboration, and so on. Moreover, we highly encourage our staff and students to conduct mobilities, uh, free mobilities that have a uh, seamless uh, that have seamless barrier for uh, administration requirement. For, ex uh, for example, the staff can easily apply for uh, sabbatical leave for less than six months, as well as the student. In fact, we urge the students to become among the, the leaders in these mobility activities. The government, as well as our university, provides scholarships not only for individuals from Indonesia, but also individuals from Asian, as well as other region of uh, work. And we provide training and industrial internships. This is not only for outbound activities, but also inbound activities. It means that not only our staff and students train in industry, but industrial human resource can be trained in our university to improve their soft skill as well as strengthen their academics and know-how about their technical aspects. We understand that uh, during the first, uh, during the COVID-19, we have the barrier for learning activities and therefore the online uh, learning activities further developed by the government uh, to anticipate post-COVID-19 situation in Indonesia and globally. The development of curriculum uh, recently included not only academic but also commercial and industrial aspect. We invite our alumni, we invite our industrial partners, as well as other institutions in Indonesia, including non-government organizations, to re rewrite our curriculum so it will be most fit to the current situation and therefore our graduates will easily compete for the uh, job offered by institution as well as creating their own business. Uh, the university understand that uh, human resource is the main pillar of uh, universities because we have uh, so much uh, postdoctoral student, we have so much professor, we have so much uh, graduate student and undergraduate students that can share their knowledge in micro-credential activities such as short course and training. And we also uh, accelerate other academic activities, such as comp academic competition, such as offering of uh, summer course and other uh, activities, including uh, industrial engagement, as well as industrial research. Because Universal Sandalas uh, we are strengthening it, its research and innovation pillar. The strategy of our research will be lies on the basis of food, natural medicine, and nutrition, as well as health. The policy direction and the acceleration programs provided to have international scientific recognition, and we train the staff and students to learn how to create proposal, how to conduct research, and how to apply 
for program through external uh, foundation or uh, funding uh, body. From this strategy, uh, since 2022, Universitas Andalas already achieved one goal, which is the top most productive university that produce intellectual property in Indonesia. The intellectual properties included patent application, copyrights, as well as industrial design and trademarks. And this achievement already recognized and acknowledged as well as we receive award from the government for three consecutive years. And to improve the financial stability of our university, the intellectual properties will be further downstream to industry to be commercialized. And at the moment, we already uh, discuss intensively with other industry, in particular, the industry in uh, agro system, agro industry, as well as uh, the industry of uh, service and uh, industry in uh, chemical. We, we discuss with our industry as a business partners because we want to have our university to strengths not only in research, but to benefit from the research product that we uh, create. And to support the research ecosystem in Universitas Andalas, our university has a plan approximately 127 million US dollar for further development to strengthen laboratory to strengthen the faculty, as well as to strengthen uh, our academics uh, facilities in and outside our university. So we come back to the recognition system of World University. And two main uh, recognition bodies, Rockley Simon, as well as some head of higher education, is among the main body that uh, recognized by the Ministry of Education in Indonesia to be a parameter or measurement of what the university in Indonesia had achieved so far. But we understand that productivity isn't everything because in the long run, uh, productivity alone cannot fulfill all the requirements for a global recognized university. And therefore, aside from productivities, Universitas Andalas also emphasis in its long-term strategy, the feasibility and the reputation as its three main pillars for our milestone. For the last three years, more than 20 universities in Indonesia already included in the global recognition for academic reputation. The position of each university are fluctuative and dynamics, but most often the university can improve or can decrease its position as compared to the previous years because the lack of financial support or the lack of research on academic activities in the previous years. Universitas Analyst World Plus University Initiative is a status that requires recognition, not just client. And therefore, we must have put our effort to for this recognition. And to obtain universal global status, Universitas Andalas should be reasonable to accept the current position and what its capacity can put itself into in the future. We set our objective by hyper competitive status. It means that we understand that in day-to-day -day business, we can improve our academic out outcomes for 
but we try to have it triple or 30% annually. And because this effort requires very, uh, very large investment, uh, Universitas Andalas will only select the main key factor that could improve its international or global economic recognition. We concentrate our talent and our resource partially to support the world class university initiative. We no more depend heavily dependent uh, by the government supports because we understand as the institution that already obtained autonomic status for financial uh, system, uh, Universitas Andalas will have to less and less depend on government uh, financial supports because the government will expect that we uh, we so we start create our own income generating system so this is uh, five university as our peers in indonesia a portrait our uh, research capacities such as the productivity of uh, articles number of citations number of person that have a uh, high uh, index for citation and the number of documents per person in our uh, current situation nonetheless if we saw national trends in indonesia most university uh, face declining productivity of artic uh, of academic articles uh, since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. So therefore, uh, encourage, encouraging our uh, academics and students to be productive in uh, research publication is no longer uh, the main solution for obtaining the world-class university. Uh, status and therefore now we lies our hope and our uh, strategy in global partnerships gro global partnership uh, strategies to access the facility for research to improve our human research by learning from the best universities from the best academics available globally and explore other funding opportunity opportunity not only from Indonesia but also from Asian for example from European Commission and other uh, funding provider including the United Nations so this strategy uh, lies in the policy that favor the development of world-class research atmosphere in Universitas Andela. So we start to create international uh, collaboration research as a norm in Universitas Andela. We encourage our staff, for example, to create publication with peers from other universities outside Indonesia. And we saw what is the global research direction and pull our research from the current position to align with the piping of uh, research output from other institutions. And therefore, we can have uh, international research collaboration with the similar goal with our peers. So to support this ecosystem research, the Universitas Andalas try to establish and build a research group. This is facilitated by our world-class university programs. These research groups uh, create from a group of researchers that have similar passion in their uh, topics, and we provide a certain amount of incentive. By creating the research groups, the productivities and synerg uh, the productivities 
create from synergy and collaboration with our peers and research partners in the domestic and international countries have already uh, reached by the improvement of the number of patent apply for the last three years, as well as international patent application starting from this year's and last year's, as well as the number of submitted articles from our academic and professors in Universal Andalas. Furthermore, we also establish a collaboration in coaching because uh, we understand that creating articles is difficult, but having our article published and followed or cited by other uh, researchers is more challenging. So the strategy is to, uh, is to create uh, clusters of uh, research topics and then included our academics from Universitas Andalas and we invite other academics from university in Indonesia and outside of the country. And the whole cluster will be combined to focus on one field of study. For example, for example how to face the challenge of uh, nutrition intake of our nation that cause the uh, obstruction of the physical development of the child. Other research collaboration that uh, support by ministry, such as uh, Southeast Asia and European Joint Funding Scheme, and then uh, the E-ASEAN program, as well as Newton Fund, uh, have seen that uh, Universitas Andalas participates in these activities. And in conclusion, the recommendation that we provide to establish what does University in Indonesia as an initiative is to see our weakness and to find our strength as well as the opportunity. The Universitas Andalas have to improve in its reputation, both in academic and employer, as well as have to increase the ratio of faculty to student and international student and academic. And therefore, the first strategy is to increase the cooperation both in research and academic in order to enhance our university international reputation. Secondly, the improved of faculty to student ratio. Therefore, uh, for the world class university program, we invite lecturers from global to come to uh, Universitas Andalas, not only to teach, but to engage with our staff and students to share their knowledge, to learn how to apply uh, international funding, and to learn how to write best quality manuscripts to be published in the reputed international journal and in addition we have to learn in universitas andalas and through world class university initiative loans we already invite more than 100 students to universitas andalas they study for short visits as well as for full degree in universitas andalas and we want to strengthen our internal coordination because uh, communication should be uh, created more intensively to have the similar uh, framework and to similar understanding about what is the World Class University Initiative and why we should uh, have to work together to support this initiative and what will be the benefits to the staff and to the student of Universitas Andalas. Uh, the last two recommendation is to increase the publication and to increase employer reputation by working intensively with alumni. And by the World Class University Initiative, we already enrich our uh, alumni database up to 56 
770 persons. So further important steps with our autonomy status is the creation of endowment funds, the establishment of wakaf and zakat for uh, institution management, and to create the business unit in Universitas Andalas. And therefore, in this uh, opportunity, we also would like to uh, offer potential cooperation with our university, such as student as staff exchange, second man of staff in Universitas Andalas, creation of research and publication with collaborative activities, placing culture and science showcase in Universitas Andalas, uh, providing licensed officers from Universitas Andalas to support education and culture exchange with our universities, development of international joint degree or double degree programs. We also could provide Indonesian language uh, study program or short course. We also uh, could provide uh, learning for natural disaster, food and health supporting system in supporting technology. And we would like to expand our postgraduate programs uh, to not only have a national student intakes, but also international intakes through cooperation and collaboration with our uh, embassies, Indonesian embassies in all continents. And the last one, we promote both culture with our uh, university partners as well as wisdom on how to create and how we can work together to obtain uh, global recognition as a uh, best academic university in the world. Other developments will be conducted through internal and external funding. And we are also working with a multinational company and international institution to uh, achieve this agenda. And this is uh, a share of what current activities uh, happening in Universitas Andalas. We have visit from uh, Middle East countries that would like to share the university resources with Universitas Andalas. And we also receive recognition from their ministry of international cooperation related to the uniqueness of Universitas Andalas uh, study programs that offer academic excellence in three aspects, food, health, and natural disasters. Uh, Universitas Andalas also established the education hospital in which the students as well as staff from foreign country can learn uh, in, the un uh, in the university hospitals to improve their uh, academics and health skills, as well as knowledge about the tropical disease and how to handle and manage. I think that's all uh, that we can share to all the distinguished audience in this morning. And we really hope that uh, what we have done uh, can uh, promote and can encourage our friends in UITM as well as other university in Indonesia and Malaysia to further strengthen our regional cooperation and collaboration. Thank you very much. Good day. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Muhammad Maki, for your eye-opening thoughts, which uh, surely um, has given us a new perspective in alignment with UITM 2025 strategic plan to become a globally renowned university by 2025. So, um, dear participants, we shall open for one or two questions. You may post your question to the chat box on WebEx or on YouTube Live chat box. Okay, um, let's look at um, the first questions that I have here. Okay, um, 
Dr. Muhammad, uh, what strategies that have been carried out by Andalas University to inculcate world-class university working culture among the staff? Okay, um, what strategies that have been carried out by Andalas University to inculcate world-class university working culture among the staff? <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, to address this question, the Universitas Andalas already uh, strengthened the facilities in our uh, classes such as providing uh, teleconference facilities as well as smart, uh, smart facilities. Therefore, we can have parallel class by two lectures, one from Universitas Andalas and the other from our partner university that have similar or same, uh, same topics about the class. For example, we can have a joint class for food processing. The class in Universitas Andalas will share about the food processing from local cultivar or local community in Indonesia. And the other class uh, could share the food processing in their respective region, for example, in Japan or in Europe. And with this facility, both lectures and all the students can uh, dialect directly without uh, any barriers uh, while using the uh, video conference. So the student from, for example, from Japan University can ask the question to our staff Continue. and answer immediately. And both classes can see each other the situation inside the class. So student and stud uh, all students can participate, both uh, lectures can have discussion, and we even can have a combined groups. For example, uh, working groups uh, in the class with several students from our class and several students other universities. Furthermore, we also uh, strengthen our international uh, activities. And uh, by strengthening, I mean that uh, we invite or we promote mobility programs to have our students uh, visit other university and vice versa to have other uh, students from university uh, come to Universitas Andalas. And they will uh, have the similar class. They will uh, participate in the, in the class according to their uh, uh, year or semesters, as well as their field of studies. And by uh, inviting the students, uh, we also extend the communication with the supervisor of these students. So from Universitas Andalas, uh, we have uh, contacts, for example, in UITM about lectures that working uh, with the uh, food health programs or with the lectures that working with uh, agro-industry or with the lecture that working in economic space that have the student coming to uh, Universitas Andalas. And vice versa, we also send students to UICM and the supervisor of these students will have communication with the respective uh, class, uh, 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 respective, uh, respective uh, professors in UITM that are working with similar topics for research. Uh, in addition, we also uh, starting the program for writing books, joint publication in writing books, and then uh, join activities to develop uh, classes or course materials. And we share our resources, not only in laboratory resources, but also our network because uh, each university have their own partners whether for uh, partners in uh, government, uh, as well as partners in industry and commerce. So we can share this resource, and this resource will be beneficial to all of us to support each other uh, for improvement of our uh, international academic recognition. Thank you. All right, um, interesting. One of the points that um, 
I can highlight is the student mobility. So while the students is outside uh, the university, we can also establish a communication with the uh, supervisors. All right, so, um, okay, uh, Dr. Muhammad, we have one more questions for you. Um, this is about alumni. Um, how do you get alumni to be involved and contribute back to the university? How do you get alumni to be involved and contribute back to the university? Okay, thank you very much, Chair. So to invite the alumni to engage with them, especially the alumni that already have a decision maker position in many uh, institutions as well as companies, we first invite them uh, by uh, creating a program that we call alumni leaders. And we also uh, create the program that we call alumni engagements in which the alumni leaders uh, will be uh, consist of alumni that have top management level status at the current uh, year, for example. And then we promote them by uh, sharing their achievement in our uh, university's uh, news, our university's uh, social media, and our university's other uh, information outlets. And through this recognition, other, uh, other alumni would like to participate in these programs. And this is a domino effect in which for each, uh, each person uh, promoted by the university, the other alumni would like to have similar opportunity. And uh, uh, the system also encourages us to have contact with them and to promote our fresh graduates to um, be recruited by these uh, alumni uh, or to be considered as the potential human resource in the future career development of these alumni. Uh, furthermore, uh, we also uh, uh, include our alumni in research and academic activities, such as the improvement of uh, course materials, the revision of our curriculum, as well as uh, become the partners for research and uh, uh, social activities that are required by our ministries. Uh, because uh, most research in Indonesia uh, require research peers from industry. And research peers from industry will be best if we can, uh, if we can utilize uh, our alumni by ourselves. Um, all right, thank you very much, Dr. Muhammad. I believe that one of the key points that I can um, catch up just now is make them our partners, isn't it? Okay, we make them as our partners. So I think um, that is all questions for uh, Dr. Muhammad Maki. If other participants still have some questions, you may still post them into our chat box or from our uh, YouTube live, and we will try um, to answer them um, um, at the end of the session. Okay, um, okay. Uh, anyway, we still have another questions for you, uh, Dr. Muhammad. Can you take another questions? Dr. Muhammad, can you take another questions? Yes, please. All right, all right. Okay, so the question that we have here is, um, do you have uh, individual performance indicator that have to be fulfilled by all the staff? Do you have individual performance indicator that have to be fulfilled by the staff? Yes, yes we have. Uh, this is required by the uh, ministry. So the policy require uh, each lecture or uh, each uh, faculty members to obtain at least uh, 16 points with different parameters such as uh, research activities, publication, and then uh, intellectual properties, achievement 
or patent application, as well as the number of uh, books, the number of uh, courses materials that uh, develop during uh, each semester, as well as the number of classes that uh, uh, supervise, the number of students supervise, the number of students that uh, graduate in time, as well as uh, activities that supports the development of our universities. And this is quite challenging because uh, we only have a limited amount for research. We have limited amount for uh, writing our publication. And we have a very limited amount for our uh, academics and teaching activities. So, okay, to fulfill all the requirements, uh, each individual uh, should work together because uh, working alone will not have sufficient time we will not have sufficient time to fulfill all these requirement parameter by the government and this parameter should be fulfilled and evaluated every semester every six months we have to achieve it otherwise uh, there will be some penalty to the lectures and uh, it will be in terms of financial aspect all right, and I believe that uh, here in uh, UITM, we actually have almost uh, similar performance indicator because we are in uh, higher education, I believe. Okay, so I think um, that's it. Uh, uh, all the questions uh, posted. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohamed Maki, for joining us. Thank you very much again. Dr. Mohama, you are very popular this morning. I can see that uh, on the chat box on Webex, we have uh, one more question. Uh, what strategies are in place to make your university uh, a learning organization since WCU are continuously improving their performance? What strategies are in place to make your university uh, a learning organization since WCU are continuously improving their performance. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, this is an uh, interesting question because we understand that uh, post uh, higher education uh, institution in Indonesia prior to COVID-19 are the institution that's uh, relatively stagnant in developing their uh, academics activities but uh, due to COVID-19 situation and driven by the requirements uh, from our uh, government as well as the target provided for each uh, academic individual in uh, every universities uh, now uh, everyone uh, should be uh, academic plus entrepreneurs <laughs> yeah, it's mean that uh, we have to outsource ourselves we have to outreach our partners to understand what is happening right now. So every every uh, teaching materials, every time we teach in the class, we bring the current uh, issues or the current situation uh, in reality uh, facing uh, difficulty facing by our industry, for example, or a situation in our uh, food system that uh, need addresses by uh, us as academician to provide solutions for the government. And this uh, situation also shared to the class. So not only us as the teacher will uh, have the issues, learning the problems and creating the solution, but the students also understand that uh, studying in university is not only learning from the book, that already printed 10 or 20 years ago. But now we learn from the current issue and then we try to solve it academically and uh, non-academically. It's mean that students not only have to have academic skills, but they also have uh, uh, soft skills, other skills that can support uh, to solve these problems. For example, uh, we want to promote how to have a healthy meal 
for a younger generation in every day. So not only we we try to find what is the food resource that can fulfill uh, for the required uh, nutrient uh, intakes for the uh, elementary school student, for example, but how to promote it, how to create the uh, how to create the information in social media, how to create uh, and share the information in a flyer or in posters that are uh, not dull but quite informative and quite attractive. So even the student in elementary school would like to see and learn and understand the information that are placed in that poster or flyer. I think that's uh, the, the current situation then. And I believe uh, it quite similar in Malaysia as well, because uh, everything is uh, calculated by not not minutes, but seconds now. <laughs> if you have a, a yesterday news, it means that it's already passed, and you need to find another news for current classes uh, to be shared with our students. <laughs> Okay. Yes, Thank you. I think yes. That's my answer. All right. Yes. Um, so what we can see that uh, we 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 learn from the current issues, and for the students itself, uh, they not on, we they require not only the academic skills, but also the soft skills, but also the uh, social skills. So I think is there any uh, other questions? I believe that is all from the chat box. Okay. This is the countless time I say thank you to you, Dr. Mohammed. Okay, so thank you, thank you uh, for joining us this morning. So let us end, gentlemen. Let us uh, move on to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, thank you. So our next speaker is Assistant Professor Dr. Romian Kosai Kanon, Director of Siamio Rehab Thailand. Uh, Dr. Romian, are you ready, Dr. Romian? I will speak on behalf of Dr. Romian. All right, so yeah. thank you. Uh, so Dr. Romian will share her views on Pillar 1, world-class faculty members. And the title given is Futuristic Internalization Towards Sustainable Learning and Living. So ladies and gentlemen, please um, uh, welcome Dr. Romian. So my slide is clear, right? All right. So let's start. Salam sejahtera and very good morning. Sawadika from Bangkok, Thailand. I'm Yi Teng from C uh, Program Officer of Mobility and Engages from Simura Heads. On behalf of Dr. Rom Yens, we would like to apologize because she unable to attend for this symposiums uh, of his uh, her health conditions so i would like to continue with the uh, presentations on sharing with you the topic of futuristic internalizations towards sustainable learning and living so before that i want to introduce uh, the organizations simura heads simura heads is Southeast Asia Minister of Education Organization, Simio, Regional Center specializing in higher education and development. So actually we are an uh, inter-government organization. We are working very closely with the, all the governments in the Southeast Asia countries. So these three objectives from Simio Heads. The first one, we do the policy dialogues, which is used to fostering the efficiency and effectiveness of the higher education. So the second part, we promoting the exchange and dissemination of information and research findings on the higher education planning and management. So we are working on the knowledge maximizations. And then the third part is promote collaborations among the member countries. For establishing institutional linkage, engage, we use have the mobility and linkage and also assist them in strengthening institution building and developments. We're working through for their capacity enhancement and leadership. So with that, I want to continue to share you a case study of the Asian International Mobility for Students programs we call AMS programs. I think for UITMs, 
uh, you guys are very familiar with this because uh, you are part of the member member university under M's programs. So what we do for the M's programs is because uh, for the regions we want to create the ASEAN communities. So what is our ASEAN communities? Is like the students or the fresh graduates can commit to one to another countries in the Southeast Asia to work in the ASEAN. Just like the in the European unions, they do for their, they do like one system. They can travel, travel the system, the higher education system. They can recognize by the university, or you can recognize by the member countries, and then the students can work. Uh, the fresh graduate can work on that. So this this is the visions that we want to create back to two thousand twenty. So how can you? Uh, do it without understand the education system uh, of the member countries. So as you as you concerns, we have like a very unique and various education system in the Southeast Asia countries. So including the Malaysia as quite different from the Indonesia and Thailand, Singapore, Philippines, and that. And then we have this different credit systems that concern in the higher education. So with that. We comes out with a, it comes out with the uh, initiative is called to harmonize the higher education in the Southeast Asia. We call it a harmonize the uh, harmonize is because we are not ask the member countries to integrate to be a whole. We want to reduce it to be a whole. We want to understand more about the higher education system in the in the member countries so that we learn from each other. That will be what we say about the harmonize the higher education in the Southeast Asia. So with that, we start with a pilot project we call MIT project, which is Malaysia, Indonesia, and Thailand, which stands for. And then MIT project we conclude and also like we have three countries we want to do for the mobility program. So with that to support the regional communities, we have the 23 participations of the university, 270 students with the five initial disciplines that we propose. So the five initial disciplines actually is the strength or is the strategies that the ASEAN can ASEAN members country that are pro on, which on agriculture, food science, technology, te hospitality and tourism, international business and language and culture. So after that, we have some terms and conditions of the pilot project. First is the credit transfer availability. Second is the English as a medium of teaching. Third is the waived student fee by the host university. So these three terms and conditions actually is make us more understanding the higher education system in the Southeast Asia. So we also have a target that by 2015, we want to have the 500 students student numbers of the mobility. And also for this M's program, it's not only for the students. We have five stakeholders, like all of the university members is our stakeholders, including the policy of the higher education, the like policy member of the higher education is more to like ministry levels, the university leaders, program coordinators, international relation officers and students. Why we talk about like five stakeholders, the first one, the uni, uh, the ministry level, because they need to fix the M's programs and like the MIT projects into the policy level so they can more facilitate to the mobility. That's the first one. Second, university leaders. Why university leaders important is because they need to uh, propose a policy to waive the tuition fee by the host university. So we will receive the students uh, without asking them to pay for the tuition fee. So they will be under the agreements inside. And then the third one, program coordinators. Program coordinators need to liaise with all the teachers, all the professors to teach all the courses in English. Because our, our main condition is that English is a medium of teaching. English is a main course that we learn from each other. And then the fourth one is the international relation officers. It's important is because internet IRO is more to like logistic part, do for the uh, helps in the visa, how the accommodations of the international mobility students. And also the students, students is more to like, they have the uh, credit transfer, they have, learned, have the opportunity to learn from their 
higher education system in the Southeast Asia and also uh, aside from learning the course. So in 2012, we have received a request from Vietnam to join in the MIT projects. And then also in 2013, we have from Brunei, Philippines and Japan to join us in these projects. With that, we changed our names from MIT projects, MIT pilot projects to officially launch as ASEAN Inter Asians International Mobility for Student Program, which is called AMS program. So this is no longer pilots because we have more expand university. So in the in terms of the more expand university, we have more students to join at the time we have uh, and in 2013, we have already 700 students and with the participations of 59 universities among the uh, seven countries. So aside from the aspect of the countries, also aspect of our disciplines. So we include biodiversity, economics, engineering, econ environmental science and management and marine science in the disciplines, which is include what? included in the Mutual Agre Recognition Agreement and RA in the ASEAN communities. So we're still working together, uh, working together to form the ASEAN communities by 2020. So the uh, we form this is that like they can produce more skilled labor, like engineering costs, biodiversity costs, economics, they get more skilled diverse in the ASEAN countries. So we have more university, we have more disciplines, we have more countries to join, and SEMS, we have more students, then we will face challenges. So first one will be the visa matters. Visa matters that like normally the students will get like once month for the tourist visa in terms of the Southeast Asia country. And then in their education visa, they maximum have the three months, but then for the MS program, we have four months. Then how the countries to facilitate it for their visa matters is a is a problem for that. And then the second one is the inactive disciplines. Same, you can foresee that that biodiversity, marine science, and also the environmental science and management is fall into the similar similar field. So in case of the student num mobility student number, it will be quite low compared to other disciplines. So we call it as inactive disciplines. Also, we also face the problems of the budgets. One thing to tell is uh, the budget is from the government side, is from the governments of each country that propose the budgets to the member university so that the university can use the money for the mobility uh, to student for the mobility process. So the budget cut from the ministry or from the government sites will directly affect towards the mobility numbers and also the operation of the mobility. And then next we have the academic calendar. If you uh, ever concerns or you ever check with your international friends, they will see that the academic, academic calendar is somehow is different from one another. Like Japan mostly will be like two years. Uh, part of two years interfere with our Malaysia University. So they will start in August and then for us, we will start in like October for in Malaysia. Okay. So there will be another problem for our academic calendar and also the change of the staff. Change of staff mostly will be like how if the ministry level change the person or if the IRO change the person or faculty member change the person to coordinate for the MS program, it will be like Mm, from ones that is have the experience to ones that is no experience at all. So the changing of staff also have uh, become a challenge for the AMS program because these many things that you really need to know what is happening, this and that, and then so that you can more facilitate to the students that go for the mobility. And also the comparison. What I mean by comparison mostly will be the numbers. Because all the budget is from the governments, and then the governments also hope that the inbound and the outbound, inbound is the student that they receive, outbound is the student they send out to the mobility, will almost similar, so they can have the like budget cross. But then there is some countries that cannot fix that fix that number, so they they always have the comparisons to fix the challenges. So this will be the few matters.
that which we always discuss in our meetings. So what we, uh, how we deal with all these challenges, we set up the steering committee. What is mean by steering committee is a it's kind of the working groups or a kind of committee groups that consist of the one ministry level persons from the government and then one university representative from one country. So if I have like now we have seven, so we have seven from each member countries in the ministry level and seven university representative from the each country levels. So in total, uh, in total, we have one steering committee that discuss the challenges, how to deal with the challenges and then provide the solution. Like we talk about visa matters. So the ministry level person can bring back the issue to the governments and then they can discuss with it and deal with it and how this issue can be solved. So that's how we integrate with all the member governments compared to we integrate more to the university levels. Okay. So with that, in 2016, we also, re, uh, we also have Korea to join us. And then in 2019, we have Singapore to join us. So uh, you can see our logo also change, become more attractive and more like, fresh to facilitate for nine, uh, now we have nine countries. So for this impact, we have a total of nine countries, 82 universities and 6,000 students, alumni right now and then a good news is we will uh, receive the 10 country the kingdom of cambodia to join us with uh, we five more university to become 87 by the end of this year so this will be like a few pictures that we have done last two weeks we have the steering committee meetings last two weeks in indonesia and then we visit borobudo temple and then this will be the pictures and then the annual review meeting actually is a meeting that consists of all the member countries and then all the faculty members and all the international relations officers representative that comes to us uh, one place to have the meetings and then to discuss all the issues, how to move forward, how to discuss, uh, how to make this ends mobility more feasible and accessible to everyone. So next, we will talk about the 5C disruptions in the internalizations. So as we know, in 2019, there is something big happens that stop us in, in the home at, at home and then we cannot do anything either. So with this 5C disruptions, we want to discuss what is the impact, what is the disruptions that towards internalization especially in the higher education development so first one is the covid 19 for sure in 2019 until now we have the post covid in covid 19 we has we stop everyone at home and then we have can be said like no physical mobility is going on so if no physical mobility is going on this means i know i change students can be done yeah people will say oh we have the virtual mobility we have the e-mobility we have hybrid mobility this and that but then this is not the same when the students travels to the to the country to experience the culture to experience the system of the higher education it's because as an example if you taste the nasi lama in malaysia and you show the picture on the on the zoom events or in the webex it's it's totally different right so it's also the impact of the of the COVID 19 towards the mobilities in the uh in the internationalizations in the internalization okay so the next one we'll talk about conflicts the conflicts we can see the us and china conflicts and then some Burma conflicts this and this and that countries conflicts that actually change the movement of the students change the flow of the students. What I mean by change of the flow of the students is this, like last time we have, people are for going forward to like US, US, UK, like actually in China, they were moving students out from their, students will like 
have to study abroad opportunity they will move to like us or go to other countries but then because of the certain policy changes certain uh certain conflicts that makes between the two countries actually they diverge into the ASEAN countries they diverge more into the ASEAN countries and then we can really feel the impact of the of their conflicts so this will be the conflicts that I want to mean in, in terms of the impact. And next will be the commercialization, the third C. What we mean by like commercialization? In the past, Westerns, in the West, they want to have the more international students. They want to receive more international students because they want to know about the higher education in the part and in the another part of the world. So they provide have the tuition free tuition fee free free of charge of the tuition free or they provide the scholarship they can facilitate the mobility students to their country to study but then now we can realize that the, all the student all the university needs money to facilitate to operate and then and then more university or more western university come to our regions to actually attract the students to go to study in their countries so when they is called by attract study, that means that you need to pay for the for the for the tuition fee for everything. So as an international students, normally we need to pay more as uh, the university will charge more for the uh, international student. So as we when we go there, then we'll be have more charge. So the tuition fee last time has been free and now it's no more free. And then we promote like the West will promote more to that like, T and E transnational educations which we talk about the double degrees which had concurred for had needs have a needs of more money to invest into the education so it's public education is like no longer free and it's need more money to to be there next we have the climate change so climate change always a important issue that we talk if we talk about the sustainability sustainable development goals sdg and then we want to talk about the goals 13 14 or we want to call goals this and that and then when we call for the climate change naturally they have the very impact towards ourselves is we people wish to have the long travel means long long travel wish to have the long travel and then a long period of stay like I from Malaysia or from Bank from Thais, we travel to UK. We want to have like another two weeks there. Not like we go for one event and then we come back. We maybe have a two weeks or three weeks there. Like, three weeks that have more opportunity, have more events to attend, and then after that settle, then we come back. We will we have I prefer for the greener economy, greener mobility. And then it will be make our it can reduce the energy that we produce for the for the climate change and also and also help to facilitate for the more effective effective mobility so the last change a uh, last c will be the crisis then the crisis will more do we call it a multiple crisis what i mean by crisis is like the economic crisis that we're facing now the crisis the economic crisis actually like make our governments to cut down the budget of the mobilities or cut, uh, cut uh, mostly the uh, governments will face some issue in terms of the economy crisis and then when the budget cut down then the uh, the number of mobility students will also cut down because there is no enough money budgets to facilitate for the more number of students when the student number cut down also we will like lower down the internalizations that we want to we want to facilitate so there will be a crisis that we uh, will, crisis they will be facing also inequality what you mean by inequality because like just like in us black and white like in uh, asian country there will be have some problems towards like, some people or some uh specific specific levels of people so we look down on them their, their uh demonstration uh bias that's which they have the less opportunity to go for the internalization they have the less opportunity to go for study and then there will be another crisis for us and also the inclusivity 
people in everyone mindsets were more to like um, students is the only learners students is the one who go for study and go for uh go for study abroad and this and that everything but then actually if you want to promote more to inclusivity we want to include all the all the learners from all ages so this is what the crisis impacts and then what we want to transform for so we talk about the crisis we call about the case study now it's a time for us to talk about the transformation the transformations it's called by the United Nations. It's called by the United uh, UNESCO. It's called by all around the country, uh, all around the organizations. We want to call for transformations. It's not called for a change, but then we call for a transformation. A change is like I change these shirts. I change to uh, red color shirts. It's a change. It's a small change. But then when we call for the transformations, it's called like we want to have the systematic change we want to change the system we want to change the mindsets we want to change the thinking of the people to become more feasible more sustainable more innovative so this is what we means by the transformations as we read my transformations we need to value of the more we really think a value of the mobility because for us mobility is a tool for the internalizations so we use mobility as a initiative is a tool to know more about the internationalization to know more about their higher education system to know more about the cultures so when we have this mobility then it needs to value it then how we value it in m's programs we have value it into three identity what is three identity including self-competency intercultural competency and regional and global awareness in these three competency, we are talking about self competency. When we go abroad, the students can feel like what is their good, uh, what they are good at, what is their weakness, what is their pros and cons in terms of themselves. So with that, they can like, improve by the, improve themselves by going through the lectures, by going through the programs, by going through their uh, trainings, whatever whatever they want to do to improve themselves to increase their self competency they were the ones we want to promote the second is intercultural competency intercultural competency is more to like learn uh, knowing yourself the culture and then share your cultures to everyone so everyone it will be a shame if you don't know your culture when you go for the international levels and then people will think what is the nasi lama for what is the uh what uh, what we eat for the nasi lama how, how what is the ingredients this and that that will be the first thing uh the first question they ask because people will come together together when internalization is not like you go up it's not between you and me but then it's you and me and all others all around the world and then people will come to say, oh, I, I, I know how to say Sawati Kaudi. She say hi. And then in Malaysia, we call it as uh, Apple Kaba or Salam Sejatra. Or in, in uh, Japan or Korea, we will say different. So it will be the intercultural competency. So people will keep, think, uh, keep learning from the culture of themselves before they go in for that. So as, as for me, as an example, I am the M student. I am the M alumni. And then I, I went to mobility in Thailand, in the Northern Thailand. And then I, yeah, at first, I don't know how to speak Thai at all. I just don't ask Sawati Kap, Sawati Kap. And then others, I don't know. And then, but then when they ask about our culture, eh, and they ask about our culture, we only say, oh, Nasi Lama. We, we only, what we think can Nasi Lama, and then what is the dance that we can promote to them, this and that. We, gather a group and then how to share with the people because people are always like oh this i already heard for a few times you need to know what is the secrets what is the back back behind, uh, behind story what is the background story of the of the last cinema or the other food other dance that that comprise in our culture so there will be the intercultural competency that we want to promote and then the next one will be regional and global awareness what we call by regional and global awareness is like how you aware of the region and global issue basically so in malaysia we have the six states election soon in thailand they are doing the prime minister vote in china and us they are facing the high temperature seasons where there is some numbers 
pass away or that of because of the uh, it's like they cannot withstand with the high temperature and also like all the regions we want to know more about regions we want to know more about global we always talk about global citizens global citizens not same as one against not because you i go for another country i'm the global citizens but then i know more about the global issues i know more about the regional issues and then i can i thought i can relate with the culture that that from my countries and other countries it can be called as global citizens global citizen is more to like aware of the regional and global issue we can talk on behalf of the regional and, and the global we don't see us as a country we don't see one country as a country we see us as a, a part of the world so this is how we do for the global citizen next we also do for the empower learning empower learning what is mean by empower learning the learning is not only in the classroom but then it's also outside the classroom we want to learn from each other and learn from everywhere that we can and then we want to promote more inclusive what i mean by more inclusive that i just told just now we have learned more about more inclusivity then uh, the learners can be all ages it's not only specific for the student uh, from seven uh, from from the kindergarten to the university levels, they can be more ranges of all ages in terms of the learners. We want to transform the digitalization, which is in the digitalization era. Everything is like on one click. You go for Shopee, you go for Lazada, everything. You just for one click, you go to settle the soft, uh, the documents. It just click, 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 and then done. So we want to promote the digitalization. But then the digitalization is very poor in some ASEAN country because they have the less infrastructure infrastructure compared to others. So we want to also promote the inclusivity to help them to uh, improve their digitalization, improve their research, improve their everything. And also the last one will be the connectivity and understanding of the people. What we mean by connectivity and understanding of the people is not like connect between you and me, but then it's more to like understand people, understand the people culture, understand the people uh, strategies, understand the people like how how is a background, and then we can relate to one another because everyone is come from a different background, and then everyone's is proposed have a different ideas. Everyone is unique, but then to become the global citizen, to become a more resilient in internalizations or more sustainable internalizations in the in terms of living and learning we need to learn and connect and understand more of the people in the regions and last we want to talk about the role of human being so everything you want to make you have the disruptions you want to make the change you want to make the transformations but then at the end of the day we are talking about ourselves we are talking about the role of the human human being so what is the role of the human being we call it like copper zone fear zone learning zone and grow zone what i call it like this. let me share a story like in terms of the similar right heads we have like like policy like logs that i ever join I joined for, as a student at the student at the time I joined as a policy like logs I shared my opinions myself towards their ministry level persons toward the university level person from different countries in the regions so we are called creations for this higher education system we are we are called create something we call it a common space that we want to learn from each other we want to understand each other by the way at the at first i will be i will always in my comfort zones i will feel safe and in control i will feel oh i i stay uh I am original from Malaysia and then I stay in Malaysia oh it will be great I can speak Mahasa I can speak English I can speak Chinese I can like everything in the roots I can understand but then it's come to fear when I push myself out from the comfort zone we always like push yourself get out from the comfort zone get out from the comfort zone but then the first zone that you will interfere will be the fear zone your lack of self-confidence will find excuse you will be affected by others people opinions why I say that if I, I i throw myself to the thailand's form of member mobility so everything is in thai i cannot read thai at all and then there is less english and then people will not talking english at outside of the university yes people will say oh this one is the english english study program but then outside of the 
can outside of the university people will speak in their native language as as in Malaysia or uh, Japan, Korea, everyone will speak their own language. So you will feel fear. You will feel fear your lack of self confidence. You do not know how to I want to I want to go to toilets, then how can I say I want to go to toilet? And then washroom, washroom, but then they, they don't know what what we are talking about. And then you will find excuse. No, I'm afraid to speak a little words as even even the few words that I just learned, I, I, I feel as I will find some excuse to talk. And then I will affected by people's opinion. But then what I told myself more outside is I deal with the challenge and problem. I start learning Thai, I doing more with the like how to deal with the students, how to communicate with the students with my poor Thai language. And then actually I at the same time I acquire a new language which is I learned I learned the Thai language, I learned how to speak the Thai language and also extend your comfort, extend my comfort zone to be the learning zone. So I, I more interact with the people, we more interact on the stu uh, student level, university level. They can uh, understand my poor Thai and then I, if I don't understand some words, I can just directly ask them. They will be like, I, I start dealing with all the challenges and problems that I face in the mobility. And then when I uh, when go for the growth zone, it's what I mean. Like I do, I do for the M's program. I complete the M's program already, and then I know what I want to go in for, what I want to deal for. And then I continue my internship with the M's program too. But uh, but then I've been working under the M's programs, and now I'm the program officers at working under the mobility and engages. We're handling the M's programs in my portfolio. So all around is. I'm for all right. I'm program. I find my purpose. What I want to do for the internalizations. What, what is the point of the internalization of me? I want to know more about the people culture. I want to test the food. I want to live with my dreams. I want to go for travel. I want to go here and there. I want to hear uh, this and that. I I set my new goals. I want to reach how many countries at the end of my, at, at before thirties and this and that we have confirmed my objective. So in 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 the terms of like from the comfort zone, I jump 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 until my growth zone. Actually, I learned a lot according to the internalization. I think this is what we want in the M program. Also, what we want in the futuristics and uh internalizations. We want to talk, let let more people understand what is the internalizations and then what we can learn from the internalizations. What can expand our worldview and then we learn to become a global citizen and we learn to become a more better person so for this for these uh templates or for these things it's not only for the students you can use as a lecturers as the faculty members at the international relations officers at the ministry level everyone can relate to this uh these diagrams this synth uh this hypothesis because as now as I am the program officer, I also need to jump out from my comfort zone. I cannot do only the documentation work. I need to speak with, speak on behalf of the internet like uh, intergovernment officers. I can I want I need to do everything like in the another perspective view. I need to jump out from my comfort zones and then everything will be like go smoothly because everyone is are learning together. We are growing together and then we we aim to have a more peace and harmony countries and not it through the internalizations we want to understand more about their people cultures people environments and regional issue to create what we call is asian asian communities and also towards our regions towards our global peace so with that thank you for listening for my talks and then once again sorry for uh sorry on behalf of uh, dr romians for not being here because of the health issue and then thank you very much Aaron. thank you um thank you very much mr lo yi ting um so it is actually um good to hear personal experience on student mobility and on how to come out from the comfort zone and hopefully that dr Romian in a good situation right now. Okay, um, uh, Mr. Low, uh, we have um, I have one question. Okay, not my questions. Okay, the question coming from uh, Mr. Alwi Muhammad Yunus. 
So he is pretty concerned on the red tape on visas for student mobility in Asian region. So what mechanism can be taken to expedite the process instead of one month or more to just mere a two weeks duration for documentation approval and visas granted for this exercise? Okay, he's concerned on the uh, visas. What is your response on this? So for the visa matters, we will relate towards the Ministry of the Foreign Affairs or custom, custom in the specific countries. And then in terms of the different countries have the different visa, visa like uh, their conditions and then how, mm -hmm. how they taking for the visa conditions will be related to the countries. And then what we can do for the EMS program is we go to talk with the with the ministry level persons and then how they can like deal in internally for the uh, for the especially for the EMS program to deal with like, like how can we more feasible uh, more feasible maybe more faster for the visa program we will uh, discuss with in with us internally with the uh, government side because as you can uh, you met as i mentioned before we are intergovernments organizations we are working very well with the governments from each member countries in the senior regions and then we actually have many opportunities have many meetings to meet with the government side to deal with the uh, specific programs like ems program we will have the steering committee we have the visa we will talk about visa then how the ministry level person can bring back to their own countries and then discuss with that how to make it more faster for i think i think the visa will be like i want faster I, I wish i can get the visa today i apply and then next week i can i can get it or tomorrow i can get it and then uh, we we also concern about this we want to make it become more easier for the students but then there is some conditions that need we need to follow because this is a government guidelines yeah thank you Right. Okay. Uh, one more question. Um, is there any research grant or fellowship opportunities provided by Simeo Rehead? Well, in terms of the uh, Simeo Rehead is the intergovernment uh, organizations. We don't really provide the research funds. We working with the we working with others. Uh, like the AAD. Uh, this one is from. Uh, Germany, and then we're waiting for the British Council, we're waiting for the IIE, we're waiting for the uh, UNESCO to working for the certain projects. So we more to like project based in terms of we want to improve the higher education. So we don't really like provide uh, provide the research grant or everything. We all have like, we call, there is some, some funders come to us, then we would want to work with the higher educations, then we will take it and then we will start finding for the researchers. So there, there will be another opportunity, but then for overall, we don't really have the research fund. Yeah. All right. So thank you very much. So, um, so, uh, those interested, they were working on the project base. So maybe yeah. you, you can look for the, uh, project that you're looking for. All right, so I, I think that's all. Uh, Mr. Lau Yiting, thank you very much for joining us this thank morning. Thank you. Okay, so let us move forward to the next speaker. Uh, we have from University of Tengimara, Associate Professor Dr. Wan Liza Amin from Research Nexus UITM Renew. Um, Dr. Wan Liza, are you ready? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am. All right. Okay. So, Dr. Wan Liza will talk about publication strategies. So, let us focus on the next discussion uh, with the title Researchers Global Publication Partnership Strategies 2023. So, please welcome Dr. Wan Liza. Thank you. I've asked the uh, secretary to help me with uh, to share the slides uh, for my presentations. If I may begin, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, and a very good morning to the organizing committee, um, fellow participants, and respective audience of the symposiums. Um, indeed, it is an honor to be part of the presenter uh, of this, um, as Prof. Nohayati have um, rightly put or rightly stated, that it's a remarkable and structured uh, symposiums. And uh, I hope I'll be able to uh, deliver some of the thoughts uh, on researchers' um, uh, strategies. Uh, 
Uh, without further ado, if I could uh, uh, invite the audience and fellow participants, uh, the first slides uh, would show the parameters of this, uh, the sessions where I am going to contribute on the researchers' uh, collaboration strategy in publications uh, with a part global partners. And perhaps uh, I think uh, uh, I would like to address the competitive benchmarking. We go to the market, we, we become more, uh, we look at new uh, opportunities and uh, look at the market size that we're looking at. It's actually a uh, translational research that we're looking at, and that will be the parameters of today's uh, strategies for researchers. Thank you. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. I am Wanliza Binti Boma Amin, attached with the University of Technology Mara uh, TNCPI office and responsible under the Social Creativity and Innovation Research Nexus. A little bit of disclaimer down there, the findings and thoughts of this uh, second slide are uh, purely mine uh, and not does not represent any entity. If I may then uh, refer to the third slide of the content of this today's presentations. Um, on the right hand corner will be the Global Inno Inno Innovation Index. As um, I think uh, Yi Ting have uh, you know, rightly stated just now, uh, we have to go from the safe uh, comfort zone to fear um, to um, then to, to the, at the end will be the growth. And hence, these today presentations is uh, in line with that aims too. So um, uh, in the first slide uh, or the coming upcoming slide, uh, the intro we'll start with the introductions. Mm -hmm. And of course, for a researcher, incumbent researcher and potential researcher, it is a uh, crucial and it's, it's very important to look at the institutional plan and your partner's uh, institutional plan, be it industry, be it agency, be it uh, institution or uh, university base. And uh, also look at the goal, trust and teams of that uh, particular partner. And of course, generate the endogenous conditions of factors, i.e. the internal factors in the institutional agencies or your partner's agencies. In the primary goal, we'll look at the policy, synchronize it with the goals, and then look at the exogenous conditions that would help both the partners in the collaboration partnerships, and then align it with the researchers' institutions. What are your output? And of course, then there's the red tape. Uh, this eating this just now, you are bound by the government policy and visa. Similarly, with publications, you're bound with the instruments of the institutional both partners when you have a collaboration. And uh, with these strategies today that I'm sharing, I hope it will be a consideration for all the audience and the fellow participants where you identify your partner forte, you align the members and partners' uh, goals, you look at perhaps uh, helixes, you're looking at quadruple, are you looking at experimental base, are you looking at national aims, are you looking at community base to answer in your collaboration output? And then you sequence it uh, to your research publication output. And of course, at the very end, and you have the felicitations of partnership. Now, even though I have aligned it to four, of course, this is not exhaustive. I'm sure um, there are other researchers, incumbent researchers and partners, collaborations who have done more. And this is, is a guide for us, all of us. And I'll, I'll share with you in later in the further discussions. Can I have the third, a fourth slide, please? Right. If I may, uh, as the content prescribed, the fourth slide uh, would always say that uh, in any collaborations, when you're looking at partner forte, you need to look at the institutional aims and their strategic plan. And because we are attached with University of Technology Mara, Shah Alam campus, or throughout Malaysia, the uh, desired uh, goal at the moment is 2025 in two years' time to be globally renowned university. Uh, our institutional have already stated the strategic trust a theme where you don't only how to achieve the global excellence looking at quality educations looking at value driven performance and at the very uh, third pillar you look at the translational research development innovation and commercialization and you look at industry alumni smart partnership and of course we would like to have the uh, all researchers and incumbent you know to have to generate the excellent synergy and integrity going to the knowledge, going to discipline, going to trust, going to diligence and responsibility. Um, if I may have the first slide. 
Now, the first slide I'm sharing with the audience is to show how my institutional or our international, you know, focuses on giving us the facilitations, how to go about and engage with your global partners. And it's not just, you know, uh, talking about it, but having a relationship. And that relationship is translated into a memorandum of understanding, memorandum of association, letter of intent, letter of understanding, letter of associations. Now, the data that I'm sharing is not updated to 2023. And of course, it's available for this purpose is just to share with you the facilitations and you we as the incumbent researchers and when we speak to or we're trying to collaborate with our our partners even though it's just a publications it's in it's it's good to have this binding or non-binding um agreements with our partners so that as a clear you know parameters where we're going with our output thank you could i have these six slides please Right. The first one of uh, the, the decision that we have to make or the process of decision making is to know our forte. Where are we going to look at it? How? What kind of collaborations we are doing with our partner? Is it simply a short one where we're going to go for index journal? And the index journal is huge. Are we going for just, you know, scope of three? Are we going just for the uh, web of science? And even then, you need to know your parameters. What are the type? Is it community based? Again, is it experimental based or is it multidisciplinary? And what are the methods are we using? Is it just industry based? So the targeted helix needs to be there. And with that, you can you can identify your partners. And when you search for your partners, when you look at the existing MOU and try to maximize maximize the existing uh, feasible resources, then you'll be able to narrow down the scope of where you're going. Because if your helix is between U to U, university to university, or U to G or U to I, then you would know main, I, I guess in this era, going out of the comforts, we know what types of contributions do you want to give? Is it scholarly contribution or is it, you know, more to national based contribution of a white paper, white policy, or is it just a community based uh, contributions between s and and uh, social sciences coming from the university or tertiary education? Thank you. Um, with that, then we come to the next slides and the next slide somehow um, shows you how, where. So if you look at the list down that I'm giving, it may seem mainstream and then you do the mapping. You always hear this from your counterparts. You hear it from your seniors. You hear it from Renew. You hear it when you go to a seminar. But then mapping is not a mainstream in the sense that you know um we understand that we being universities we are constrained by the fact that we only do theoretical theoretical framework in publications and we when we identify partners and that's what we're going to do um i guess the university have already uh, shown in the goals of uh being gru 2025 is that you have to you could have a translational research and this means that not you know reaching this forehead Having, you know, what is your scopus uh, status all about, but rather what are the contribution helixes that you're trying to translate from your research. And so it's good to embark with the partners and do the mapping, what's the outcome. And of course, then we go through the exercise of conduct literature reviews. And the brilliant thing is if you map it correctly with the niche areas, then your literature reviews are not going to be standard. So social sciences is not going to be confined to qualitative thematic analysis, but rather it's going to be expanded and they're going to move out from the comfort zone and get into the fear where you have multidisciplinary and then they'll find out that for social sciences, you're not confined to, you know, to intellectual property copyright, but you actually can even have a commercializations and then have patent together with you and that's going to broaden the scope of collaborations with your global partners because this is what's the in thing now and then i remember eating said digitalizations inclusivity and and I guess that's what we're going to look at and we should look at. Of course, then we have the mainstream again, attending conferences and some seminar. And some feels that when you attend some uh, conferences seminar, well, it's the normal thingy. You have the networking and that's it. But rather, if you put yourself in a different area, a different platform, put out a, you know, a different 
box all together, then you see your networking is changing, the path is changing, it's, it's, you know, it creates a different um, um, zone altogether. And you'll be in, like eating said, you'll be in the growth uh, growth uh, strategy rather than in this comfort zone strategy, or then you overcome the fear, but are you growing? So even attending conferences and seminar, you need to be able to select the one that's not close to your comfort zone, but rather putting your out, yourself out there and be critical against your peer review, rather to, to be in a safe zone where you know, all right, I'll get the publications, but you know, I know this particular journals, I, I know the people, I have you know, been doing it all, all these years. And then you, in some in reunion, we're saying that please go out of your comfort zone, get a non-payment, uh, journal. So it's good to 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 go through this exercise and ask yourself, how am I going to do it? Mapping it out with your forte, your partners. If you're not familiar with that, then don't worry. Get a partner who's familiar, and you go from there. And I guess um, from this, we look at seek recommendation, mentors, and supervisors. Um, I believe in UITM. We have the centers of excellence. We have the research institute group. We have the research group. Um, but you know uh, to me i believe that even at you know saying hi and hello to your neighbor and then uh you can also seek neighborly uh, mentors and supervisors and this doesn't have to be in large scales of you getting to the international forum getting a, a you know the center for excellence it's great to have uh, our own very own high coe to be able to help you out uh, and to get their advice uh, but it's also good also to have someone's out of your disciplinary to look at your mapping and give you ideas and whether whether they understand what you're trying to do yeah they're not from the same uh, disciplinary as you but the best part is to have a, to a blind review from your neighbor also would be good so you see the gap there and move on and get uh, you know experts from center of excellence to make it more uh, globally uh, uh, feasible or standards all right, and I guess evaluate, track, and record and expertise is also a good uh, thing to do and what you should do in it. But thank you. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, I did mention uh, on the second one where you generate endogenous conditions. And when you talk about endogenous, it's you maximize what is uh, the facilities or resources within your institutional. And the best part of having a collaboration strategy with the global partners is that you also tap on their resources. So they are endogenous. And both of you then synergize. And then if it's tripartite or it's quadruple helix, then imagine um the you know endogenous factors that you have to maximize the benefits so it's great to have that and then you can and then translate it in your research or publications and then you know as i said uh not to be just in ss or st and just to be on the safe side i'm gonna publish on an in index scopus but rather having a community-based uh publications where it can really be applied through your partnership with a different um means uh, stream altogether so so in, with that also, you tap on not just the publications, but looking at a matching grant, looking at a short grant, looking at an industry-based grant and answering to the industry um, um, you know, needs and demands. And then that will be translated to the public at large. And we, we always hear the comment of, uh, it cannot it is not necessarily or essentially be a, a negative comment where they said you know universities are great but they usually don't answer to the industry needs and but i i think uh, on this comment it's 50 50 uh whether it's true or not because sometimes the industries does not know what is happening in the university but the university is saying we're not getting enough opportunity from the industry so it's good um you know to find a partner who have already have a mileage with industries and learn the steps and you know the publications the evidence base or experimental base and not telling yourself that if you're social sciences so the main method of uh collaboration that i got to uh, establish with my partners is this qualitative thematic and i would not i would rather not uh you know go on experimental because this, this is going to create problems for me so it's good to be there and then you need to align what are the uh you know your your maybe you go for focus applied research and as i said um you could go a, a, a step further for commercialization project all these are in uitm um goal towards being gru so it's actually nothing novel it's about us you know aligning our uh, forte uh with our partner um 
I've talked about how do you maximize MOU. Uh, most of us look at MOUs and feels that has to be brought and MOUs are the only uh, instrument that we're going to look at. I, I will touch upon it um, in uh, my uh, uh, stage four. And this, uh, before that, I think um, one thing that that needs to be synergized is between uh, incumbent researchers and your partners looking at uh, a, a global research open system and, you know, not uh, deciding that, oh, Pioneer, you only do this where you, you know, you give a parameters for pioneers, parameters for experts, and then you don't empower the new uh, the new researchers or potential researchers. So it's good to have members and, and tell yourself that even though I have not written, I might be not be good and, uh, for uh, journal index articles, but I'm quite good with, uh, you know, community based or industry based uh, publications. So it's good to tap on your uh, your niche area and not to be afraid to go uh, with your partners and delve into it and see what comes out from it. Thank you. I can have the next slide, please. Right. Um, and then again, um, even though this look kind of, oh, it's a normal stream of thoughts where you define your research goal, where you identify your potential partners, where you evaluate compatibility and synergy, establish co collaboration agreement, plan research activities, analyze into the results. But you, if you align it in a, such a way where you have a um, targeted outcome, for example, a national uh, outcome where you want to have a white paper, a policy paper. Let's say you have been writing loads and loads of um, um, index journal articles. Um, everyone knows in institutional, uh, university institutional or tertiary institutional, uh, one policy paper is equivalent to 28, if I'm not mistaken, or 27 article journals. So it's good for everyone. You don't have to be in a center of excellence, but you can always go to your mentors and say, you know, I'm ready uh, to to be a part of your team can you be part of my team i have this uh, uh you know topic uh could you help me out uh you know with a partners and then and not to be on a uh typical or mainstream partners you only want the one from universities you do not want to research with the industries i believe um most of the directors from the Center for Excellence that I interviewed said that you really don't have to take a flight and go there and be there for two weeks, Lisa, to be able to establish the collaborations in your research output, but rather a nice email of hello uh, could be a, a, a long mileage and weightage in your um, collaborations and uh, research strategy and publications. But thank you. Can I have the next slide, please? Right, again, these are both how you're going to, you know, match your um your steps or decision makings and research abilities and and coming up with collaborations as you can see facilitations of publication strategy is very important um i would say um i i've seen uh in the uh, institutional um uh, aspect where you where we when we come up with an idea for collaborations it's always an index corpus journals that's not within the internal uh institution both partners and this is to me, it's kind of, um, 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 you know, uh, uh, a sad scenario because um, you get tap on uh, existing uh, general scopus in your institutions and at the same time boost it and make it more visible and, and market it as one of the best journals. So it, don't be afraid to push forward uh, UITM uh, Scopus Journal. We have the high COE, RE, we have uh, all the RGs and Center of Excellence. We have, I think there, there's more than two, 100 over of journals in I, I, uh, UITM, and, uh, which is uh, Scopus Index and also WOS. Uh, we also have lots and lots of uh, my sites and, and with your partners. So if, if, if it's possible, try to sequence it in a manner where you can also promote um, the internal journals and your partner's journals, and then uh, ensuring a compliance of with some global standards. And then, of course, uh, if you have the budget for it, uh, if it's a, a project funded by a grant, and then go for it for, you know, a Scopus a status one open system uh, journals. Right. Um, another way of doing anything is uh, offering your expertise and resources to industry. I think this is where um, not many incumbent researchers would do uh, because uh, again and again, um, the worry is, you know, how do I approach them? What do they want? How am I going to balance between the workloads and the um, my research, uh, my research uh, workload? Um, I remember having it from uh, one of the um, ex, uh, one of the uh, uh, mentor of mine that says that the workload of teaching is always going to be 
feelings are. It's going to be there. So it's how you manage it, how how you driven, how you strategize yourself. So you you'll be surprised. Uh, the industries of publications are very different than the one that we're doing in Scopus, and it's shorter, has a bigger weightage, and 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 you will see that the collaborations that you're trying to secure with global partners are wider. So it's good to be uh, open about what type of uh, collaboration publications that you're looking at. And with that, you identify the forte. I think you can have the next slides, please. With this, I think um, I've touched most of it. And I think on the strategy, I would focus on what type of publication range are we looking at? And, and you're not confined to journals. And this is uh, extremely important to do that because then um, a lot of uh, the mainstream of uh, dividing uh, between social sciences and social uh, sciences and technology, um, you know, the barrier could be break down. And that's opened up a whole new, you know, a world there where you can get more, um, more publications outcome, more partners, and then align it with the management and global publications objective. So um, there's no one shoes fits all policy. Uh, I guess when you look at GRU 2025, you have one to one, but you can also have one to two where you can break it down between you know publication into general index, and then you have the commercialization product, or you have the community based product. And this, of course, depends on your methodology and maybe a short. Uh, publication sabbatical period, talk that out with your management, with the faculty management, having a hybrid writing workshop and having a scheduled uh, partnership on sabbatical leave, project-based approval system uh, to be established in your faculty or your team between the two of you, you know, do a, a, a paperwork on it, show the outcome of it. And um, yeah, so you might be surprised of the things that you see and the opportunities that you're going to, you know, reap from there. Thank you. Can have the next slide, please? Of course, uh, I think Yi Ting um, gave us, um, and a lot of us worry when you do mobility between uh, between students or staff mobility, the facilitation, so partnership instruments being in the law faculty, and you know, everybody says it creates bureaucracy. But um, you'll be surprised that uh, most institutions, you know, um, uh, are happy and excited when you get a collaboration from your global partners. Um, they are excited with your new innovations, uh, with your translational research publications, and and the output of the facilitations of partnerships are actually quite uh, easy with digitalization now, and they have the guidelines for it. Um, they even mentioned that it, it can be more focused. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Right. So first of all, one needs to understand that, again, it's not one shoes fits all. So collaboration in a wider sense is between university companies and uh, critical drivers of innovations. It creates the mainstay of corporate research and R&D. It creates the knowledge foundation and the workbench to soft term. Again, it relates to translational research. And then that creates value driven. And then that open up innovation to augment the R&D and university should be at the forefront and be visible and become the essential uh, partners uh, in uh, publications. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. All right. Uh, if you look at the existing, every one of us is uh, uh, familiar with MOUs, MOUs, MOUs. And we all often heard from our management, top management that says, how come we have a lot of MOUs? Where are the projects? Where are the programs? So actually, there's a lot of agreements that can be narrowed down. After the MOUs, you can have clinical trial agreement, you can have a collaboration agreement, you have international collaboration agreements, you can have publications agreements, and, and you can list down the terms that you want to have with your partners. Um, that goes back to, you know, synergizing. That goes back to your mapping. That goes back to synergizing. That goes go again and again, your output. What's your output? Is this is it just scopus? It's just scopus. You have to understand where you're going. If you're going towards more advanced emerging economies, then they're more towards translational research. They're more towards industry base. They're more towards you know patent and trademark. So they're more towards that. So when you approach your partners, please you know uh, approach it at that platform rather than just in that scopus where they already have it. So it's good to look at more choices in the uh, instruments rather than binding yourself or confining yourself to the MOUs itself. Right, uh, can I have the next one, please? Of course, looking at the MOUs, please do not 
feel or have you know uh, this um, uh, predicament whether oh I'm in conundrum whether I'm in a binding or non-binding agreement because both are affected by the institutions and institutions. So I'm taking a University of Davis, uh, um, uh, you know, binding uh, definitions where they say it's just to acknowledge an ongoing and strategic relationship. So what is your overarching or very non-legally binding? Uh, and then a writing that describes a very broad concept. So you can then have a more narrow scope of uh, publications agreement uh, originating from the MOU. So it's good to have that and it will, uh, you know, show the scopes of both the partners uh, in that collaboration. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Right, the length of time to draft and finalize an MOU varies. And then, of course, um, I think for publications, it's, it's, uh, it's crucial when you know the outcome. If you're writing a policy for a critical crisis, that it should not be two years because by the end time, everybody has resolved the issue. So if you're looking at crisis, for example, COVID, and you, you want to do a census for COVID, you want to do a system for um, uh, primary school students or how they're going to track the COVID, um, you know, uh, COVID vaccine. Nations. So the time of line of your collaborations to your partner needs to be practical. It needs to be logical. So if you're writing, even if you're writing an index corpus, article journals, it should not exceed you know more than a year and so six months is scary so probably you want to aim a bit a shorter period because then you'll be in the forefront you're addressing the crisis there you're responding to the uh you know resources and you're responding to the policy and, and that's why it's called translational research i think you can have the next slides please Right. So again, um, it says uh, about being specific non-binding uh, our uh, research MOU or you have the general non-binding. So at the end of the day, you know, you look at your outcome. What's the mapping? What's the outcome? And then you have the publication partnership agreement and then try to, you know, um, look at both uh insights from the partner what do they want ask your partner and then also of course you can't go out of your uh your your workload as a university what's your commitment to the university so doing something feasible but it doesn't mean that you can't be creative about it you can't be innovative about it you have to grow and 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 translate that growth in your collaborations with your global partners in publications um the next slides please Right, thank you. And I think, uh, I'm not sure, I hope um, some of the updates that I've given uh, would be a consideration for you to generate your endogenous and perhaps steps on your uh, exogenous and then for all of us to deliver if you're from I, uh, UITM, uh, whether you're potential researchers, whether you're incumbent researchers, to deliver GRU and of course to promote excellence, synergy, and integrity, have a quality education, global excellence, value performance. Thank you, everyone. Wabilai Taufiq Walidaya. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, it's a Professor Dr. Wan Liza, a very energetic sharing on global publication strategies. So let us look at the uh, questions uh, on the chat box here. We have one question um, from Zan Azma Nasaruddin. Um, I'm not quite understand writing a paper on policy maker. If you could kindly give an example related to it. Would it be some procedure before you are able to write about the policy maker paper? Okay, it's about policy maker paper. Dr. Maliza. Thank you for the question, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you for the question, uh, uh, Dr. Asma. Um, uh, with policy paper, I'm not uh, quite sure whether you're from ST or SS. So actually, that's uh, not a problem um, to have a policy paper. Uh, if I may take one uh, close example, close to home for all of us from you, uh, UITM, I'm also going to give uh, some other exa one another example. So one example is that we have the Puncha Alam Hospital, uh, where we are uh, going towards a medical hospital hub um, UITM has been chosen to be one of the uh, one hospital that can uh, uh, contribute to the society by give uh, by the Puncha Alam hospital so the Puncha Alam hospital when they they need to be established there should be a policy paper so how do we start so we can you can start with a title of uh, your project but you need to align it to a policy that's going on for example if you look at uh, a recent policy on uh, digitalization for for digitalization in Malaysia if you're looking at uh, Malaysia plan um 
12, where we the government is promoting efficiency and more competitive uh, uh, in our in our all our policies and our outcome. Then you identify one key areas uh, that you want to do, and then may, perhaps you can get a uh, you can approach the ministries, and then you can approach universities for internal grant, or if it's not internal grant, but you just want to do a research, and your research will produce a white paper. Now, the best thing about policy paper is that uh, it gives you the whole framework. So it's not like an article journals where you write on a specific problem statement, then you go methods, and then you go, um, and then you go on the problem uh, research objective, and blah blah blah, and then you get the input, and there's the outcome. And of course, when you write, you look at article index journals uh, requirements, what are the theme of the journal. But with policy paper, it's it covers overall. It covers the structural organization, uh, the structural organizations of or of the particular problem that you're looking at. It also covers the framework, so it doesn't only look at your uh, your specialty. So when you want to write policy papers, it's usually have a multidisciplinary members in it, so it's bigger. So it, it uh, a lot of people tell me, oh. You know, you gotta get a, a FRGS or it's a fundamental research grant to be able to do that. But um, actually, the ministries or industries are looking for us to come to them and then tell them, right? Now I'm looking at the retail or the e-ailing, if I may take examples, are having you know the same uh, prices for consumer. They're charging the consumer, so you might want to write a policy paper. What's going on with e hailing? Is it really the operational cost? Is you know that the e hailer uh, facing with the digital platform should be borne by the consumer public at large? So with that white paper, where are we going? Where am I going? So you could go to the Ministry of Domestic Ministry of Affairs. You could go to MCMC, being the super, uh, the the commander of communication platform. Or you can then go to the Ministry of Transport and say, I have this, could I share with you? From there onwards, then you can even uh, tap on um, a grant, a short grant, a small grant. But with policy paper and other papers, I think with the industry uh, with the industry based project, uh, the time uh, is very important. I hope that helps uh, Dr. Asma or Prof. Asma, if I'm, I'm sorry if I uh, have the wrong uh, salutations. Okay, so the key point is to have a multi-disciplinary uh, members here yeah, if you're looking for, uh, if you want to write a policy paper, right? Yes. All right. Okay, uh, I have one more question. Um, what are the strategies that Renew doing at the moment to promote sustainability of research activities among researchers? Um, we do have uh, six trusses, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, we have uh, 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 started with um, uh, a few modules and where we have seminars uh, with regards to the helixes uh, approach models. Uh, we also encourage, uh, I think we, we will launch soon uh, on the machine learning. We also have uh, tap and, and identify sustainable uh, topics. Uh, for SNT and SS, um, we also are hoping that the industrial base and we all, we have the industrial base uh, track uh, to in uh, to interlink the researchers with the industry uh, on a industry based and community based project and publications. All right, so, right. so um, uh, we are looking uh, forward uh, for that modules and. A seminar by Renew. All right, so I think um, that's it uh, from Dr. Associate Professor Dr. Wan Liza. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. So, so um, dear participants, uh, we have one more speaker before our morning break. Uh, next, uh, we are delighted to have a renowned expert in genome study, Professor Dr. Dr. Muhammad Zaki Saleh. Uh, the Director of Integrative Pharmacogenomic Institute, I promise. Uh, Dato, are you ready, Dato? Yeah, yeah, okay, I'm ready. Inshallah. Okay, so today... Um, yeah. How many minutes do I have, uh, madam? Uh, 25 minutes you have right now? Inshallah. All right, so Dato will be sharing with us on I promise a center of excellence driving precision health and your ITM towards the globally renowned University 2025. So please welcome Yamabahagi Datuk Muhammad Zaki. Thank you. Thank you.
TLB. Right, okay. Let me see. Uh, Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum and very good morning to all the distinguished speakers and audience. Uh, I am uh, Muhammad Zaki Saleh. Today I shall be sharing a topic on the, I promise, the Center of Excellence, Driving Precision Health and UITM towards the globally renowned University 2025. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to the Secretary for inviting me. I'm uh, happy to share with you. Okay. Uh, Briefly on I promise here. Yeah? I promise our integrative pharmacogenic Jimmy Institute is a center, is one of the 13 uh, center of excellence and one high COE uh, that is high center of excellence at UITM. Uh, we focus on precision health, whereby precision health is a new paradigm in modern healthcare that takes into account an individual genetic environmental and lifestyle factors to provide personalized and targeted health care. I promise has been the, doing this precision health research and has made some significant contribution through successful projects such as the Human Genome Project and Metabolomics Research. Uh, like the other COEs uh, at UITM, I promise has also contributed to the transformation of UITM into a uh, globally renowned university through our research and development initiative. Okay. Right. Let uh, precision health. When you talk about precision health, you cannot escape from talking about human genome pro projects. Yeah. Let's look at what the human genome project globally done. The first human genome was mapped in uh, 2003. It started in 1990 and it was funded by the Department of Energy and National Institute of Health, of Health United States. And the cost to sequence and map one human, only one human, was 2.5, 2.7 billion USD. And it took 13 years. Initially, they thought that it's going to be finished in 15 years, but they had uh, made it a bit faster and it was uh, finished in 13 years. And uh, the good news was announced by the then uh, President Bill Clinton. Okay, what are the goals of the Human Genome Project? There are many, uh, a few, I'll share a few. Identify all the genes in the human DNA, there are about 30,000 genes, and obtain a physical map of the human genome. And uh, they want to know also the functions of the gene, determine the sequences of the 3 billion chemical base pairs that make up the human DNA. And this human DNA that uh, were called contribute to our well-being and also whatever our looks, our behavior, our intelligence, and so on and so forth. So basically, it's a big data. Basically, the DNA with all the genes that control the human. Yeah. Right. Uh, what are benefits? These are some of the benefits of the genome research: improved diagnosis of diseases, detect genetic predisposition position to disease, create drugs based on molecular information, use a gene therapy and control system as a drug, and also design custom drugs, which we call pharmacogenomics, based on individual genetic profiles. And uh, in 2015, President Obama uh, said that disease information exploration into the function of each human gene will shed light on how faulty genes play a role in disease causation. And with this knowledge, we can start developing medicine and treatment or management to help prevent the defect. Okay. Um, after the completion of the human genome back in 2003, there were many countries that took up the, the, the challenges. Uh, many countries, they have worked in, in initially on one genome and they, after that, they worked for more genomes. The reason was to improve the health of the population. If you could uh, see on the slide, there are about 13 countries here. They had started even back in 2012. And um, uh, things, uh, this movement are still going on. Uh, sequencing are still being done in many other countries as well. And you could see they have even uh, sequenced more than a million because each race or each uh, ethnic could represent the whole ethnic, yeah? 
even though uh, each individual under each and is not the same, but it could represent so that uh, certain target and policies could be done in order to improve the uh, health of the uh, ethnic. Right. Uh, from the Human Genome Project, as I said uh, earlier, precision medicine was uh, created and after that precision health. Yeah, as you could see, the first uh, human genome uh, that was started in 1990 and completed in 2003 involved 20 laboratories from six countries, i.e. from UK, USA, France, Germany, Japan, and China. And more than two, 300 scientists were involved. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, in 2015, uh, President Obama announced that with the completion and knowledge that they had, uh, then uh, they could move into precision medicine. But in 2018, people were thinking that why not? Why only precision medicine? Because medicine only will be used when the patient is sick. But why not we try to prevent the disease from happening? So it is from the very beginning, from the very early age, if possible, when the children was born, the genetic makeup or genetic architecture of the Indus should be known. So there was a term called precision health. And uh, when I was doing this uh, slide back in 2018, 2019, there were only a few universities that were doing that. It was Stanford. Uh, University of Missouri, uh, Columbia, Michigan, and uh, I could say that your ITM also was doing the same thing at that point of time. Right, uh, briefly, precision health is the integration of genomics and other precision medicine integration uh, within real world practice. It involves six parameters. There is predict predictive, we predict the disease, Particip participatory, that means the patient, the family, the doctors, every healthcare personnel are involved or participate in the in the uh, diagnosis and also treatment. And it's very personalized because you are using your own, you are knowing, you are using your own genetic information, makeup to understand the disease and subsequently to treat it. And it's a population base and it's also you could prevent the disease from happening inshallah and of course and also there were some psychoconnective uh, involved right uh as i said earlier within this 20, 25 minutes or so i will just touch briefly on what we do okay uh, let's look at the roadmap of i promise yes uh, we started as a research group back in 2008 uh at the faculty of pharmacy thank you to prof dato baka for all like for allowing us, encouraging us to form this uh, small group uh, research. And uh, in 2010, Alhamdulillah, we managed to convince uh, Malaysia, uh, Malaysian Biotech Corp, and now it's Malaysian Bioeconomy, uh, to fund us some amount of money to build up our uh, computer system, high-end computer system for data analysis and so on and so forth. And, they, uh, and also, thank you to uh, Tansi Ibrahim Shah, for allowing us for to buy two system, which is the GA to uh, act the first uh, sequencer machine in Malaysia, and also the LCMS uh, LCMS system to do metabolomics. And uh, in that very year, so we got a, a, a grant of two hundred thousand from your ITM to map the first Malay genome. Uh, via the special project, eh? Vice Chancellor special project. And in 2011, we completed the Malay genome. With the completion of the Malay genome, Alhamdulillah, we managed to get the first LRGS grant that amounted to 8,000 to study on the evolutionary genomics of Oransley. So we are one, we were one of the two, uh, uh, what call it, program. And the other one is under the late uh, Datuk Khalid that won this LRGS program from bottom up. Uh, and in 2012, we were invited by USM to be part of the uh, LRGS grant, whereby uh, we hit the, uh, the pro a project on the tropism of mycobacterium tuberculosis. In 2020, af 2013, after uh, achieving certain marks under the high school E, uh, 
uh, evaluation, we were upgraded to uh, PTJ, a CO tier 3A uh, uh, PTJ, and we changed the name from Promise Pharmacogenomic Center to Integrative Pharmacogenomic Institute, and we never stopped from there on. And whereby in 2014, we managed to get, with the help of uh, Malaysian Biotech Corp, they were the one who introduced uh, this Japanese company to us, whereby they uh, they send a, uh, we had a collaborative uh, research, a service research, uh, amounting to 668,000 approximately uh, to do PKD, Pamco Kinetic, Pamco Dynamic product of the natural product, of which later on the product was sold in Japan and also had penetrated uh, some other advanced country. And in the very same year, in 2014, we uh, were, we won the TRJS. Uh, we were the only group from uh, non RU to win this TRGS because in that very year only six uh, projects were, were approved and one of the six is ours whereby the amount is 1.2 million and in 2016 again we were awarded another LRGS uh, to hit another project of the mutational analysis of this uh, multi drug resistant tuberculosis which was headed by the program was headed by USM and uh, in 2017, Alhamdulillah, we completed the LRJS on our silly genome and we won the PRJS uh, project to building the champion based on the information that we have garnered from the uh, human genome project. Okay, and in uh, 2018, uh, we, we obtained this MS ISO 17025 for our lab so that we could do more services for the industry and also other uh, uh, universities. 2019, uh, we saw that this is a high time for us to set up a startup company. So set up company, uh, Zaka C, Biotech Senior High was set up and we also managed to get Zebra Fish Facility. Thank you to Tansi uh, Sahol for uh, allowing us to get this facility because we want to study all the noble, uh, noble variations that was seen in the Orange Lake and Malay genome because uh, nothing was known on this 100, about 100,000 uh, of these variations. And uh, in 2020, we managed to get a fund, a grant from the uh, MOST and also MOH, Ministry of Health and Ministry of Science and Innovation and uh, Technology Innovation to help the, the country to sequence uh, the COVID-19. Uh, the amount was 420,000. And in 2021, uh, we were again given another 1.2 million to continue doing the national surveillance program on COVID-19. We were one of the six initially, and after that, one of the 12 labs in Malaysia that uh, were recognized to do this sequencing. Okay, um, right. And in 2022, we started with the rare disease genome sequencing and mapping, which I shall, which I shall share with you in a short while. Okay, let's. Let us look at what we did or are doing with the UITM Human Genome Project. If you were to see at this, this slide uh, from 20, uh, 2003 till uh, 2011, remember uh, the first human genome was the sick map and announced in 2003. Within this period, 2003 to 2011, there was none, there was no, uh, what do you call it, uh, ethnic from this Southeast Asia. And that triggers and uh, motivates us to to do on the Malay genome because why? Uh, the Malay is one is the major population of Southeast Asia. There are more than two hundred million of Malays in Southeast Asia, uh, living in Malaysia, Indonesia, Brunei, Singapore, Vietnam, Laos, and so on. All these are of Malay descendants. So that triggered us to work on this Malay to propose for the Malay. And uh, in twenty eleven. Uh, uh, in December 2011, uh, we finished the UITM Human Genome Project. Okay, uh, we have map and understand and look into all the variations and, and uh, novel variation and so on and so forth. And uh, it was announced. Uh, was it was announced by our Deputy Prime Minister then, Tan Sri Muhyiddin who came over to Puncha Alam, came to the lab, looked at the first machine, told him about the project and so on and so forth. 
and uh, it was quite publicized yeah, in the papers and also in the TV uh, and also in the radio because it was uh, so-called the first Malay genome that was announced. But uh, to be honest with you, there was another group in uh, at NUS, National University of Singapore, who also met the Malay genome in the same year. So basically, uh, what I could say is that UITM and NUS, uh, we were together at almost the same time, yeah? And I'm saying on the Malay genome. But I think I was, was a bit earlier, a few, a few months ahead than them. And we have already also set up the pipeline that will be used much later on. Right, and also uh, in Indonesia, it was announced in two of their Koran or in their newspaper, whereby they said Malaysia kuasi i peta genom orang Indonesia. Okay, tak kisahlah. Uh, peta orang Indonesia ke mana, almost we are the same thing. But but then unfortunately, they said that the uh, the, the project was the headed by this uh, from UITM. So Alhamdulillah. Okay. Right. Uh, so in 2013, after one year of um, uh, a lot of study needs to be done to, in order to publish this paper, uh, the first paper was published in 2013. It took about one year, something, uh, one year, a few months to get it done. Because why? Uh, it was reviewed by six uh, all uh, genome directors from different country looking at the uh, all the details of the uh, and in fact they they also asked us to deposit our genome into data bank so that we could also they could also uh, access into the to to make sure that the uh, biometric the algorithm and uh, is right otherwise it would because this is the first Malay genome yeah right and uh, briefly I want to share why we move into orange genome. One day, this is a real story. Huh? I was watching this uh, National Geography, then I saw this uh, uh, video on human journey migration routes, and it was prepared this by this professor, Dr. Stephen Oppenheimer. He's a pediatrician and also an uh, anthropologist yeah, from the University of Oxford. He said that after out of Africa, the first uh, origin of people was in Africa, and these people have migrated out out now about 60 uh, now about 60 or 70 years ago out of africa and uh there was a uh, world corner Russia along the way and so on and so forth and they landed at south asia and that south asia was, was in malaysia or malay peninsula and from there okay from there uh, the peopling of south asia started that's what he said yeah and knowing when he knew that uh, we were working on the orange sleeve then he was working on six uh, chapter of the Oxley. He came over uh, to Malaysia. He came to the lab. He met with me and discussed on some other possibility of working together. Okay, but uh, but it doesn't work uh, nicely because uh, uh, because of some reasons. Yeah. Okay, but he appreciated the work that we had done because what he did before was was using SNPs. It was not whole genome, whereas we were the one that started on the whole genome of the orang asli. Right, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we were on six of the orang asli, of which the population uh, are less than 500. So we want to see why uh, the population is less. There are six, 18 subtypes huh, of the orang asli, but we have chosen six, and from each of these three big tribes here. Yeah? Okay, now. Uh, the project, this is an LRJS program and it was divided into three of which the, uh, the program was headed by me, i.e. Uh, there is UITM and we headed, uh, we were on the unraveling the genome architecture because we have this experience on working Malay genome and completing it. And the second phylogeny and phylogeography analysis of honestly was given to USM. And the third, uh, more of the anthropological and sociology was given to UKM under Professor Dato Hood Saleh, the famous anthropologist. So we managed to complete it in, in 2017. And uh, the orange the subtract that we were on were Orang Kana, Orang Cek Wong, Semai Bati, Mandring, Lanoh, Gintak, Kensiu. Right, and these are some of the publications, whereas on our part uh, at UITM, we focus on the diseases. 
uh, and true enough, uh, we found some diseases that were not mentioned and that were not studied before because most of the time, uh, most researchers that study on the were looking into the worms infestation, yeah? And also some uh, the skin disease and so on. But we we went deep because of the uh, knowledge on the orang asli genome. We managed to map more than 100 of them uh, from each subtribe. <coughs> uh, so about 30 or 40 from each subtribe. It's quite difficult to get the, their blood yeah? and also stools. And alhamdulillah, mm -hmm. we managed we see that they, they had also some cardiovascular disease and using this metabolomics approach and there were some markers. This was the, uh, the one that attacked the Mayo Clinic to contact me asking how whether we uh, we we are going to work more uh, they were interested in using lcms to look for the markers for cardiovascular diseases right and we also look into the drug metabolism status of the orange okay uh, what happened is that under pharmacogenomics, genes are very important. Genes are the one that uh, metabolize drugs and all the food that comes into it. And in this study, we look into the the ability, okay, of the individual via genes, uh, with, uh, what sort of uh, drugs will be suitable for them. In case when they are sick, uh, there will be proper drugs to be given, the dosage and so on. So, so it's very personalized, okay. Uh, of course, there we, we also did some other uh, studies on the, uh, uh, what we call the character, eating habits, sports genomics, and so on and so forth, of which I did, I'm not sharing with you here because of the concern of time. Okay, based on all the information that we have gathered from the Malay and Orang, you know, we decided that our niche area for, I promise, will be biomedical or mix for precision health, whereby we are okay at uh, this level, whereby we will be using biological molecules such as DNA, RNA, protein, and metabolites to understand the functions and interaction within organism for precision health, uh, which aims to develop predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory therapy to individuals. Right, uh, and we we divide uh, uh, into two. One is on artificial intelligence, and the other is on integrative omics, biomedical omics. Yeah, so it's integrative because we're under this omics. There is a big, uh, big area. Okay, and having all this information, information and data, we need AI to understand it better, to make it faster, and so on and so forth. So uh, at the institute, we have a few uh, AIs from uh, uh, colleagues from the Faculty of uh, Engineering and also Mathematics uh, to look into this matter, inshallah. Uh, more will to come. And uh, if you were to look at the whole setup of the institute, this is what it looks like, uh, whereby we have, uh, okay, we work on genomics, transcriptomic, yeah, that is on RNA, proteomic, metabolomic. We have also moved into glyco glycomic, lipidomic, phenomics, and epigenomics. And all this data, data that we have been, uh, we have uh, 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 obtained and also will be will be done in the new future will be stored in our uh, database, either cloud or in the server that we have. And all this will be analyzed. Uh, uh to come for better diagnosis and so on so forth for better usage and of course for publication and training of people right uh, and if you were to look at the research domain these are uh, the research domain that we we utilize or use at your i promise uh, genome assembly annotation metabolomic drug design molecular dynamics talking nutritional analysis yeah like to under this the rgs uh, grant that we had obtained we have found a few compounds and uh, of which a uh, patent has been granted for 40 of the compounds for us to pursue further. Inshallah, hopefully, this compound will be useful for inflammatory purposes. And I, like I mentioned earlier, uh, earlier we had also this uh, Isbra fish facilities, whereby these are uh, some of the experiments that we had done, whereby we inject from the embryo stage to understand better. Right. We also uh, develop targeted PCR tests which uh, are being used uh, by hospitals as well as some individuals uh, on the pharmacogenomic test, nutrigenetic test, 
uh, sports genomic with management. Those the one that is not very uh, tricky, we develop targeted PCR test because it will be cheaper than using the whole genome, yeah? Uh, because whole genome and the whole exome and also ASA action screening array will be a bit uh, expensive, but targeted will be much cheaper, but it's still useful. Of course, uh, certain uh, criteria need to be met before we, we design the PCR test. Right. Uh, we also do some preclinical pre studies that I mentioned earlier, for example, for the mitomasa, whereby we do, we also perform toxicity studies from some companies that send some of the samples over to us. We also do pharmacokinetic analysis, we do bioavailability study and bioefficacy study using zimorophage or MEX uh, or RATS or uh, cell culture as our model. And this is uh, the research that we had done for for Mitomasa, a Japanese company uh, in in Japan. And from that work, uh, we published two two papers because it was a requirement that two papers be published at least before the product could be sold in Japan. We managed to do that. And this is uh, uh, some of the reports that we have done for this COVID-19, we had uh, sequenced uh, thousands of it, and we had uh, each time we finished, we deposited into a big database, GI said, uh, in the United States, and also we informed the ministry uh, for them to announce to the government or to the public. Right, let's look what we had done after all those work, uh, after of millions and uh, that was spent, we translate the, uh, the output into services and commercialization for the benefit of the public or the people. As I mentioned earlier, in 2019, a startup company was set up. Uh, it's called Zakesi Biotech in High, and our tagline is Zakesi Make It Easy for You. And it is a uh, park at uh, level seven. At, I promise, in, uh, indirectly, I promise is Zakesi. Zakesi is I promise. Okay, these are some of the uh, services that we provide uh, through whatever we had. Uh, what we call it, experimented and successful in the I, uh, at I promise we siphon it or we translate uh, to service and uh, uh, through Zakesi. So these are some of the areas that we do. We, and Alhamdulillah, there were quite a few companies that have been partnering with us to, uh, to ask for our services. Right. Uh, Let's um, let me talk a bit more on the personal personal genome analysis, which is the in thing now. Okay, uh, it's a blueprint of your genetic makeup, uh, genetic map for predicted disease risk, personalized drug, personal nutrients, uh, exercise risk management, personality traits, sport talent, and also even until uh, ancestry. We also did that. Okay, and those uh, uh, those uh, clients that we received during uh, or after COVID, we also know whether uh, the the whether they could get COVID or not, eh? based on the genetic maker. And if they were to get COVID, whether is it going to be serious or not? Okay. And the platforms that we use were whole genome sequencing, uh, exome sequencing, and the SNP array. So there are three platforms perform depending on the uh, necessity, depending on the fund, uh, on the money that they, they are willing to spend on. Right. And normally our uh, uh, our report will be more than 200 pages for each individual because we went quite detailed, quite deep uh, compared to the other competitors out there in the market. And um, we always upgrade our, the information because uh, we are researchers at the same time, always upgrade based on the database that we we went into uh, at different countries here, yeah? whereas those people outside their computers are not that because they are mainly pure business people, whereas we, uh, we, we are researchers at the same time, we want to translate for the benefit of the public. So uh, these are uh, again some of the examples. Uh, allow me a few more minutes here. Some of the examples that we had done for people, uh, for the patient. Uh, for example, gene typing of clopidogrel, which is the drug that was given to uh, uh, what they call the heart diseases. Uh, this report uh, was for a patient at Hassa, and we have so done for a patient from IJN uh, Institute Jantonegara do also send. Uh, sample to us to be done uh, before the drug was uh, was given, 
and this was uh, give, uh, sent by UMMC, University of Malaysia Medical Center, whereby they found that uh, this two-year-old boy did not respond to the drug uh, primaquine treatment uh, for the infection of plasmodium vivax, that is malaria. So uh, we did, we designed, uh, we designed a test, the test to do it for him, and uh, we sent it back and they published this paper, okay? They published a, paper, a case on this, uh, and uh, this is another one which is, uh, this was actually, this HLA-B1502 was asked by the one. Uh, the, uh, may I interrupt the talk? Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, we're running out of time. Uh, can we uh, speed up a little bit? Uh, sure, sure, sure. Because we shall have a very short break uh, after this. Okay. So, okay. all right, thank you. Uh, I'll just proceed. Okay, okay, just uh, go on, continue. Yeah? Now we have moved into rare disease just now because my time was taken up by the previous speaker. Okay, give me a chance to finish. Anyway, uh, the rare disease genome project is very important. Okay, uh, we are one of the very few uh, in, uh, that were on it, and now we are being supported by the Islamic countries. Yeah, ISESCO, they are giving grant, and uh, okay, these are sort of reports that we gave them, and we had done for university uh, HKL. Uh, these are all those diseases very rare, uh, which is not seen. We had finished doing that. Okay, if you were to see at our our this this is what we we are going to get by 2025, and this actually this slide was prepared in 2016. Okay, and uh, Alhamdulillah, it, it just timely with what uh, the Vice Chancellor's uh, vision and mission. Okay, these are our collaborators. And just to uh, probably the, just to highlight, uh, in Malaysia, uh, Malaysia only started to talk about precision medicine in 2020. Uh, that was under Academy of Science. And Alhamdulillah, our name uh, uh, was, uh, was placed in four section, meaning that they have recognized us because we had done it earlier, and I'm, I'm, I'm not that will help uh, the Prussian health better in Malaysia. Okay, with that, we are going to organize a, a second international conference on Prussian health sometime in uh, August next year. With that, thank you very much for the opportunity given to me. Uh, okay, bye. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mozaki, for sharing with us and. From what I can see just now, I promise has been uh, has been standing tall since 20, uh, 2008 until now, and it is about 15 years. So I can say that we are proud to know that Malay and Orang Asia genome studies were coming from uh, UITM. Okay, Dato, um, actually we have a question coming to us, but we are running out of time. So just one question on the chat box, a very quick response from you. How is destructive technologies like AI, artificial, artificial intelligence, going to disrupt precision healthcare? What do you think about that? I don't think uh, AI will disrupt. I think uh, it will uh, make our uh, precision health better in the sense that, you know, having uh, 3 billion nucleotide and 30,000 genes with many SNPs and at least, you know, there's a lot of uh, data need to be to be learned. And there are more than 300 population, eh, different ethnic in the world. So AI will uh, will be better, will be used uh, effectively to understand better, uh, to understand this, this disease better, number one. Number two is to come up with new drugs because like what we have done in our lab with the help of AI, we come up with computational modeling. We and big pharma has been using uh, this uh, AI thing to design that it could cut down the time from 20 over years to about 10 years or even less than now rather than uh, shooting in the dark uh, just doing some uh, what called it um, experiments but now we, they can focus better and of course there will be some some hiccups here and there but uh, uh, I think the time frame and also the specificity and sensitivity will be better than uh, the previous approach. So I don't think uh, yeah, I will disrupt that much. Okay. All right. So nothing, nothing much to worry, right, on the AI? Not really. All right. So thank you very much, Dato, for yeah. sharing with us. Uh, sorry for the delay. 
All right. Thank you very much. Uh, from I promise. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, um, let now let us take a short break. Uh, we shall resume at okay 11 um 45 so thank you very much Globally marketable student. So our next speaker is Associate Professor Dr. Nakao Nomura from University of Tsukuba, Japan. Dr. Nakao will be sharing his thought on enhancement of learning experience through student mobility. Dr. Um, Nomura, are you ready? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, of course. Clearly, loud and clear. So the screen is yours. Please welcome Associate Professor Dr. Nomura. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, is my slide visible for you? Mm, not okay. yet. Okay, okay, let me try again. Um, Okay, I think this should work. I think now it should work. Yes, we have your, your slide on the screen right now. Okay, thank you very much. So my name is Nomura. Thank you very much for the introduction. First of all, I'd like to extend my uh, sincere gratitude for the providing opportunity to share uh, my experience and knowledge about this title. Especially, I'd like to uh, Extend my thanks to Dr. Uh, Prof. Zaibunisa, who uh, arranged my presentation for this important symposium. Um, I'm Nomura and from University of Tsukuba, Japan. And my mission in the university is mainly on the student mobility or international linkages, especially in the uh, partner with the Southeast Asia. And, uh, but I'm, uh, I'm not a supporting staff, I'm a faculty of the university and my specialty is a biotechnology in the school called the Life and Environmental Sciences. But uh, my talk today is mainly on the international linkage, especially on the student mobility or student exchange and the contribution to the globalization of the higher education. 
So that um, I prepared the slides for today for four parts. Uh, first part, uh, let me start with the, some introduction, short introduction about my university. Maybe some of you are not familiar with the University of Tsukuba. And also the, um, by introducing University of Tsukuba, you can know that how our university is um, uh, cooperating with the Japanese government for the internationalization. Second is uh, I'd like to also share some of the national plans of Japanese government related with the student mobility. This is qu quite important in influential for the all educational institutions in Japan. And uh, after that, we did a lot of things in University of Tsukuba. And I would like to share the how University of Tsukuba has been globalizing. And also I'd like to share and showcase some initiative implemented by University of Tsukuba for globalization for your good practices. Okay, let me start with the introduction of University of Tsukuba. Uh, actually, Tsukuba is well known as the largest science city in Japan. Um, then uh, if you ask some of your Japanese friends, Tsukuba uh, as a science city, and I think most of them know that one. And this is this science city in Tsukuba was established about 50 years ago uh, under the national project to make a uh, science and technology core of Japan. And uh, they uh, were looking for some suitable places to host this science city in Japan. It should be near from Tokyo, but there is uh, enough space and infrastructure to support the research and technology. And they decided to put it in the place called Tsukuba. And most of the National Research Institute, as shown in these slides, are gathered in this area called Tsukuba. And actually, University of Tsukuba used to be in Tokyo and a different name with a long history. But in line with the establishment of the science and technology city, uh, we moved from Tokyo to Tsukuba and we became comprehensive research university. And that was 50 years ago. So that from this background, you can uh, imagine that we have a very strong in the research and the graduate studies. Uh, this can be proven by the we, uh, our three Nobel laureate in the physics and the chemistry. We have uh, a lot of world-class uh, researchers and scholars supporting the research and education. Um, and these three are the Professor Tomonaga or Esaki or Professor Shirakawa. And before coming to Tsukuba, we used to be in Tokyo, and that has a long history, more than 100 years. So foundation or inception of the University of Tsukuba was 1872. And this is the oldest uh, higher education institution in Japan, actually. And uh, But the, what, when we were in Tokyo, our focus was more on the education, because our name was name in Tokyo uh, was a Tokyo University of Education. And before that, we used to be called as a higher normal school. But after moving to Tsukuba, we became more comprehensive. We add more field like uh, medicine, sports, or engineering, or agriculture. Uh, we can, I can say that we, we have almost all the study field in University of Tsukuba. And one, other, one of the very unique point is the sports science or physical education. Uh, most of the physical education sports science in Japan are located in private universities. But maybe only University of Tsukuba has uh, uh, degrees in bachelor, MS, and PhD for the sports science. And we, of course, we have a lot of the athletes to join the Olympic every time. And another unique point of University of Tsukuba is a high ratio of the international students. So that, that's my related with my mission in this university. As of the May this year, uh, more than 2,500 international students, over 17,000 students are from other countries. And uh, foreign students are from very different countries, more than 116 countries. Of course, we have a lot of, we will have a lot of students from Malaysia, 42 students as of May. And uh, in addition to this, we have a lot of the short-term exchange students as well. And uh, uh, this slide showing the some of the outstanding research activities of University of Tsukuba. I don't have a time to explain all, but uh, I can say that we encourage all the faculty to do the cross-disciplinary collaborations. We believe that innovation are from this cross-disciplinary uh, collaboration. For example, robot suit, you can see in this one, this is not only by the mechanical engineer. They, some people from the medicine and the human science, 
uh, hum humanities also do collaboration to develop this kind of human robots. Okay, those are the short introduction of the University of Tsukuba. Next, I'd like to move the second part that is uh, uh, national plans related with the uh, student mobility. In this part, we, I would like to share three national plans uh, for the student mobility under Japanese government. Uh, maybe the some, well, first plan was quite old, but it's important to not know that one. First plan uh, shown by uh, Japanese government is the International Student 100,000 Plan. This was launched in 1983. Okay. Then, um, uh, I, before this, I forgot to tell you that these, I will show you the three plans, but all these plans are proposed by the cabinet office, not the ministry in charge for the education. Because we believe that this kind of plan has to be implemented by the cooperation of the different ministries, not only the MEX, Ministry of Education. Sometimes we need the help from the industry or sometimes the uh, justice. So that's why the cabinet office declared it and each minister proposed some initiative or plan. So the first one is the 100,000 uh, international student plan. At this time, 1983, the students from overseas were mainly um, like a, dependent on the scholarship from Japanese government, and the number of the students overseas were really small. So the, uh, what uh, Max did is like uh, each university should have a center to take care of the international student called the International Student Center or they need to uh, improve the residential facility for international students to meet the different uh, lifestyle or student type. And also the um, government thought that maybe education for the Japanese language should be strengthened to accommodate more students. This was the first plan, 1983, long time ago, but they still, uh, we still do remember this plan. After that, the, um, the number of the students, um, actually nearly 100,000, we, uh, had another plan by the government, again, cabinet office, that is an international student 300,000 plan. This was launched uh, 2008. Target number is 300,000 by 2020. And uh, again, the MEX uh, did a lot of initiative for this. And one of the very famous one is the G30 project. Maybe some of you have heard about this. And actually, G30 project is a project in line with international student 300,000 by the max. So the, uh, some people not do, do not understand why they call G30, but actually the number 30 is from the target number of the international student 300,000. And under this uh, G30 project, there are two main initiatives. One is the uh, uh, max uh, encourage all the university to have uh, some degree program taught in English. Okay. And uh, other initiative is that uh, they encourage Japanese universities to have an overseas branch, overseas branch, to support the, or to promote study abroad to Japan or to support the Japanese students studying abroad. And uh, there's a, another uh, initiative by the MEX. Uh, this is a study in Japan offices worldwide. Actually, the uh, MEX decided uh, re in of the important region for promoting study Japan, study in Japan, all over the world. I think there were around six or seven regions in the world, and they established the office promoting study in Japan. And they assigned one university for each region. For example, um, Africa, sub saharan Africa, Uni Hokkaido University is in charge, and they have a study in Japan office in the Lusaka, Zambia. But they, this office take care of the study abroad, study in Japan promotion in sub-Saharan Africa. And for example, India or Southern Asia, University of Tokyo is in charge of that one. They have an office in the Hyderabad promoting study in Japan. And University of Tsukuba is in charge for the promotion of study in Japan in Latin America. We have an office in Sao Paulo and to, we, uh, actively promote study in Japan in Latin America, including the central uh, Brazil and other surrounding countries. Next, uh, the, this is showing detail about the G30 project launched by the uh, MEX promoting English taught program. They selected uh, 13 universities as shown, as shown here, seven national and six private universities. 
and uh, they put a relatively large amount of the subsidies to open the English taught program. In University of Tsukuba, we opened the, these three um, undergrad English program, and uh, this actually um, helped us uh, uh, to increase the number of the inbound um, international students a lot. Um, English program, for, I think Malaysian University is really common sense, like most of the university have an English taught program, but for Japanese, um, some universities it's really difficult to do it. So that um, we are we we feel privileged to be selected in the under this project, and uh, we have a lot of English taught program. So the other universities also have a program taught in English. So we felt that maybe the study in Japan is not really uh, like a study in Japanese language anymore. So we can we still can study in the English as well in Japan. And the third uh, plan national plan related with the student mobility is this is recently declared by the cabinet office just two months ago this is international student 400,000 plan and this was launched around april to may of 2023 and in this project um the target number of the inbound student uh 400,000 but they clearly declare that we have a clear target of the outbound student 500,000 by 2023. This is closely related with the uh, demands from the um, private sectors to uh, have a global human resources. I think the um, college graduates should have a capacity or competence to work globally. That's why the um, MEX or government support a lot of the outbound students, including the degree-seeking student for overseas. and um, since uh, we have aging society and uh, decreasing number of the children, uh, we also try to keep those international students studied in Japan to contribute to the Japanese industry after graduation. So the one of the point of this project initiative is uh, career support for the international student. Before the university tried to receive the international student by English program or the good supporting system, but the government would like to keep them to contribute to the Japanese industry. That's why the job hunting system or the career development system in Japan is quite different from other countries, but the universities are now trying really hard to provide those services, uh, not only for Japanese students, but also the international student who would like to work in Japan after graduation. And uh, nowadays, I think in Malaysia as well, that promoting the cooperative degree program or short-term program called like a joint degree or double, double degree program. Okay. So those are the national plans related with the student mobility. Uh, third, okay, then what University have, uh, of Tsukuba has been doing for globalization? First of all, I, I'd like to show this figure showing the number of the inbound students. Uh, as you can see this, the number of the inbound students in the red letters increasing steadily from 1984 until now. Is it, I'm sorry that the recent data is not included here, but the recent data is also increasing. But as you can see here, that the starting the English degree program 2009 helped us a lot to receive more students. And uh, this is not only for the degree seeking student, but also that we we had an increasing number of the exchange students as well, because uh, the courses in the English program can be provided for the exchange student also. So that uh, we have more than 400 partner universities abroad, and the many uh, students from the partner universities, those are the non-degree student, exchange student, uh, came to University of Tsukuba to uh, take courses all in English. Before that, those courses were not really much, but after opening the English taught program, uh, we were able to receive a lot. Then the uh, English program in, for bachelor degree at Rebel is we have at least uh, six programs, the Life and Environmental Sciences, International Social Study, Global Issues, Engineering, Medical Sciences, and Japan Expert. And this is a list of the graduate program in English. Actually, the, we have much more number of the graduate program in English. This is because the graduate study in Japan is not really depend on the coursework. That means we do not have many lectures. 
most of the time for the graduate student during their master or PhD degree study in Japan, uh, research basis. That means the communication with the research supervisor, publishing, and the presentation in the, symp the international symposium is really important for this graduate study. And those can be done easier than giving a lecture in English. So that um, many, uh, I'd say graduate school or the undergraduate school, uh, the graduate school have uh, can open the degree program in English. I think at least more than 40 or 45 degree program in English can be, is now open at the University of Tsukuba. Okay. <clears throat> so the, um, lastly, I'd like to share some of the initiatives uh, for your uh, consideration or the good practices done by University of Tsukuba. This is a bit more detail and uh, I didn't prepare much slides with the uh, text. I put I try to put more photos to show the real activity of this implementation of this initiatives. Uh, these are mainly three. One is the AIMS program. Maybe the uh, UI team also may be a member of the UI AIMS, so some of you are familiar with this. And the second one is the C teacher project. And third one is a project for the internationalization of the student council. First one is the AIMS program. Maybe some of you have already known about this, but the AIMS program is an initiative under the organization called the CIMIO, Southeast Asia Minister of Education Organization. And this CIMIO has 20 centers for each sector of the education. And the sec uh, one center in charge of the higher education is called the CIMIO RIHEAD. And this CIMIO RIHEAD is um, trying very hard to harmonize higher education in Southeast Asia. And one of the initiatives done by Simio Raihead is a student mobility program. I see the director, Dr. Rong Yen, gave a talk before me, who saw that I think this, uh, the her center is managing this project. And the uh, University of Tsukuba is the only one affiliate member for Simio from Japan. So the, some of the initiatives or project under Simio is uh, really, um, University of Tsukuba is joining very actively. Again, this AIMS program as well, uh, we join uh, as an active member of the uh, AIMS program. And this AIMS program is, uh, name of the AIMS is the acronym from the Asian In International Mobility for Students. And there are some rules that uh, 10 study field, 10 disciplines, all courses have to be in English. And the joining this AIMS program has to be approved by the education minister of each country and the tuition fee should be waived under the academic agreement. So the, um, from Japan, the, we have 11 universities uh, approved by the Japanese government and the University of Tsukuba serving as a coordinator of these 11 universities. And from Malaysia, also the uh, MOHE, I think approved many universities, a few universities from Malaysia for the member of AIMS. And uh, you, I understand the UI team is one of the uh, most active member of the uh, AIMS program. Uh, from the historical viewpoint of this AIMS program, started from the 2011 as a pilot project called the MIT and uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand. And from Malaysia, seven universities joined. I think I remember that the UITM joined from the beginning. And Japan joined the AIMS program from 2013 with 11 universities joined, as shown here. And the Korea joined 2017. And uh, recently, the um, Cambodia joined that project. And this is a, a partner of AIMS program with University of Tsukuba. We have more than 30 partner universities and we have the most number of the partners from Malaysia. And of course, in, uh, UI team is included as you as showing these figures. And 10 field, 10 study field uh, disciplines are shown like this. And each university has to declare which study field is covered by their university. And University of Tsukuba uh, declare that uh, 10 all fields are covered because we have enough subjects for all disciplines. This is a photo of the inbound and outbound students. We do have active student mobility with UITM and the AIMS. And the uh, upper photo is actually, let's say, 12 hours ago. Last night, we had a farewell party for the this semester student. I had 24 students from uh, all ASEAN countries, and I had one from UITM, uh, Ms. Nisha, and she was uh, successfully completed her one semester study with many credits, and we uh, provided a certificate for her. 
and uh, uh, down to photo is a current student uh, from Tsukuba studying at UATM under AIMS program, Miss Sakura. And uh, she was uh, really interested in the hospitality and tourism. Actually, University of Tsukuba do not have uh, much courses in the field of hospitality. Because hospitality or tourism is uh, some uh, a study field which is uh, offered in the college level and uh, not in the university level, uh, like a, a technical college. So the, but the, she would like to study those subjects. Then she decided to uh, join the UITM on the AIMS program. And uh, uh, we checked the course offered in this field and uh, a lot of courses offered in the Punchak Alam campus. So that she is now in the Punchak Alam campus. And uh, I heard she's almost completing her study period and she's coming back uh, next month. Next initiative I'd like to share is uh, what we call C Teacher Project. This is an initiative under CMU again uh, about the teacher practice, teaching practice for the student in the Faculty of Medicine, uh, Faculty of Education. Actually, there are um, more than 70 or 80 universities or teacher college are joining this project in ASEAN. They do teaching practicum, teaching practice across the country. For example, Malaysian students go to uh, Philippines or Indonesia or Thailand to do the teaching practice. And the CIMIO invited University of Tsukuba to join this project with the Japanese uh, student. And uh, I made a pilot project with the uh, three universities in ASEAN. One is the Konkei University in Thailand, another one the Universitas Pendidikan uh, Indonesia, UPI Indonesia, and Central Luzon State University Philippines. Under this project, the um, we had to do the student mobility for the teaching practice for one month. And the uh, big challenge for us is the high school level or junior high level. It's difficult to find the school with the English program. But the University of Tsukuba has 11 affiliated schools and one school has a, a international baccalaureate. Uh, IB program in English. And uh, I talked with them, then they uh, totally agree with our, our initiative and that uh, they started, they agreed to start this teacher project. Then uh, this is a um, student, I'll say, mapping uh, of each university. So that this is not only bilateral between Japan and ASEAN, so four universities do the multilateral student mobility. So the, uh, we decided to send the three or four students from each university to other partners. So that um, in the different subjects, for example, English or math or the uh, performing art or the social studies. So this is a photos during the teaching practice of the ASEAN student in Japan. Uh, we conducted this in the February, which is uh, right in the uh, winter. For ASEAN students, I think it was really hard for them to do the teaching practice. But especially I had one student from Philippines in the field subject of the physical education. And he had to do physical education courses, teaching practice in the field, as you can see the top left photo. And he was trying to introduce uh, physical education, traditional physical uh, sports game to the Japanese student in English. And also we had a lot of students for the English education from Thailand or chemistry and math education from Indonesia. And also the vice versa, I sent a Japanese student to do the teaching practice in the Philippines and Thailand and Indonesia. I really hope that maybe I could do this with uh, some institutes in Malaysia in the future. I think all the students uh, were really satisfied with the performance of the teachers and the arrangement of the host universities. Okay, and the, the next initiative that I'd like to share is um, one of the issue in university in Japan is uh, uh, faculty globalization or oh, faculty has more chance to do many international activities, but the student bodies are still really domestic. University of Tsukuba also saying that we have a lot of inbound international students, but that those students are not in the student council, like a student representative bodies. So that I encourage students representative bodies, student council of UT, to have some experience or the, uh, to talk with the other universities, how they accommodate international student in the student council. So that I decided to make a few trips with the, uh, UT Student Council to the Malaysia and uh, Thailand. Um, and uh, USM kindly uh, 
hosted our group and they arranged a meeting with the uh, USM Student Council and UT Student Council. They had a very fruitful discussion and the UT student learned a lot how to uh, accommodate those voices of international students and uh, to invite as a member. Also, also, we had a similar meeting uh, with the university in Thailand or the Kasesa University. Uh, that group was really big, but we had about a half day uh, workshop with the student council of the Kasesa University to discuss about this issue. Both of the university has a large number of international students, and they do have a lot of, uh, how to say, um, project or the, some mechanism to invite the international student to their uh, student council. Especially in Thailand, they do mainly in Thai language. In Japan, the student council mainly do everything in Japanese. So that we learned a lot how to invite those international students in the uh, council, which use most of the language in the uh, home language. Okay, uh, that's all that I prepared. I think my time is almost up. Then the, I'd like to uh, entertain some questions if you have. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Namura. Okay, so I think this is a very good opportunity. Uh, we here yeah, we should encourage our students to uh, actually take part in the mobility program to Japan later on. Okay, um, Dr. Namura, we have one question for you here. Um, what are the key strategic plans by University of Tsukuba to achieve the target of international students' uh, 400,000 plan by uh, 2023? Yeah, uh, the, of course, we set our individual target number uh, to contribute this 400,000. So that is 5% uh, of the total students should be international students by 2025, and 30% of the student should be from international student by 2035. So that um, we are trying uh, to do a lot of the, um, how to say, task force uh, to achieve this, and uh, that is the university-wide target. But we even that we break down into the each program, your program should have this number until this year. Your program should have this number until this year. So that some programs are quite easy to reach, but some programs quite hard. So that, uh, I think my office support those programs, how to strategize to achieve those numbers. I think it depends on the study field. It's sometimes very difficult to achieve. Yes, yes, I, I understand that. Meaning that you need to segregate um, the numbers to according to the uh, programs, right? Yep. All right. Um, anyway, I think that is all the time that we have. So uh, we actually welcome uh, Sukuba University delegates to come to Malaysia, uh, particularly to particularly to UIT, UITM to do a search program that we have seen just now. We see Thailand, we have seen USM on the screen, and hopefully yep. we can see UITM on the screen as well from Sukuba University. So thank you very much, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Nakao Nomura, for your time to be with us this morning. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, so next, uh, let us continue with the next uh, speaker. Um, we would like to call upon our last speaker for the morning session. Uh, let us welcome Professor Dr. Wardah Tahir from the Curriculum Affairs Unit of Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic and International. Um, Prof. Wardah, are you ready? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, of course. So the title given is Sustaining Quality Academic Program for Globally Marketable Graduates. So please welcome Professor Dr. Wardah. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chairperson. A very good afternoon to um, all distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor to me to be able to share this um, inputs to in this symposium. So um, my presentation is um, sustaining quality academic programs for globally marketable uh, graduates. So uh, I'm. Um, Representing my co writers here, we have Nur Ani Saman, Suryani Arifin, Mama Faisal, Jurina Azad Nurita. We are from the Office of the Deputy Vice Chancellor, um, Academic and International. 
All right, so um, let's begin with. So we have now currently rapid global and technical developments, which require a prompt response and proactive um, from the university yeah, to prepare higher education ecosystem for the future. So as we all know, your idea and vision is to become a globally renowned university. So yeah, you want to be in the forefront in science, technology, and humanities uh, with a mission to lead um, a new, um, young, uh, agile professional through state-of-the-art curricula and impactful research. So in UITM, we aim to develop a new UITM brand, yeah, millennials of um, a, a young, uh, future leaders who is enthusiastic, a diligent, highly principled, progressive thinkers who are constantly learning and mindful of current and future states, okay? So, however, we know that to be globally renowned university, yeah, you know, see rankings, they put much focus on uh, research outputs. So how does UITM yeah, to, uh, to strike a balance between teaching and learning and research and publications? And as we know, UITM offers, we are the biggest uh, um, university in uh, Malaysia. We offer the most numbers of academic programs in the country. Yeah? So as you can see here, we have more than 500 uh, ac academic programs, yeah, which are 51% of them, uh, two, five, five of them are postgraduate programs. And uh, less than 50% of them are actually uh, at diploma and uh, bachelor degree, about 246 of the um, academic programs are at the diploma and bachelor degree level. Whereas in terms of student enrollment, we have more than 165,000, yeah, 165K, um, thousand of uh, from the undergraduate programs, which is more than ninety percent of our students are from um, uh, diploma and bachelor degree. Only uh, less than ten percent of the students, or around eleven thousand, are at the PhD or master level. So, in other words, we have more postgraduate. Uh, academic programs, but in overall, uh, more than 90% of our students are um, uh, undergraduate. Yeah? So uh, how do we then go into uh, this um, balance between the postgraduate and undergraduate programs? So um, we also, yeah, um, as we can see from the um, map here, uh, the I think the again the largest um uh, distributions of campuses uh, in Malaysia we have about thirty five campus uh, throughout uh, Peninsula Malaysia Sabah and Sarawak so uh, we can actually each of these campus offers uh, very uh, various uh, academic programs so um the um, the, the, we are going to, first in this um, uh, presentation, we're going to kind of sharing with all of you one um, assessment, yeah, because we have so many programs, how do we ensure that this program are relevant, uh, they are competitive, yeah, because uh, offering a program is not cheap, yeah, it, it, um, it involves lots of courses, yeah, resources, so we want to ensure that all of this program is competitive. So uh, in this uh, presentation, I'm going to share with you uh, UITM, um, one, one tool that we are actually using in UITM, which is called IDSPE, yeah, in Malay, it is Index Design Program Academic, uh, means uh, um, ac yeah, the academic program uh, competitiveness index. Yeah? So this tool is used to assess each of the program um, competitiveness. Yeah? So uh, in this analysis, yeah, we, we, we did a study before this presentation. We um, analyzed four for two academic programs and then uh, look at the results of the analysis. And later on, we are going to propose a framework where in this framework, we want to share how do we ensure an integrate, integrated uh, sort of um, sustainability maintenance uh, to ensure that the program is um, uh, still um, relevant, yeah, competitive, um, and then we want to ensure that it is then um, having 
um, good enrollment, yeah, um, still in demand, and uh, it is future-proof curriculum for the uh, for the students and for the nations. Okay, all right. So um, these are actually the distributions of the program being analyzed. So we can see that most of the program in science and technology clusters, as you can see here. We have, for example, from the Faculty of Applied Science here, the acronym is AAS. We have eight uh, diploma programs. We have uh, 18 from the bachelor degree programs. We have 19 academic program from the master level and one from PhD. That's an example from Applied Science. And you can also have from Social uh, Science Cluster here. Yeah? College of Creative Arts, for example, have 18 a diploma program analyzed, 25 of them are from the bachelor degree, and then a master's 10, and then we have three from PhD, business management clusters, and also we have from the academy um, um, in language, yeah, and also um, um, others, like here we have also from the College of Engineering and so on, okay? So these are the um, um, numbers and distributions of program that have been analyzed uh, using the IDSPA tools. Okay, so why is IDSPA tools actually? Okay, let me proceed. Okay, so um, this tool is actually, uh, um, I think it, um, it is established in back in 2018, yeah, where it is an index that uh, measures um, each of the program competitiveness using these five parameters, yeah. So uh, the first parameter uh, the, uh, the index is using is program popularity. You're going to look at what, what does this program popularity means, yeah. And then um, for each of these indic uh, parameters, we have marks here, a given tweet. And then the second parameter is enrollment, so then enrollment for the program. The first one is the program popularity. Second is enrollment to the program. And then the teaching and learning quality, and also the graduate marketability, and then the starting salary of the um, graduates. So these, these are the data that is uh, to be the parameter input to this tool. Whereas it's a little bit different for the postgraduate program, we have uh, only three uh, measurement um, parameters here, which is uh, program popularity, enrollment to the programs, and also the graduate on time uh, statistic. Okay, so, oops, sorry. Okay, so uh, we go down to, um, a little bit um, um, for the explanation so maybe just uh, one of the uh, variable that is program popularity. So um, this data is taken from um, um, student intake divisions, where it's actually from nationwide uh, student applications to program throughout uh, in peninsula, uh, throughout Malaysia, from uh, all the universities in Malaysia. So we rank um, based on uh, whether this program is becoming the first choice um, from the applicant. Applicant choose this program as the first choice, divided by the uh, targeted enrollment for each program. Okay, so for example, here we have 10 most popular programs in UITM, yeah. Uh, top with, um, is actually um, from the Bachelor of Accountancy. And then we also have um, in the least Bachelor of Business Administration, we have Bachelor of Business and uh, Administration Finance. We also have from the Computer Science, uh, we have Bachelor of Civil Engineering in the list. We have a Bachelor of Mechanical and Bachelor of Law also in the list. Okay, So this uh, popular popularity list is actually, I can say it matches, yeah? it tallies uh, with um, with um, other measurement indicator, like for example, uh, graduate employability for Bachelor of Accounts Accountancy, they reach up, uh, for, uh, to more than ninety percent GE, and then like for example, another uh, program here, Bachelor of Mechanical Engineering, they also um, uh, reach to almost, uh, more than ninety percent GE. And also, we have other indicators from employers' preferred universities. So these are actually 
a survey done by Talent Bank Malaysia where in 2023 National Graduate Employability Index um, the least year the popular program as um, as uh, chosen by the applicants uh, actually match with the employers uh, employers brief prefer uh, I mean uh, prefer preferability yeah for example in account accounting they give a uh, six stars in business management another six stars program and for example uh, in computer computing and IT also six stars and you have a special um extra award to civil engineering six stars with exemplary and champion and also I think uh, mechanical also down there also six stars yeah and also law is also six stars okay so um somehow uh, the popularity popularity as uh, indicated by um, the as a first selection first choice by the applicant is also matched with uh, yeah they they produce a student with a good um, graduate employability and uh, employers does um, rank them high okay okay next okay um Right, these are the um, further information about this index. So if a program receives like high marks, uh, each of the par parameters is five marks, the highest is five marks each. So if they receive high marks for each of the five parameters, they will have uh, high marks. They're like a range from 20 to 25. We give them a uh, band four which indicate that okay the problem the program is fine they can be maintained as it is yeah in malay it is kakal yeah so we also have if they they have a lower mark here yeah, from uh, mark from 15 to 19 they may need a curriculum revision as band three so if they have a lower mark um, 10 to 14 the program may need to be rebranded yeah and also if they really receive low marks yeah they they, are, they don't have enough students they are not popular they have a low marks for other parameters they will may they may be considered to be discontinued in Malay they call but for the for those in a very low mark category or low lowest mark rank band uh, they we have some additional qualitative consideration whether we want to uh, stop the program or discontinue and so on. It's not that easy for us to discontinue any program. Okay. Right. Next. Okay. So these are the results of the uh, analysis. We have four, four, two programs being analyzed. So uh, we can see here that the, most of the uh, academic program in UITM falls into Band four, yeah, is good, maintain as it is, or band three, they may need some curriculum revisions. Yeah, most of them are in that category, but we have like 23 in band one and 72 in band two. Okay. So what are this program? I'm not going to share the names of the program, but the distributions of the program. Yes, we have zero for diploma. Looks like all the diploma program perform fine. And then we have one bachelor degree, 16. Yeah, the most is from the master degree level program. 16 of them uh, uh, get the lowest uh, band, yeah, and also six PhD program. And also some of the um, um, in band two, diploma three, bachelor degree 22, master's 41, and PhD six. Yeah. Okay, so these are kind of indicators to us or what are what the program needs to be, you know, whether they need to be revisited, rebranded, or we, we need to just discontinue. So uh, that 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 is something that uh, each of the faculties, the owner of the program need to do further actions, okay? But uh, for us as an academic institutions, how do we ensure that our program uh, remains relevant and future-proof? Okay, next slide. Okay, so here we propose um, a framework model of an integrated academic uh, program sustainability maintenance. So um, obviously any program will, will have to start with new program development and then we go into uh, the, uh, the program delivery and assessment, accredit accreditations, 
curriculum review, compliance to standard, and uh, last in the loop is sustaining quality education using the index. Okay, so it's kind of a loop, but after the um, index analysis, uh, it can go back to um, look back at the, um, you know, the curriculum revision, so on and so forth, uh, continue again, but some of the program may need to be discontinued and the the the, the faculty may, may develop a new uh, uh, rebranded program, okay? So this uh, then will be for the elaborated one by one, next. Okay, the first one. A new program development. How do we ensure our all our new program develop is actually in demand? Is actually they there is uh, they they have enough students eh? as we can see from the um, IDSB analysis. Many of our master, I think sixteen of them are actually uh, they they kind of having problem in student enrollment. Yeah? Any program, yeah. When you want, when we want to develop a program, it's not, it's not like a one, two, three steps. It's, it's it involves lots of processes. It takes lots of our energy, our time, our resources. So, uh, for any new program develop, first and foremost, we have to have a very comprehensive, integrated needs analysis. I think it's a very important that um, needs analysis is um, done. Um, um, prudently, yeah? so comprehensive needs analysis with inputs from the potential students, industry collaborators, partner institutions, funding institute will gauge whether the pro uh, there is prospective student enrollment, and then uh, so effective needs analysis will ensure program marketability and sustainable student enrollment for years to come. Yeah? In addition, yeah, uh, for any program development in uh, UITM, you also have to consider our vision, mission, yeah, if it's objective of the university strategic plan, and also we uh, look at the national manpower requirements, yeah, uh, we look at the current future trends, needs and current challenges, yeah, and then we also benchmark um, with the other national or international similar programs. And also, um, of course, uh, inputs from stakeholders. Okay, so in other words, um, uh, I think for for this um, first component, the most important part is the most crucial part is um, needs analysis. Yeah, to be uh, to be um, comprehensively conducted before we embark uh, on any new programs. Okay. Next, after the new program, yeah, uh, once we have, you know. The new program then uh, will be submit the applications of new program will be submitted to the uh, Ministry of Higher Education to um, Malaysian Qualification Agency. So once they approve, yeah. So once this regulatory body approve, okay, this program can be conducted. So now comes our program delivery and assessment. So what are the important components in program delivery and assessment? Yeah. So um, in, in this process, it's a very critical um, um, point to, en uh, to ensure that uh, the curriculum is aligned. There is a constructive curriculum alignment between what we teach in class and that what is being, uh, you know, the objective, what we teach in class and what is the assessment. So they, they have to be aligned, not like what we teach is, is something different from what we actually assess. Uh, so the, the alignment, the, the delivery is very uh, important there. And then uh, the assessment, of course, it um, indicates uh, how good, uh, how, how poor is the performance of the students. And also we, we ensure uh, that the curriculum is flexible, future-proof, yeah? We equip, yeah, uh, as in UITM, we try to equip students with adaptable skills, specialized, broad-based knowledge. We want them to be forward-thinking mindset. They have uh, lifelong learning, yeah. So we want to empower them to succeed in their chosen chosen careers. Okay, so um, we want also to prepare these um, students, yeah, this uh, young. Um, let me just put this. Yeah. So these are the um, the twenty first skill sets in uh Vuka environment. Yeah, and, you know currently and in the future we are there are so many um volatile uncertain 
a complex, uh, ambiguous uh, um, conditions environment that uh, the students we may uh, be facing uh, in the future. So they need to be ready with um, sets, uh, I mean, uh, skills like critical thinking again, yeah, problem solving. They have to be creative. Yeah, they can be flexible. They are equipped with digital literacy. They can communicate well, collaborate well, and. Um, one of the most important thing to me is they have good values, yeah, ethics, yeah. So um, resiliency. They have a good global perspective. So, for example, there are uh, many guidelines uh, that um, we are referring yeah, in Malaysia to for this um, to to be referred to in, in the development of um, delivery and assessment, such as we have the Education 5.0 at UITM. We have Excel. We have um, um, what do you call it? Um, the the latest one, yeah, uh, from the ministry is uh, flexible learning, where the students actually uh, are flexible in their teaching and learning. They can be off campus and then they can be in campus like that. And I would like to highlight in your ITM also we have educations five point zero, whereby in here we are we are trying to um, prepare the student not only they are technologically strong but also they they are instilled with uh, good values adapt yeah? way in this adapt values yeah they they can correlate they can relate what they learn uh, what they learn in class yeah uh, the correlation between the creator the environment and the society so that when they when they work in the future they have uh, they are not only good; they are not only strong in uh, in in the technical aspect, in the in the job scope that they are doing, but they also can um, can be always morally right. Okay, right. And then we also okay. Uh, next. All right. So um. Okay. The next uh, component in this um integrated framework is accreditations okay so um accreditations yeah when when the program has been uh, approved they receive provisional accreditation as uh, is cementaria yeah? and then um after five to six months before the the first batch graduate the program needs to be given full accreditations by regulatory bodies such as the um, Malaysian Qualifications Agency there, engineering or other uh, professional bodies like uh, the Engineering Accredit Accreditation Council, like uh, Board of Architects Malaysia or MBOT. Uh, yeah? So these accreditations helps to ensure that standards and requirements yeah, stipulated uh, are complied with, such as the structures of the curriculum, the supporting courses, yeah, the the core, yeah, they 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 uh, they comply with the standards, yeah. So why do we need accreditations, yeah? Because uh, obviously, um, each of these um um professional bodies they have a benchmark of quality that we have to fulfill we have to follow yeah and also um if you are being accredited by this professional body it's kind of a recognition of public and private sector professional body whether national or international for example if you if um a program uh, for example the uh, um bots of engineers Malaysia uh, they they are actually in alliance with the Sydney uh, Washington Accord so they the students graduate from our engineering program are also recognized in uh, international level so this accreditation um lift up the the level the quality of uh, the graduates and also the programs okay. all right so the next uh, in the loop Okay, is the um, curriculum review, yeah? So um, the program cannot be just stagnant like that. Though they have accreditation, they have the, you know, the at first they have the delivery, delivery um, and assessment. From time to time, we need to review, yeah? So um, because uh, things are changing, the industry needs are changing, so we have to keep pace with this industry needs. 
So uh, while re reviewing the program, uh, the main component is the courses itself, courses in each program, the learning outcomes of the programs, the activities, the assessment of each component. Yeah, they need to be uh, revisited, look at it, how relevant do we need to improve? Uh, how is it, um, you know, um, keeping pace with the industry? Yeah? So um, programs like uh, computer and information in this era, you know, IR 4.0, they, they may tend to change uh, um, faster than um, less flexible programs such as engineering fundamentals. We certain certain fundamentals in engineering, they have to be uh, taught as it is, okay? So, um, with okay, so with um yeah, we we also um from the um, assessment yeah along the way when we um uh, conduct the program we we try to meet yeah the attainment of the PO that is program objective yeah we ensure that these objectives are met and then we ensure that the learning of each of the pro each of the courses has learning outcomes. We ensure that these learning outcomes are also match. Okay. And then uh, we do the revision, the continual quality improvement based on this um assessment, attainment of whether the students, you know, the 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 graduates coming from our programs, they achieve the objective, target, they get the learning outcomes, yeah, learning outcomes like uh, in addition to the courses grade, yeah, uh, with the learning outcomes like whether the, the graduates have strong communication skills, they have a good problem uh, solving skills. So uh, these uh, learning outcomes can also uh, be measured and, um, you know, uh, taken into consideration in improving, uh, revising the curriculum from time to time. So uh, in UITM, we, we have an integrated uh, system. Yeah? In UITM, we have an integrated system which measures not only the student's grade, but we, could, we can also look at the learning outcomes from the, um, from the program that can be used for the um, revisions, okay? curriculum revisions. Okay, the last in the loops. Okay. So uh, we have then the last is sustaining a quality education. As we mentioned just now, the sustainability, competitiveness of the academic program can be regularly analyzed using this tool, metrics such as student enrollment, employability, popularity indicate further action such as whether a, a, a program may be discontinued or rebrand and so on. So graduate employment in international level companies can be used as indicator for global marketability. So um, then we can actually, um, if, if um, you know, we, we can have a new, the going back to the first uh, in the loop, we may have a new program or we may go back uh, maintaining our program by reviewing it again and, and uh, it repeats yeah so so those are the um, uh, summary of uh, a proposed uh, framework of uh, main, from the beginning of uh, program development until um, you know uh, ma uh, making sure that the program is uh, still competitive still in demand yeah so they are relevant and also um um okay right i think that's all i want to share actually yeah so um so we have presented five key components for an integrated academic program sustainability uh to um we propose that to ensure quality education is maintained so the expected impacts are sustainable program marketability, flexible and dynamic academic uh, curriculum, preparing for the 21st century skill, which means the standard of regulatory and professional bodies, national and international, and keeping pace with industry needs. So through these processes, we hope to sustain quality education, continue improving graduate marketability, and university ranking towards globally renowned university. Sorry to um, a little bit taking extra time here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Warda, for your sharing. Yes, um, it is a challenge to design a new program which fulfill the current needs. And at the same time, we need to make sure that the existing program is not outdated. Um, Prawarda, we have one question for you here. 
Um, how does this academic program popularity score IDSPA relates to graduate employability, GE? All right. Okay. Um, let me just share um, the one slide there. So um, the popularity, pro, uh, popularity ranking just now that I showed to all of you is taken from the intake division. So this uh, popularity uh, ranking is actually from the applications of the student throughout, uh, penis, uh, throughout Malaysia. So for example, um, uh, this Bachelor of Accountancy. So they, um, we in, in our record in the student intake division, um, the um, how does it rank to be the, 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 the most popular? Because uh, the applicant choose this program as their first choice. Um, because in Malaysia, when they apply for university and the UPU, they, they are given eight choices, right? So eight choices um, or maybe less now. So the first in the choices in the list is Bachelor of Accountancy in UITM. So that is this uh, this ranking of popularity. So we use this parameter, the the rank, the how many uh, choose choosing as a first choice over the expected uh, enrollment for for this program. To, to get uh, to be the input parameters. So how does it relate to the employability? I I kind of um, uh, looking at different um, different uh, data input. We we also have graduate employability data from. I think this one is taken also from um, our our data bank, yeah? and also that uh, employers preferred universities. These are also taken from I think it was from talent bank something. So. It kind of correlated, yeah. So if you if you check this, uh, 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 the 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 program that top in the rank is also the program which has high, uh, graduate employability. This is uh, and um um I think this data is from, uh, um. One of the, I think the, uh, the BTU also is actually collecting the graduate employability data, right? Okay, so this is taken from those data bank, yeah? So uh, these are the correlation. You can see from here, yeah, the same program which is popular is, is also the program that has high uh, employability. That, that's how I correlate this. Okay, I hope that that uh, somehow answer the questions, uh, Jefferson. All right. So thank you. And we have, I believe this would be uh, one final question for the session from Dr. Kuldeep. Um, okay. How do you nurture a learning culture among students? Nurture a learning culture among students. Okay. So I think um, what, um I think all of us, yeah, you are team lecturers, we, we, we know that this is our um, our responsibility to 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 um, instill learning culture among students. Yeah, we in class not only um, lecturing them. Yeah, so um, you know the the subject matter of course is the is the one that we focus in class. But along the way, yeah, the the activities. Uh, in fact, what we pre uh, present in class also may have advices, for example, or, or the activity, the SLT, the student learning time that can be actually um, arranged in such a way the activities involve, you know, um, um, reading, um, getting extra knowledge on their own, yeah? um, team working, yeah? discussions among them. So those, those can be embedded in our uh, learning, uh, teaching and learning activities. I hope that will answer that. All right. So that's actually <clears throat> wrap up our uh, morning session. Thank you, Professor Dr. Warda, for being with us uh, this morning. Most welcome. Oh, afternoon. Okay. We are after 12 already. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is all for uh, the morning session. Uh, so far, we have one keynote speaker early in the morning and followed by five speakers on Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. So thank you very much to all speakers. Do join us for the afternoon session. We shall have another four speakers after lunch break. We will resume our session at 2 p.m. later. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. See you afterwards.
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good afternoon. Selamat siang. Sawas di tahun bai. Konnichiwa. Megandang hapun. Welcome to Symposium on Strategy and Transformation Management 2023. Some housekeeping notes before we begin the session. Kindly mute your audio during the presentations. Any questions can be posted through the chat box via WebEx and YouTube Live. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now resuming our session with the theme on Pillar 3, Turning Globally Marketable Stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Mr. Mohamed Izzat Mohamed Khalil from Research, Communication and Visibility Unit, Office of the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Research and Innovation. Mr. Izzat, are you there? Are you ready? Mr. Izzat? Are you ready? Can yes, you hear me? I'm ready. Yes, yes. All right. So Mr. Izzat will share with us uh, the impact of social media engagement on visibility, a preliminary observation in the Office of Deputy Vice Chancellor Research and Innovation, UITM. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Mama Izzat. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so can we see my slide? Hmm, I can only see one white stake in the middle of the screen right now. Are you having problem, uh, Mr. Izzat, to share your slide? Yeah, wait, yeah. I just figure it out. Uh... Okay. We have a full screen right now. Yeah, can we? No, um, it's going back to the uh, white um, view. Okay. This okay. One? Yes, you can see it now. Okay. Uh, wait, yeah. I think I, I, I give me a minute. I think we got some problem here. Because my slide is not moving. Is it moving? Yes, it's moving. We can see the second slide just now. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, sorry for the <laughs> for the problems. All right. Uh, All right. so let me start. Uh, my name is Mama Izad Mama Khalil. So I'm uh the coordinator from the research communication and visibility unit under the office of Deputy Vice Chancellor research and innovations so the impact of uh, I, I, will, I will sharing about uh, the impact of social media engagement on visibility uh, preliminary observation in the office of duty vice chancellor uh, research and innovation in uitm all right uh, first of all i, I want to uh, thank to the organization the, the organizer who are giving me the opportunity to share the uh, knowledge and the patterns how we using our social media to have uh, the uh, academician as a visibility uh, agenda. So, okay, this is, uh, first of all, I think I need to share about or introduce to you some information about what is our uh, office all about, is um, what are the, what are the function of uh, the Office of Deputy Vice Chancellor Research and Innovations. All right. So the Office of Deputy Vice Chancellor Research and Innovation, or we known as a PTNCPI, shortly is PTNCPI, because um, in Malay we call it as a Pejabat Timbalan Naik Chancellor Penyelidikan dan Inovasi. So uh, we are the one that uh, play an integral role in propelling talents to address challenges under our six priority areas through multidisciplinary and translational research, which is there is have uh, six areas. Uh, we have uh, energy. Uh, we have a uh, uh, social uh, innovate social creative innovation and sort of that you can find it in our website there are six pillars uh, and six areas of uh, priority areas in our our, our office and because uh, we 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 gathering expertise from faculties onto a collaborative and synergistic platform within niche areas and establishing joint research facility with external parties. Also, we urge our 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 researcher and our academician 
to do some collaborative research and working synergistically uh, in internal within uh, faculties to faculties or in fact uh, we uh, urge our staff to do a collaboration with outside of university and also globally and uh, the office also expansion of networking and collaboration with private uh, industrial and international agency as i mentioned uh, before that uh, it's the collaboration is not only internal in in ui the organization uh, especially in uitm but also uh, the collaboration can be with the private uh, sector industrial or uh, government sector as well and also we are try or looking forward in international agency as well and uh, establishment of a technology and innovation investment scheme to mobilize all level of the commercialization process which is this process is uh, we put under business innovation technology and commercialization center a uh, bigcom one of the pillars in uh, our office because uh, why we done all of this uh, agenda of this uh, initiative is because uh, I think everyone knows uh, the research and innovation is one of the key pillars in measurement of a uh, university ranking in the world. So this is uh, I will share our vision and mission and also the objectives objective of our office. So deputy the, the office of deputy vice chancellor research and innovations uh, aim to be an excellent management center for world class research because I believe and we believe uh, when we want to have or create uh, 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 impactful research and also we have uh, we want to build some researcher that are uh, uh, producing impactful research and they must be a have a high grade man, man management uh, site so when we have a good management a best management so we can uh, uh, collaborate or we can manage or coordinate our our researchers and our academicians and then we are also uh, doing some development uh, we aim to doing some development uh, this is uh, one of the pillars that uh, our our units one of the units in tnpt and spi uh, doing which is a renew uh, the developments uh, the, the 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 creating some uh, or seeking some young uh, researcher to be to get be known and then consultancy and research publications and uh, our mission is to enhance the scholastic, creative, and innovative capabilities of the university through quality services. All right. So we move on with our objective. Uh, our objective is to manage, coordinate, and provide necessary services for successful research, consultancy, and research publications. Uh, we actively doing some programs uh, physically and online in uh, pulling or creating a young researcher uh, to 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 become uh, to 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 be a good researcher that can uh, come out with a highly impactful uh, published research uh, and also we also to uh, the office also to assist the exploration of new areas along with its niche all right uh, the niche is the six pillars that have been uh, mentioned earlier uh, we have uh, social science we have uh, energy and environment we have health and wellness and uh, we have a uh, cyber cy cyber security sort of that so the six pillars i think uh, everyone can check our website and to be specifically can check to the renew websites all right a research nexus website that under our office to uh, and then to disseminate information and provide training on research consultancy and research publications uh, and also to ensure continuous innovation Quality research, consultancy, and publication to provide quality service through a state of the art facilities. And lastly, to facilitate uh, publishing research finding in high impact journals. Uh, this is what we aim. Uh, what we are highly aim is uh, to get more researcher and the, the research uh, will be produced the high impact uh, research that can be published in uh, high index journals. So, this is our uh, organization in our office of course we lead by our vice chancellor uh, our vice chancellor and followed by our deputy vice chancellor uh, our vice chancellor is uh, Datuk professor technologist uh, dr rosina majano and the deputy vice chancellor of research innovation is professor technologist dr nora zahman so she will be lead the uh, the, the the deputy vice chancellor office research and innovation so under her have 
several uh, units that they call Bitcom at, that I have uh, might be uh, mentioned earlier, business innovative and uh, business innovative center, all right, and commercialization. They are responsible in doing some commercializations, uh, some licensings in the innovative product, innovation products, and also they are responsible in registered in uh, intellectual uh, property IP for the innovation that has been created. And also some business uh, things that can be done in Bitcom or can be consulted with Bitcom. They are, they are responsible who manage the researchers' uh, innovative product to be commercialized. And we have Renew. Uh, we, we short found, yes, call this as a Renew, but the, 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 the unit name is uh, Research Nexus. Uh, Research Nexus is uh, one of the unit that uh, responsible in building and developing researcher. I think uh, one of our speaker earlier on the morning session is uh, Associate Prof. Uh, Dr. Wan Liza is one of the focal lengths in uh, focal person in uh, Renew, which is uh, she was uh, leading the, 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 the pillars of social inno innovative uh, creative, if I'm not mistaken, uh, PM Dr. Wan Liza that that have been given the, the speak uh, early in the morning. So Renew is one of the, the units that are responsible who are doing, they are actively doing uh, programs, uh, especially on how to write a paper, how to doing a research and what the pillars are doing research, uh, how to direct a research and sort of that. And they're also uh, actively uh, seeking a new researcher that can be a uh, cool and to be visualized as uh, our university icons. And then we have uh, RMC. RMC stands for Research Management Center. The one who manage the, the research and uh, about the, the ethic of doing the research and people who are academician who are want to have a grant so can uh, contact RMC unit because they are responsible in controlling or manage about the grants especially they are quite famous of being 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 uh, contact in the early of the year uh, from january to april if i'm not mistaken because that time that, that period is uh, frgs period so they are the the person uh, they are the, the 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 team that are doing the all management about the grant frgs prgs and sort of that so can contact them to get uh, more information about how to gain a grant and how to manage a uh, research by RMC. And then we also have UITM Press, uh, or in Malay is uh, Penebit, Penebitan UITM. So the one who are responsible in uh, publish uh, some books or some, some paper or some, some research that have been done by our academician, our researcher. So UITM Press will publish all the researcher and be, uh, can be uh, can be, uh, you know, it is commercialized the, the paper throughout the world. And BPSM basically is our HR, Human Resource Unit, that administrative all of the uh, units and staff in the Office of Deputy Vice Chancellor Research and Vision. ICT is a uh, informatic uh, technology center. Uh, the one who are, they are the one who are controlling our website, especially technically. We uh, contact them if you have any problems about uh, the grant that you have registered online and so of that. Uh, and also ICT are controlling uh, the prime system in UITM. Uh, and then we have uh, UMS. UMS is Unit uh, Maplumat Strategic or in English is uh, Information Strategic Units. The one who gain all the data, the one who, who gather all the data and plan the next step or the next planning for our uh, office and lastly is UKPV uh, the one that is my unit uh, UKPV stands for unit communication penyelidikan and visibility or in English is research communications and visibility unit uh, the unit that responsible into visible all of the researcher uh, and also uh, control the corporate uh, identity or corporate design of UITM and also 
specifically our office deputy vice chancellor research innovation we are responsible to spread the news about all the programs that have been organized by bitcom renew rmc or any uh, any unit from the uh, ptncpi uh, programs so we need to spread the news especially on renew and RMC, rmc because they uh, always actively uh, doing some the programs uh, physically and online, as I mentioned, uh, doing some webinars, seminars, and also a workshop about uh, doing uh, how to do a research paper and how to get a grant and how to publish some uh, impactful research. All right. Uh, not to be forgotten, we also have our 14 high COE and SOE. All right. Uh, so next. All right. This study is about to observe our social media how it can be used so why we are using social media is our platform or our agenda invisibility is because i think uh, and i believe everyone have their own social media everyone are using social media nowadays and everyone are you know putting some times I, I believe putting some time in scrolling your mobile phone uh to browsing some news and to get connected all right and to get some information what are happening around the world and sort of that that why we are using social media as our platform in our visibility agenda so social media is the significant platform in enhancing visibility and fostering research and innovation within the academic community and student it's not just only or specifically being used uh, for uh, academicians or for, for staff in our social media but it it also can be followed by our students as well because there's so much of issues or there's so much of uh, information that can be gained uh, from our social media especially in how we manage or how to doing some research paper and sort of that so the objective of the study is to explore social media engagement patterns and improve visibility of high impact research and innovation because we all know uh, social media nowadays have a lot of kind of social media so we want to know the patterns and how we can have a good engagement uh, with our followers and the, the person who are following our social media all right to have and to improve our visibility and high impact research and innovation especially so next this is our uh, social media ptn cpi social media all right we have five platforms on social media as you can see on your screen here we have also have tiktok uh, we have twitter we have instagram facebook and also youtube for tiktok you can find it in tncpi underscore uitm uh, for twitter is tncpi and UITM and for Instagram you also pejabat TNCPI UITM or you can only search TNCPI UITM you can find the our our Instagram here but different for Facebook our Facebook is quite be long uh, the, the the name is quite be long because you need to write uh on the search search and search uh site is you need to write office of deputy vice chancellor research and innovation UITM then only you can find our uh, Facebook on social media and lastly we have our own youtube uh you can find it in the ncpi uitm all right uh if you can see that we are utilize all of the platform um uh, of the media social we have tiktok twitter instagram facebook and youtube but not all the platform are being uh followed or get engagement highly get engaged with our followers or our subscribers because uh i think i believe this is uh effect of the uh, reflection from the the demographic the, the person who are using the mobile uh, using the social media who are followed our office all right because if you can see we have a um, uh, tiktok and twitter because uh, we want to follow we want to follow the trend okay because nowadays people are using uh, tiktoks and twitter twitter is actually one of the the medium that can get uh, fast information okay, because they are just tweeting and uh, Instagram and also YouTube. But for this study, we just only using two platform of media social, which is Facebook and YouTube. I think uh, everyone can see obviously uh, 
we have highly followed and subscribed on our both social media, Facebook and also YouTube. You can see here Facebook, we have 6.5 thousand follower and 5 thousand likes. Uh, and for YouTube, we nearly have 2.2178 uh, uh, subscriber. That quite a lot and quite high for our uh, social media actually. Uh, the list of followers is on our TikTok. Uh, we just only have uh, 20 followers and we are following just 17 uh, some of the account TikTok of course is amongst of our, our our connections in TikTok and Instagram we have 919 followers and also Twitter has uh, 163 followers and we are only following 63 accounts on Twitter different with Instagram we are following some 103 account on Instagram okay might be we believe that it uh, it has a connection with our demographic the age of using the social media itself all right so in this study we we'll only uh, analyze or observe uh, from two of our social media which is uh, Facebook and also YouTube because they have because it have it have a high high uh, followers and also subscriber all right so the model the methodology is uh we observe the analytics tools from the social media okay this study will primarily observe the chosen social media analytic tools each social media has its own analytic tools based on the analytics result on both social media the study aims to uncover valuable insights specifically related to the content categories and content pattern that have exhibit the highest level of engagement among the target audience because um we are using sorry we are using the analytic to get more information in what kind of posting that will have highly engagement so that we can have more uh, visibility and also uh, the one of the factor is uh, we talk about Weibo metrics, all right. So Weibo metrics and also some backlinks uh, to be visible in our social media and also website is also one of the pillars that have been measured for uh, university ranking. Okay. So the medium we using in uh, for our both uh, social media to anal anal analyze and observation is using Meta Business Suite for Facebook and also YouTube Studio Analytics for YouTube. Uh, this Meta Business Suite and YouTube Studio Analytics uh, has already included in the, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the social media accounts. If you are creating some business account for Facebook, of course, uh, that will be included the Meta Business Suite to get uh, analytical result, the patterns, the, 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 the trends, and the engagement of your, uh, your Facebook and parallel with youtube youtube studio analytics also has been given uh, when you are creating some uh, youtube account to see the the pattern and so the, the 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 rhythm of your viewers who are the following you and what are the things what are the content and what are the the, the type of videos that uh, can be uh, highly impact and highly engagement all right so we discuss we start with uh, our facebook all right so for pt and cpi uh, or our office dpt vice chancellor research and innovations we have uh, 6520 followers on facebook all right or uh, this data i get from the uh, business uh, meta business suits uh, from facebook all right so 6520000 followers in facebook uh if you can see here the highest uh, age that that uh, followed our facebook page is uh, from 35 to 44 age years old you can see that the age of 35 and 44 the woman nearly 21.2 percent and men is 19.1 percent uh so quite being quietly high all right the 21.2 percent and 19.1 percent from 6000 520 followers and the list of the followers on the engagement is from the age of 18 and 24 2.7 for women and 2.2 percent for men and lastly is uh, 65 and the age of 65 and above 
Women is only 0.7% and men is 0.9% might be they have, they have their own uh, retirement plan okay so not uh, actively been using the social media uh, if i'm not mistaken and i believe on that uh, so the age of 18 and 24 might be we believe that they are students so the the the, the percent of student following our social media is quite low because of might be uh, the content from our social media is not uh, the information given or the information spread is not for student uh, especially is more uh, specifically for the young researcher the academician who need to do a research paper all right so next this is uh, the percent in malaysia regions okay the highly of course uh, Shah Alam, selangor malaysia we have 19.9% Okay, because uh, I believe all the academicians or all of our network and members uh, that follow our Facebook is uh, might li might be living area or area of Selangor and Shah Alam. So that's why uh, Shah Alam is uh, is have a high percentage uh, among the other uh, locations. Right, and then followed by Kuala Lumpur, seven point three percent. Kuala Selangor, uh, three point two percent. But surprisingly, uh, quite far from Shah Alam Selangor. Um, also followed uh, by Johor Bahru, one point seven percent. Kuching, Sarawak, one point seven percent, and Perlis, one point seven percent. Right, surprisingly, the near, uh, sorry, the. Johor, Kuching, Sarawak and also place is outside from the state of Selangor but then in the region of the state of Selangor like Kajang, Klang and also uh, Kajang and Klang is only 1.6% and followed by Kota Ginabalu and Sarabah 1.6% but we, the, the office, the Facebook page are not being followed in uh, region of Malaysia we also have been followed by, by other country as well uh, these are the, the analy analysa, the analytic or the results right of course malaysia have uh, the highest uh, percentage 79.5 percent because uh your item is in malaysia but surprisingly we have also followed in for uh followed by other country as well such as india the high uh, the second highest is 8.2 percent all right and then we we'll, surprisingly we have from uh the american punya ni which is Brazil, 2.6%, United Kingdom, 1.5%, Pakistan, 1.2%. Uh, sadly, Indonesia, the, the country that nearest in Malaysia is 0.8%. So I think uh, the office need to work some, uh, uh, need to work harder to get uh, engagement with Indonesia because I believe uh, we and Indonesia have uh, doing a lot of collaborations and uh, we should have get more engagement and uh, information from Indonesia as well. And also Germany 0.7%, Iraq uh, 0.6, Nigeria and Philippines is 0.4%. All right, this is uh, the, uh, our reach, our post reach. All right, so this is come from uh, last 90 days. Uh, as you can see 16.4K is dropping 44% by last year, if I'm not mistaken here. All right, so, <clears throat> from January to April, uh, our post reached 29.3 thousand. All right. But then for April and July, our post has been reached 16.4K. Okay. So the median post reach me media type on the right corner here, we can see uh, there's two type median post reach per media type and also median post reach per content format. Okay. So we can. Uh, observe uh, the kind of media and also content that have been post and get uh, engagement, highly engagement. So for Facebook, when we are posting some image, uh, we have reached 600. I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, Mama Izzad. Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, shall we um, uh, conclude in oh, okay. two minutes, sir? All right. All right. All right. All right. Thank you. All right, thank you. Sorry for the delay. Okay, I think let's we uh, conclude. Okay, this is one of the uh, uh, key factors. 
All right, the post that highly gets engagement and on Facebook is uh, the recognitions post and also the appreciation post. And this is our YouTube, uh, so the data here. All right, so we can see that live stream has, uh, the live stream video has get high engagement by 64.4%. All right, this is our, uh, our content for YouTube. So live, uh, live of YouTube will, will have a uh, more highly uh, engagement and visibilized and also the, the content that uh, discussing discuss about uh, our uh, climate changes is one of the content that get high uh, uh, engagements, high, high viewers. And we have also built a new program, which is research podcast that are pulling new researchers to get be known and to be visibilized and also practice them uh, to be in the program so that they can be, uh, uh, can be, uh, they are not scared when we are, when, when media uh, ask them for giving some uh, input. So the conclusion is uh, we have patterned that for Facebook, uh, we only posting for acknowledgement post, appreciation post, uh, so festival post, achievement, recognizing, and notable contribution. And for YouTube, it's a live stream on webinars, live stream on appreciation, winners event, and also highly highlight on innovation talks and podcasts. So these are the years, 2023 and 2022. 2023, we have uh, average below 800, but then 22 only 400. So these are our future strategies uh, when we are posting in our social media. We are using Facebook for a teaser for information poster, but then when the program live, we are posted on YouTube and we are doing the uh, follow uh, posting by posting the highlight of the video from the uh, live session that have been uh, posted on our YouTube. So by understanding the specific interest and engagement behavior of the audience on Facebook and YouTube, we can can strategically create and deliver content that resonate deeply with each platform, which is this is one of the agenda in visibility for our academician and also our sister. So sorry for delaying the time. So I end up my presentation here. So thank you so much for giving the opportunity for me to present in this uh, such a good symposium. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Mohammad Izzad. I think less subscribers maybe because of the academic content of the social media, right? Yes, that's All one right. of our challenge. Okay, um, so we have one question here. Mm -hmm. um, what are the initiatives to increase the number of uh, followers for PTN CPI office on this uh, social media? Oh, uh, our initiative now, uh, we have put one of the program which is called Research Podcast. That, that one is quite a uh, simple uh, event or, you know, podcast is the things that are uh, 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 being, being watched right now. Okay, everyone are, are, are talking about podcast, podcast, and we are building some program. So we call it as a research podcast. So in research podcast, we just, uh, just share thought and knowledge just a, a, a subtle, subtle style of uh, communications. So uh, surprisingly, our research podcast has been uh, get uh, views in uh, 600 by two days of uh, when by two days of posting the, the, the videos of research podcast. So there has been uh, 600 that are uh, different with other posts before we we post some videos or some 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 posting in Facebook, uh, we get such as low engagement rather than our research podcast. So we are continuing to uh, think and strategically plan how we want to uh, gain more engagement uh, by doing other than products such as a uh, research podcast. I hope that answers the questions. All right. So hopefully we can increase the number of subscribers okay we have nearly um, around nine thousand staff altogether so by having only 20 it's a very small number so hopefully with the new initiative it can attract uh, more uh, staff to subscribe on the channel all right so thank you very much mr mama Izzat, for your uh, sharing session thank you all right thank you um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the session move to the next theme, uh, pillar, pillar number four. Uh, the theme is excellent supporting staff. 
Um, to do that, we would like to invite Professor Dr. Wilson Bangun from Universitas Kristen Maranatha, Indonesia. Um, Prof. Wilson, are you there? Are you ready? Yes, I am ready. Uh, I have 30 minutes to presentation. Yes, uh, yes. You have 30 okay, minutes for presentation the presentation. Until 14.30. Okay, I am uh, share my slide. All right. So today, Prof. Wilson will talk about talent development at higher learning institutions. So please welcome Professor Wilson. Uh, can you see my slide? Yes, your slide on the screen. Can you make slide? Yes. Um, can you make it a slide um, view? Presentation view? Ah, okay, okay. I presentation now. Uh, thank you. Uh, Okay. okay, I presentation this uh, pilot how to develop of talent. Can you see my slide? Yes, yes, you can see your slide. But this my this uh, Laptop not uh, move the presentation. Uh, you need to put it into uh, presentation view. Okay, please help me to uh, operation operation to slide to operation uh, slide. Okay, uh, shall we um, share the slide for you? Yes, uh, please. Uh, yes, can you please stop sharing them? Can you please stop sharing? Okay. Okay. Uh, the the secretariat will have to um, uh, share the slide for you. Okay. Okay. Uh, my presentation now. Okay, already. Uh, ready my presentation. Okay. Um, we are trying to get your slide ready, Prof. I try to uh, share my uh, slide. Um, Can you see my slide? Yes, I think you can just proceed, Pro. Uh, okay. Uh, you need to okay. manually click to the slide. Uh, you need okay, to manually uh, click to each of the slide. Please help me to 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 your, your share screen my my slide. Okay. So then, can you please stop sharing so that we can control it from here? Okay, 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 thank you, Prof. We are working on it. Uh, okay, okay, thank you. Uh, I present this uh, how to develop of talent higher education in Indonesia. Merdeka belajar kampus merdeka in English, freedom to learning and uh, freedom campus. Next slide. Yeah. The change in, in organization environment that are very fast due to the 
Industrial Revolution 4.0, technological disruption, and the COVID-19 pandemic have created very high business uncertainty. A business competition is getting sharper. Therefore, organizations or companies must pay attention to the development of human resources. Human resources are one of the production factors that have a major product contribution to output. Each corporate must develop its human resources in order to survive or the, uh, win the competition in the global market. President of Republic Indonesia, Joko Widodo, emphasized that uh, fundamental and rapid change must be made to anticipate a global change. According to him, higher education in Indonesia must be able to facilitate studies to develop their potential. Higher education must facilitate students to develop their talents. A student should not be limited by a study program in the faculties that actually cycle them because everything will be carried out in the hybrid manner hybrid knowledge and hybrid skill. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah. Everyone has expertise in a particular field uh, that can be used to meet their needs. However, why do people always worry about uh, the question? Where should I go? What are my abilities? What do I have uh, to do? And why am I here? Next slide, please. Therefore, it is uh, very important for you to know the, what his talent is. Slide, slide, please. Actually, Humans since uh, childhood have known their uh, respective talents. Everyone will be able to uh, cultivate, cultivate uh, the inherited talent from his family. Someone has talent in music, singing, uh, football, and so on. This can come from uh, the talent of their parents. But on the other hand, Talent can also come from the uh, in for environment in which they are located, where they where they uh, came uh, from, uh, their neighbors, school or uh, other communities where they are member of a particular organization. Situation can also be a source of the uh, formation of one talent. The development of technology has resulted in change in the human mindset, ways of working or uh, conventional ways of working to digital, to the point that uh, human life uh, patterns can change. In the industrial era 4.0, which is uh, characterized by dig digitalization, it has changed the uh, conventional way of working to become modern. Of course, the changing work system online requires human sources to uh, improve their ability uh, to operate the technological devices uh, used uh, to be able to carry out their work. The COVID-19 situation that uh, hit many countries in the world has changed uh, the mindset, a way of working, and a pattern of human life. Uh, in Indonesia at the time, because several companies reduced uh, production so that uh, they have, they were forced uh, to reduce the number of workers. The workers uh, who stopped uh, working carried out home uh, business activities such as culinary home cooking, selling mass and uh, health product, uh, food and beverage, opening shop uh, become a uh, freelance freelancer and so on, all uh, of which are not uh, are done, are done uh, online. 
please. Uh, next slide. Uh, so uh, every human being carries out his activities according uh, to the talents they have. A talent possessed uh, by someone in a certain field that uh, makes that a person have a uh, advantage compared uh, to other people. In the development of a technology and environment uh, change uh, that uh, are very dynamic, the competition is getting sharper. Talent that are developed make a person have specific uh, abilities in a particular field uh, that will increase work productivity. We realize uh, that a human uh, different uh, talent from one another through the talent that are owned by uh, everyone, they will be able to meet their life needs so that uh, they become uh, properties also for their families even for uh, other people if this talent can be developed and uh, managed uh, properly the more talent is uh, developed uh, the more uh, it will be useful uh, for society and uh, general to society at the global level uh, uh, the talent uh, has a uh, component, uh, fundamental uh, advantage, ability, there are knowledge, skill, and experience, attitude, uh, character, decision making, and desire and ability to grow. Uh, talent is ability, uh, there are mental and physical that everyone has that uh, can be used to create. Talent management is a process to obtain, retain, and develop human uh, resources who have the ability to work for the benefit of the organization. Uh, please, next slide. Talent is not just uh, to please uh, yourself, but talent can be used as a profession that is uh, carried out uh, pro pro professionally. Pro professionally. Even talent can be done uh, for a commercial purpose. One can become rich uh, by using commercialized uh, talent. Of course, talent must be developed through educational situ institution, but uh, no uh, formal education and a formal education. Someone who has musical talent he can develop his talent through musical course and education institutes one can develop his uh, talent as a singer uh, through singing uh, course course and uh, education likewise one can develop develop uh, football talent uh, through uh, football education next slide in Indonesia, the level of uh, formal education is elementary school, junior high school, uh, senior high school, and education, 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 which is uh, divided into vocational education and academic education. Vocational education is educate, education related to apply education, while academic education is related to the development of uh, science. So uh, through this educational uh, institution, a person can uh, develop his talent to make him a professional in a particular field. Next slide, please. Uh, therefore, talent must be managed properly. Talent managed, management is a process to discover talent or uh, skill and uh, develop uh, them to suit the will of work to achieve organizational result. Please, next slide, yeah. Uh, talent management is a process consisting uh, of uh, attracting, attract, attracting yeah, a person uh, who has a specific talent will be able to attract the attention 
of uh, many people and amazing them uh, with their performance and achievement. Uh, selecting, everyone can have a variety of uh, talent, but even so, uh, there are a few, maybe one or uh, two talents that uh, stand out the most. You may have talent in uh, singing, music, uh, football, uh, swimming, and so on. So on. Uh, you should be able to make a choice of two or one talent to be uh, developed uh, to a profession that is uh, carried out uh, pro professionally. And then sing. Uh, the chosen talent will be fun to do so it can give maximum result. An enjoyable job uh, will lead to job satisfaction, high performance, and high work productivity. Uh, development, everyone has a peculiarity in work ability. Employees must uh, develop their work uh, skill to achieve high work result. Development can be done uh, through increased education and uh, training to make uh, employee have expertise in a particular field uh, of work. And uh, retaining, employees who have been uh, developed will uh, master of uh, the field of work so that a person has expertise in a particular field of work. Next slide. This is the uh, talent process. Uh, I starting from uh, uh, first uh, first uh, page. Uh, identity of critical position. Okay. Uh, there are positions that are fundamental to the uh, progress of the company, uh, not depending on the hierarchy. Uh, the position is relatively uh, difficult to find. Uh, and uh, identify uh, potential uh, talent. Uh, there are employee career history uh, or job experience. Result of performance appraisal based on uh, key uh, performance index. Assessment center and uh, competency, competency uh, based interview and uh, conduct uh, talent uh, development intervention. There are a compilation of uh, development program or for uh, potential talent uh, and a focus on implementation and uh, follow up. And uh, retain and optimize uh, talent pool uh, is a type of uh, talents development. Next, next slide. Yeah. Uh, this slide about the uh, six uh, type of uh, talent development. Uh, number one, increase workload. Uh, this uh, method uh, provide a more uh, variety of uh, tasks uh, compared to the previous uh, tasks. Uh, there are job enrichment or uh, vertical loading and a job enlargement or horizontal loading. Number two, uh, job development. This method is uh, carried out to improve skill and uh, knowledge directly in the uh, workplace. A special assignment. This method uh, provides uh, an opportunity for employees uh, to handle a special task or project with the aim of increasing the experience of the employee concern. Uh, mentorship, mentoring ship. Uh, periodically asking uh, employees uh, to carry out the learning process in certain uh, selected uh, field with uh, senior employees who are considered uh, expert. Festival school sending employees to attend training, a seminar, workshop, study assignment, 
to improve uh, their skill and uh, knowledge in a certain field. A job rotation, moving employees uh, from one job to another with the aim of uh, broadening their knowledge, experience, and uh, insight. Action based uh, across training, action based learning. The uh, training process is carried out uh, continuously with reference to solving real problem and court and country uh, in the field. Uh, participants uh, learn about uh, concept while uh, solving real problems, learning by doing principle. Uh, a literature study uh, this method this method uh, about to the uh, provide uh, manuals book uh, report uh, videos or uh, tips as reference uh, material for independent study and uh, number nine cross training uh, sending employees to uh, take uh, part in uh, training in the other fields. Uh, the aim is uh, to prepare him to uh, enter a various uh, position. Next slide, please. Uh, the Minister of Education, Culture, uh, Research and Technology of uh, the Republic of Indonesia, yeah? Uh, in Indonesia, Menteri Pendidikan, Kebudayaan, Riset, dan Teknologi Republik Indonesia, Nadim Anwar Makarim, stipulates that uh, the education system in Indonesia focus on Merdeka Belajar Kampus Merdeka. Uh, the freedom to learning, where learning activities are not only carried out on campus, which also means that a student are uh, given a choice of a course according to their talent or uh, interest. Uh, independent learning is to give uh, freedom and uh, autonomy to educational institution and freedom from bureaucratization, lecturer, uh, freed from uh, Convoluted uh, bureaucracy and uh, students are given uh, the freedom to choose the field they like. They like. The concept of uh, independent learning certainly aims to uh, provide the flexibility to uh, students to uh, study outside the campus as an effort to get uh, qualified future leaders. Each activity chosen by a uh, student must be uh, guided uh, by a lecturer determined by the campus. The list of activities student can take uh, can be uh, selected from a program determined by the government and or a program approved by the uh, counselor. The concept of independent learning is uh, followed by the concept of an uh, independent campus, uh, which means that uh, learning activities cannot only be uh, carried out uh, on campus. Now in Indonesia, the freedom learning education system and a freedom campus uh, have been implemented. This uh, concept was uh, formed uh, so that a tertiary uh, institution create uh, graduates who are independent in uh, accordance with the uh, field of knowledge they are in interested. This concept was uh, created to uh, change the uh, paradigm of uh, education where proficiently uh, learning activities were uh, carried out uh, entire, entirely in the room, which uh, formed a sudden who were not uh, independent in uh, learning. Uh, 
the freedom to learning and uh, freedom campus. I aim to encourage a student to master various uh, sciences to uh, prepare them to enter the world of work. Through this policy, the uh, Freedom Campus uh, provides uh, opportunities for students to choose the uh, course they will uh, take. Okay. Uh, students are given uh, the opportunity to take a uh, course outside uh, the study program at the uh, same college, uh, taking uh, courses in the uh, same study program at different university, taking course in different study program at uh, different universities and our uh, learning outside colleagues. Um, uh, the, uh, this is uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, this is a activity of uh, Merdeka Belajar Kampus Merdeka. Uh, number one, independent uh, student exchange program. Uh, this program is intended uh, to give a uh, student uh, the opportunity to learn about the diversity of the archipelago and uh, expand academic network between students. This program can be said as a uh, means of learning across campus. A student who uh, take part in this uh, program will receive uh, version of a 20 credit unit uh, one credit unit uh, uh, 50 minutes to learning in the classroom number two a certificate intern this internship program can be uh, followed for one two three semester uh, one semester is uh, six months just uh, like the previous uh, program, the certified internship uh, program has uh, the equivalent of 20 credit units. Uh, in this uh, program, student can study directly in a partner uh, workplace uh, so they can uh, expand their uh, network and uh, relationship with uh, related uh, industries. Number three, uh, campus uh, teaching program. This program, this program uh, provides an uh, opportunity uh, to uh, practice uh, teaching skill as well as self-development. Uh, In this uh, program, uh, student uh, will become partner with uh, a teacher in uh, learning literacy, numeracy, and uh, technology adaption for elementary and junior high school. The teaching campus uh, program uh, lasts for one semester and uh, will receive uh, recognition of up to 20 credit units. Uh, number four, research. This program is uh, suitable for uh, students who have an uh, interest in becoming a researcher. In this uh, program, students can study in the research center laboratory this program aims to uh, improve the quality of uh, student research as uh, well as the uh, ecosystem and uh, quality of uh, research in indonesia number five humanitarian humanitarian uh, project this program involves a student to help uh, overcome uh, this system uh, with a humanitarian project as sudden, are uh, expect, expected to uphold uh, human values. In addition, uh, sudden are uh, also expected to, have, to be able uh, to increase social sensitivity and uh, provide solution according to their expertise. Number six, uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, program. During this uh, program, a uh, student uh, will take uh, part in uh, activities to increase entrepreneurial uh, competi competency. Okay. Uh, 
prepare entrepreneurial uh, proposal, carry out uh, entrepreneurial activities under uh, the guidance of uh, lectures or uh, entrepreneurial mentors. Uh, this uh, program has the main uh, objective of uh, strength, strengthening uh, national and economic independence and uh, supporting the uh, acceleration of the digital uh, economy. Number seven, Certified uh, Independence Study. This uh, program is uh, sustainable uh, for a sudden who have uh, innovative ideas and uh, have an interest in doing research. Uh, the duration of the independent study program ranges from one to two semesters. This independent study program has a uh, weight uh, of uh, 20 credit units. Uh, interestingly, uh, the choice of a study does not uh, have to be in uh, accordance, accordance uh, with the field or a major of uh, study. So uh, studying uh, can do across disciplines as uh, long as they meet uh, the existing requirement. Number eight, uh, this program will provide experience to live in the community outside the campus uh, together with the local community. Uh, Sudden are uh, expected to identify uh, potential and provide a solution so that the arrival of a uh, student will be able to uh, develop the potential of uh, the village or uh, area uh, in Indonesia, kuliah kerja nyata, practice, practical of a uh, student is also expected uh, to be able to own uh, the knowledge, uh, soft uh, skill, and leadership uh, of the student uh, concern. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Professor Wilson. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, I have a meeting agenda uh, this right. time. Okay. Uh, so that, uh, I'm sorry to uh, question and answer uh, for me. Um, oh, okay, okay. So and, thank uh, you very much, uh, Prof. Wilson, for joining us. Once again, I'm uh, apologize. I cannot. Uh, Session of a question answer. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I can Wilson. follow this uh, symposium with the uh, camera Yes. Okay. Thank you, Professor Wilson. Um, okay, so ladies and gentlemen, um, on the same p uh, theme, pillar number four, excellent supporting staff. Uh, we have with us Professor Dr. Novizan Nazir uh, from Univer Universitas Andalas, Indonesia. Um, uh, Professor Noviza, are you there? Are you ready? Are you ready, Professor? Uh, I can't hear you. Please, please unmute your uh, microphone. We cannot hear you yet. All right. Okay. Okay. Now I we can hear you. So today, okay. Professor Novizal will share with us uh, the title, the role of supporting staff for community engagement activities. Uh, please welcome Professor Noviza. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me for, to share my presentation uh, this afternoon. 
Uh, I am Novi Zanazir. I am a lecturer at Andalas University, Indonesia, my university in Padang. So, uh, uh, yeah, this picture is uh, when I was young. So, if you meet me today, is uh, look uh, different. Okay, uh, my presentation this afternoon is the role of supporting staff for community engagement activities. The content of my presentation, uh, I divided in, into five components. Uh, the first one, uh, uh, we'll talk about the community engagement definition and the spectrum of public participation in community engagement. And the second one is uh, example activities of community engagement in uh, my uh, faculty in uh, Andalas University and sir the role of supporting staff for community engagement activities and for the specific types of supporting staff for community engagement activities and uh, closing Uh, we start from uh, the definition uh, of community engagement. Uh, the word community can be defined in various ways. It can be defined as group of people that live in the same geography or neighborhood and to share similar identities, lives, experience, or culture. Three, share and interest and uh, one of the most critical aspect of community is that individuals come together in association with one another to reach the common goals uh, engagement means an arrangement to do something inclusive community engagement is a continuous process so so the community engagement is a process that involves building re relationship and fostering active participation between individual group or organization and the local community community engagement aims to involve community members in this decision making problem solving and planning process, ensuring that their voices are heard and respected. Community engagement is vital for addressing uh, local issues, promoting social cohesion, and creating positive change within a community. Okay, this is the spectrum of public participation uh, in uh, community engagement uh, uh, generally uh, community engagement can be divided uh, into five depend on the goal of the community engagement uh, in this uh, picture we can see that uh, uh, community engagement uh, can be informed. This is communicate the issues you plan to address. So, and the second one is uh, the method is consult, obtain feedback or alternative to make an informed decision. And third, third method is uh, involve ensure that public wants are understood and taken in, into consideration and uh, the fourth method is a uh, collaborate partner with the public in its aspect of, of planning and um, the last one is empower from left to right 
let's uh, increase the level of public impact. So empower is uh, the highest impact on uh, uh, community engagement. Support the aspiration of the public and contribute to the implementation of their uh, plans. Okay, this is the example activities of community engagement in um, uh, my university, my faculty in Padang. Uh, the, the, the first method is inform. We have halal care in our department. This is, uh, uh, and uh, we have a com uh, program like halal goes to school. So uh, the, the lectures come to school, communicate to the student and on halal issue. Uh, we have also used uh, the social media like Facebook to inform uh, about the halal issues like like this. Uh, we uh, we inform the the people on uh, how to select the the yeah uh, the halal uh, product, and we have also a halal bulletin. Uh, we share this bulletin to the uh, the big, the community. This is the first method of the community engagement. It's uh, one example uh, in my university. Okay, and the second one is the consult. Uh, this is an example. This uh, 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 12th July 2000 uh, last week. Uh, we had a focus group discussion on how to develop coffee commodity in West Sumatra. So uh, we uh, uh, invite the the coffee society, and we invite the uh, NGO on coffee uh, development, and uh, we invite the. Uh, uh, practitioner in coffee yeah this is the the photo during our uh, F, uh, focus group discussion in coffee as uh, we know that coffee is a super fruit uh, and we introduce the new product from the coffee and the second method is the uh, info yeah the second uh, method of community engagement is info uh, to ensure that public swans are understood and taken into into consideration. Uh, I think uh, during uh, yeah May uh, we uh, we we uh, we come to the uh, coffee plantation and during uh, we. Uh, and uh, Prof. Nisa from USTM, you join this, this program, and one professor from Japan also joined this program. So uh, we have uh, yeah, three speakers uh, uh, to collect what the public want, and we try to understand what they want, and we make consideration how to develop and how to improve the coffee uh, plantation in the village. This is uh, the activity, I think during May, last year, last May in the, uh, I, you can see the, uh, from Nisa in the middle and the, yeah. Okay. The third example of, uh, yeah, uh, the, the, this method also, uh, we have the, uh innovation to uh attract particip participant to join this uh, activity we uh, we try to have the hybrid open space meeting so uh many persons can join uh, this program uh, so uh, in this program uh, we need supporting staff who are responsible in handling the hybrid uh, uh, meeting. 
Zoom. Okay. Third one is uh, collaborate. Yeah, collaborate is uh, we have uh, what we call the Desa Binaan. Desa Binaan is an assisted village, and uh, we decided one village, and we try to develop this village. Uh, depend on our uh, skill and depend on our experience and uh, uh, we have uh, 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 program continuous program in this village uh, we try to uh, discuss with community in, in in each aspect of planning so uh, last i think last last week as so last week uh, uh, we we went to the uh, one of our uh, assisted village, the Sabina An. Uh, we uh, tried to develop uh, the product. Yeah, we uh, tried to make a product development based on uh, sugar cane. Uh, in this the uh, Sabina An in assisted village, uh, the the farmers uh, process the sugar cane to be the a brown sugar like this and we introduce a new product development based uh, on uh, sugar cane in uh, the sabina this is uh, our activity and collaboration and uh, the last one is uh, empower yeah we have uh, our one activities in bali uh, uh, to support uh, aspiration of a public and contribute to the implementation of the plans. Uh, the community want to uh, uh, to produce the uh, the healthy rice, the organic rice. Uh, uh, we introduced the initiative of three uh, method of rice uh, plantation in Bali and look at yeah uh, and we try to uh, support this activity and now the uh, the farmers in bali in one place in bali uh, have uh, what we call the safe rice is uh, the brown rice is uh, uh, process uh, using the three organic uh, method okay uh, this is uh, the others uh, activities uh, the empower uh, one of our activities is uh, develop a fiji fiji noodle from the uh, vegetable from the uh, here from uh, we make the uh, the noodle uh different color because uh, come from a different uh, uh, vegetable the role of supporting staff for community engagement supporting staff refer to the individuals who assist and facilitate the implementation of community engagement activities and initiative uh, this staff member play a crucial role in ensuring uh, the the smooth operation organization and success of community engagement effort they work alongside primary organizers community leaders or other key stakeholders to provide essential support and expertise throughout en the engagement uh, process the role and responsibilities of supporting staff in community engagement can vary depend on the scope and nature of the activities but uh, some common function uh, uh, include uh, logistic and planning yeah this is the the first role of supporting staff. supporting staff are involved in coordinating the logistical aspect of community engagement even this includes securing venue, arranging necessary equipment and material, managing events, schedules, and ensuring all necessary resources uh, are in place. 
And the second one, the role of, uh, of the community engagement, uh, uh, supporting stuff is uh, communication and outreach. Effective communication is vital in community engagement. Supporting staff may be responsible for creating and disseminating promotional material, uh, manage, managing social media, uh, maintaining communication channels with community members, and keeping them informed about upcoming events and initiatives. And the other uh, role is uh, volunteer coordination. Many community engagement activities rely on the help of volunteers. Supporting staff can recruit, train, and manage volunteers to assist with various tasks during community events, ensuring they are well prepared and, and engaged. And the other role is data collection and analysis. Community engagement often involves gathering feedback and data from participants. Supporting staff can assist in designing data collection tool, managing data storage and security, and analyzing the collected data to gain insight into community need and preferences. Uh, the role on administrative support. Behind the scene, supporting staff handle paperwork, budget management, documentation, and reporting, uh, allowing primary organizers to focus on engage, engaging with the community. Uh, next, the role is uh, cultural sensitivity and awareness. Supporting staff should be culturally sensitive and aware of the diverse background within the community, ensuring that engagement activities are inclusive and respectful to, to all. And uh, supporting staff uh, also responsible responsible for evaluation and feedback after community community engagement event supporting staff can help assess the impact gather feedback from participants and generate report to inform future planning and decision making and partnership building community engagement often involve collaboration with various organizations and stakeholders supporting staff may play a role in establishing and maintaining this partnership to enhance the effectiveness and reach of engagement activities and uh, crisis management. Uh, in unexpected situation or emergencies during community engagement events, supporting staff may need to handle crisis swiftly and appropriately, ensuring the safety and well-being of all uh, involved. So, in community engagement initiative, various types of supporting staff can play a essential role in facilitating and executing different aspects of the activities. The specific types of supporting staff can vary depend on, depending on the scale, complexity, and the goal of the community engagement program. Here, some of the common types are. Uh, Supporting staff in community engagement. Uh, one, uh, evaluation and feedback uh, after community engagement event, supporting, uh, yeah, types of supporting staff. One, event coordinator, responsible for planning and organizing community engagement event. Uh, the second one is communication specialist, handle communication and outreach effort including creating promotional materials, managing social media accounts, maintaining communication channels, and ensuring activity information simulation to the community. Volunteer managers, is, this is the, the type of supporting staff, data analyst, and administrative assistant, and cultural li license facilitator or moderators, again, and facilitate discussion, focus groups, or workshop during community engagement even to ensure productive and respectful conversation. And community outreach coordinators, uh, evaluation specialist and partnership manager, and also a translation and interpretation specialist to ensure effective communication with community members who speak different languages, providing translation and interpretation services during engagement uh, activities. Uh, youth uh, 
coordinators engage and involve young member of the community in uh, age appropriate activities recognizing their unique perspective and needs health and safety officer and sustainability coordinator focus on long-term sustainability of community engagement active initiative ensuring that uh, efforts have lasting positive impact on the community and community development specialist facilitate capacity building program and skill development workshop for community members empowering them to take an active role in community development uh, this is the last page of my presentation so the the closing uh, 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 we can summarize, make a summarize uh, for this presentation. Uh, we know that there are five methods of community engagement. Uh, it's divided into five. In, for inform, uh, consult, info, collaborate, and empower. And supporting staff are instrumental in practical and logistical aspect of community engagement. They ensure that events run mostly facilitate communication and provide the necessary support to make engagement uh, activities uh, effective, inclusive, and successful in fostering positive change within the community. The specific types of supporting staff can vary depending on the scale of community engagement, the complexity of community engagement, and goals of the community uh, engagement program thank you very much assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Waalaikumsalam assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh thank you professor noviza for your uh, sharing um with us um so okay um i have one question here from noviza um yeah how to encourage supporting staff to lead the community service and knowledge transfer program how to encourage supporting staff to lead community service and knowledge transfer program yeah uh, yeah we have to uh, recruit the the, uh, the the staff the supporting staff and we have to uh, uh, to introduce them uh, with uh, our goal for community engagement, what our goal, and uh, we have to train them to do uh, the activities. All right. Okay. So I think uh, that's all the questions that we have. So thank you, thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon. Okay. Um, so. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you very much, Professor Novizar Thank Nazir. You. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are now towards the end of our session today, and it is a pleasure to have all of you consistently present with us throughout the day. Our last speaker for the afternoon session is Nurul Aida Noor Azizi from Perpustaka Anton Abdul Razak, Tun Abdul Razak Library, University of Yumara. Um, Ms. Nuraida, are you there? Okay, so I can see the uh, the slide on the screen. So I believe that uh, Ms. Nuraida is ready. So uh, the topic will be Unleashing Potential, the Talent Pool Management Practices of UITM Library. Please welcome Madam Ms. Nurul. Aida. So can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Okay, so what about the slide? Yes, I, uh, we can see your slide on the screen. So is it in the full screen mode? Uh, not yet, still in slide mode. Oh. So I'm still uh, searching for the... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think it is in the bottom of your screen. On the right bottom. Before the percentage. Uh, at the bottom of your page. No. 
Or you may go to slideshow, slideshow, the menu, slideshow. Yes, the menu slide show. Yeah, so um, so this is a bit different after I'm sharing the slide. I see. Oh, do so you want uh, do you want uh, the secretariat to handle the slide for you? Um, <laughs> yes, but that one is in PDF form. I think you have to put it in the full screen mode also. Yeah. Can okay. You do that? okay, we will try. So sorry for the delay. Okay, hang on. Let me try. Let, let us try here. Please stop sharing your slide on the screen. Okay, um, so I can, uh, I want to start again, please, uh, sharing the slide. So I, I, I think I can see the full slide. So is it, is it in the full screen mode? Yes, yes. Okay, finally. Please okay, proceed. Can I start? Did you read Okay, can I start? Uh, but we cannot see you on the screen. Oh, I see. So I guess I need the secretariat to uh, share on my uh, PDF file. So sorry. Okay, I think we just cannot see you. Can you switch on your uh, camera? Oh, okay. We want to see you on the screen. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. We can see you both. You and the slide on the screen. Okay. Thank you. So, Please proceed. So, uh, the slide is okay. Yes. In full screen mode. Okay. Okay. So, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to begin by expressing my sincere gratitude to the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity to represent the library at this uh, symposium. And as the final presenter for today, I hope to keep everyone engaged and interested throughout my sharing on Pillar 4, Excellent Supporting Staff. So I represent the UITM library and I am honored to share on our talent pool management practices and throughout my sharing, I will be focusing on the best practices and strategies that we use to support and develop our library staff. And as the head of the talent development unit, the main role is to plan uh, and organize training program and development opportunity for the staff. So uh, we realize the incredible value of collective expertise and the significance of fostering a culture of continuous learning and also knowledge uh, sharing. And we firmly believe that by investing in our staff growth and development, we can create an environment of excellence within the library. And in this sharing, uh, uh, we want to highlight the importance of uh, talent management and to showcase the successful strategy we have implemented to nurture and support our human capital and we are actively adopting new strategy to make the most of our staff talent which uh, ultimately benefit both the library and also the user so in the upcoming part of this uh, sharing or presentation uh, i would like to share the 10 subject areas covered by the library talent pool program and we will explore uh, their initial phases, how we select the individuals into the subject, the monitoring system we use, and we hope to inspire and encourage others on the culture of excellence and continuous improvement within our library and beyond. The primary objective of our talent pool program 
is to empower our librarian and staff to become subject matter expert by the year 2025. And this program is strategically designed based on the talent development roadmap of UITM library in alignment with UITM goal of becoming uh, a globally renowned university. Uh, this program uh, is a special uh, initiative uh, designed uh, to find and support our individual staff who have talent and a keen interest in specific subject within our library. And it is our goal to provide these individuals with ample opportunity to, enha to enhance their skills and also knowledge. And our roadmap outlined the approach we follow to support and develop talent, uh, empowering librarian and also staff to become expert in their chosen field. So uh, I would like first to highlight the extensive UITM library network consisting of 39 libraries located uh, strategically uh, across Malaysia. And these libraries are positioned to meet the needs of our university community, serving as central hubs where students and faculty can easily access the knowledge and resources. In our expansive library network, uh, it is important to acknowledge the scale of our staff team, which currently consists of 565 individuals, and these signify the considerable workforce that we have uh, deserving our attention and investment uh, in terms of their personal and professional growth. Well, today we aim to showcase the diverse ability of these staff members that exist within the libraries who go above and beyond their traditional roles. This is our strategy for talent pool development. In 2022, we took a significant step along with UITM to achieve its goal of becoming a globally marketable university by 2023 through our excellent supporting staff. We, so we created a detailed strategy for talent pool development that aligned with the UITM Library Talent Development Roadmap. And so as we acknowledge the significance of talent development is for achieving excellence, uh, our library management also has shown forward thinking by integrating uh, our strategic direction with a UITM broader vision. And to further highlight the significance of continuous talent development as our top priority, uh, we are making significant changes to our structure by transforming the training unit uh, into a more comprehensive and strategic talent development unit. This transformation involves uh, redefining the unit goals, function and scope to meet the changing needs of the library and the staff. And this unit has the responsibility um, of managing uh, and providing uh, various types of training for staff. And additionally, in this unit, we provide specialized training that align with our talent pool. And based on the role uh, and responsibility of the talent development unit, we have developed the talent pool development plan. And this plan outlines specific goal and activity aimed at developing talent development within UITM library. Uh, as part of this plan, we introduced the UITM library talent pool consisting of 10 key subject area. And these subject areas have been carefully selected as area of high importance to enhance the skill and add value to our library staff. So these are the 10 main subjects that are included in the talent pool. And you might be wondering why these 10 subject area were chosen and why they are considered important. So the selection of this subject is a starting point for the talent pool development program and they represent the starting point of our effort to enhance the skill and expertise of our staff. It is important to note that while these uh, 10 area are our current focus, we remain open uh, to considering additional subject uh, in the future. So perhaps I have the time to provide a brief summary of each uh, subject included in the talent pool program. So for the speed reading pool, we, it will bring together a group of trained trainers who are, who are expert in the technique of speed reading and their role is to provide training and guidance to the university community 
helping to improve their reading speed and comprehension. And the establishment of this pool is also aligned with the Vice Chancellor vision and commitment to prioritize the importance of speed reading skills for the UITM students. And the research data management pool is designed to train staff who, who will lead initiative and also having the necessary skills in managing research data. And they will also uh, in future or later on serve as a liaison between the library and others in this effort. The next one is the bibliometric pool that aim to develop staff who will excel in bibliometric skill, including the application of quantitative analysis and statistics to publications, such, such as um, general articles and researcher citation count. And we aim that they will become uh, proficient in using bibliometric tools to analyze and uh, perhaps evaluate scholarly output that will allow them to provide support to researchers. The Digital Librarian uh, pool uh, aim to form a team of trained staff who are skilled in de delivering library information skill modules. While this might be our primary area of expertise, we also uh, acknowledge the need to adapt and keep up with new technologies and advancements in order to continuously improve uh, our competencies in librarianship. So the digital literacy pool aims to develop staff who will excel in information retrieval, assessment, and also uh, delivery skill across various digital format. And they will acquire technical skill and utilize uh, technology to enhance their information handling uh, ability. And for the writing and publication pool, it aims to develop staff who will excel in writing and publishing research paper. So they will be trained to enhance their skill in crafting well-written research paper and effectively publishing them. The next one is the resource description and access. This is the poll that will establish a team of trained staff who are proficient in the new cataloging standard. And this is also our area of expertise and the primary objectives is for the trained staff to actively assist libraries and other library community in developing uh, literacy and also proficiency in the new cataloging standard. So the digital archivist pool aim to develop staff member who will excel in the skill and mastery the methods related to the management of record. And the primary objective is to have a closer relationship with other department within the university or beyond, assisting and providing expertise in the management and also organization of important record. So the innovation pool, uh, this pool is aimed to develop staff who will lead in fostering innovation and creativity in the workplace. And they will acquire and apply improvement method such as operational excellence to drive innovation and also creativity. And these staff will um, perhaps actively support the library and other university department in sharing their expertise to promote uh, the organizational innovation and creativity. And the final, the talent pool number 10 is the systematic literature review. This pool is uh, aimed to develop a team of trained staff who are proficient in the technique and methods of conducting systematic literature review. And this skill will be used will be utilized to assist uh, researchers and also UITM community in producing uh, this type of journal article. So, over the course of one year, the talent pool program has undergone various phases to ensure uh, its successful implementation. And these phases include key steps, starting with the initial stages of attracting staff members and uh, in establishing a strong brand for the pool. And we then focus on facilitating the selection process uh, to identify the candidates. And additionally, we implemented uh, effective monitoring uh, mechanism to track the progress and performance of the talent pool members. 
So to introduce the talent pool initiative in UITM library, we use and actively promoted the program uh, to capture the attention of our, of our library staff and to ensure that they were well informed about its objective. And the main aim was to actually emphasize the significance of being actively involved and provide staff with the opportunity to select a talent pool that uh, best matches their personal interests and skill. So by doing so, we aim to uh, encourage these staff to take ownership of their professional development and they can create a supportive environment that, uh, will, and that will allow them to thrive in areas that they are passionate about. And we dedicated um, a month to promote the Talent Pro program, during which we conducted a meeting at the management level to share this comprehensive information about the program. Because we value the crucial role that the department head play in effectively communicating the details about the Talent Pool initiative to their respective staff. And by involving the head of a department, we aim to uh, foster a sense of unity and perhaps promoting um, active participation from all departments in the Talent Pool program. And this collaborative approach uh, ensure that all staff uh, have a clear understanding of the program objective, benefit, and how they can actively uh, contribute to its success. So after introducing the talent pool program within the library, the next step focus on gathering feedback from our staff about their preferred talent, talent area. And we wanted to ensure that they have the opportunity to choose the subject and create a more personalized and engaging talent pool program that cater to their individual interests. And to make the feedback process uh, efficient, we implemented practices that help us collect talent pool selection from a large number of staff members. In fact, we received feedback from almost 565 uh, individual staff, which was a significant number. And on the slide, you can see the virtual, uh, visual representation of the platform that I have mentioned earlier. This platform um, acts as a central hub where talent pool managers can access this, this up-to-date information and make informed decisions easily because it provides a user-friendly interface that allows uh, monitoring, tracking staff selection, and assign individual to, sub to a suitable training. And by using this platform, the administrative tasks associated with managing the talent pool become more uh, organized and systematic. And after the talent pool initiative was introduced, we have organized extensive training program designed specifically for the selected talent. But uh, however, it is important also to mention here that not all staff members have undergone the necessary training uh, within this one year related to the talent pool program uh, because this is because we are working on adjusting the training program based on the available resources but while not all staff have undergone training at the moment the library is committed to regularly evaluating and also adapting its training plan to include as many uh, participants or, uh, or staff as possible over time. So next, uh, to ensure efficient monitoring of the talent pool initiative, we develop a, a dedicated sub-platform within uh, the profiling menu of our system. And this platform provides a complete uh, and detail uh, of training-related information linked to uh, the talent pool and it allows talent pool managers, again, uh, department head and staff to easily access and review the important details regarding their participation and also contribution. Because without proper monitoring, it can be difficult to evaluate the effectiveness of the talent pool initiative and determine if the training provided to each participant has been effectively implemented. And monitoring the activities within this talent pool also allow us to identify any area that may need our improvement or additional support. And by keeping track of the progress and outcome of the talent pool program, we can make informed decisions to enhance the training and to ensure that the overall success of this talent pool program initiative. 
So to make sure that everyone can see the progress and accomplishment in the talent development, this screen can also be easy, easily accessible through the library portal, and this ensure transparency and also to promote awareness of the effort made in developing the talent. So here are our certified librarian who are currently part of our talent pool program. And these certified staff uh, have not only been developed through the talent pool initiative, but also through other avenues of uh, professional growth. And our aim in developing the talent pool program is to continuously produce more competent and marketable librarians like them. We are also delighted to introduce 13 of our staff members who have obtained their digital certification as Microsoft Office Specialist in uh, Excel Associate module. And these certified individuals have uh, valuable skills and our goal is to leverage their expertise to benefit uh, our library staff, students, and also the users. And uh, after its successful launch in September 2022, we take a great pride in announcing the development of a group of subject matter experts within specific area. And currently, UITM Library has a team of 17 speed reading instructors located in different campuses, and we have planned to add more instructors in uh, 2023. So our team of instructor has also created three modules specifically designed for the speed reading program. And this accomplishment highlight the dedication in, in improving the reading ability of the UITM uh, community. And speed reading has become a significant focus within the library. And uh, as it is now included as part of our performance indicator since the year 2023. And Additionally, we have received a request for this program from external organizations such as the Ministry, which indicates the growing recognition of our expertise uh, beyond UITM. And in terms of global participation, we have also actively engaged and gained recognition in specific subject area. One notable achievement is our involvement in publishing journal article in collaboration with a university from other country. And this highlight our contribution to the international academic community and showcase our expertise in the field. And additionally, we have been invited uh, as a guest speaker from various digital initiatives organized by our library, where we have shared uh, our knowledge and insight with a wider audience. So in summary, we have a significant number of skilled and trained staff members in various subject area, and their expertise will be used within our organization to train our internal staff and also to enhance their knowledge and skill. And this align with our commitment to Pillar 4, which focuses on developing uh, excellent supporting staff by investing in our staff professional development. We not only contribute to the, to the university community, but also uh, ensure that our institution remains uh, globally competitive and also marketable. So every effort comes with its own set of challenges. And in our case, we face several challenges in the early stages of its implementation, such as uh, identifying and attracting talented individuals, uh, overcoming resistance to change, and also uh, accommodating individual uh, differences and also transformation. Yes, because getting everyone out of their comfort zones and embarrassing new ways of doing things was a challenge. But we are committed to putting in ongoing effort and continuously uh, working towards uh, our objective. So that concludes our presentation, my presentation. And the Talent Pool program has been uh, instrumental in bringing together a group of talented individuals uh, specifically the library staff and creating a culture of, of excellence and continuous growth within our library. And through this program, we have not only identified and developed skill of, uh, of the staff member, but also fostered um, a sense of empowerment and also commitment to making a positive uh, impact. As I wrap up my presentation, we also would like to express our sincere gratitude to all those who have played a vital role 
in the successful implementation of this program. So we want to emphasize the great teamwork and cooperation we have achieved with the Institute of Leadership and Development, ILD, at UITM. ILD has played an important role in our program and we have collaborated with them on the plan activity and also by working together with ILD, we have been able to combine our effort and also resources that has contributed to the overall effective effectiveness of the program. And so thank you to our library technical team for their incredible work in developing the talent pool platform. And this platform uh, didn't appear out of thin air on the first day of the talent pool program. And as the program progressed, uh, we realized the importance of having a platform to support its function and also to meet uh, our needs. So uh, thank you for your attention and we look forward to uh, further collaboration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Nuru Aida. A very uh, interesting uh, sharing on the talent pool. So um, I think both students and staff should take advantage on all services provided uh, by library talent pool. It will help actually to produce, for example, an outstanding uh, publications or a masterpiece. Okay, Ms. Aida, we have one question here. Um, can this PETA talent pool management system be applied to a UITM system incorporating the current system that we have in ILD? What do you think? So, sorry, can I have the, the, the question again? Okay, so can this PETA talent pool management system uh, be applied to UITM system incorporating the current system that we have in ILD? So uh, I believe that have to, that have to be answered by the technical team, but uh, it is I think um, uh, doable to make the I mean the integration between uh, our platform and also to have this uh, this uh, menu or the dedicated sub platform uh, for the ILD because we share the same um, direction, uh, giving training to staff and whatnot also because uh, this is uh, the aim is uh, I think the aim is the same we are directed uh, to um, uh, nurture and develop our staff uh, talent and development so I guess uh, these can be um, discussed together we can uh, collaborate on uh, achieving this I mean the the question again um, we can make this uh, happen uh, by doing a collaboration together yes all right. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think that is all. So thank you very much, Ms. Aida, for joining us uh, today. Um, all right. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of the uh, organizing committee, um, I would like to remind you that our sim symposium is to be continued tomorrow. We shall have one keynote speaker and five speakers on day two. Thank you to all speakers and participants. Looking forward to continue our session tomorrow morning at 8.30 a.m. To all UITM participants, please fill in the feedback and attendance form provided in the chat box, both in WebEx and YouTube. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and have a pleasant day. Thank you.